Thank you, John, and uh, good morning, everyone, both those who are here uh, physically and those who are here uh, uh, cybernetically. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the annual international meeting of the George and Angelina Costas Research Center for Cardiovascular Nanomedicine. And as you know, the theme of this year's meeting is the new frontier of RNA therapeutics a timely subject because I think we all believe that we're near an inflection point in medicine. As we've seen with the vaccines against COVID-19, combining nanotechnology with RNA therapeutics unlocks a synergy with remarkable potential to transform the way we treat disease and restore health. Targeted modification of messenger RNA allows rapid development of therapeutic RNA constructs, while nanotechnology enables targeting, protection of the therapeutic payload, and potentially elimination of systemic toxicity. Here at Houston Methodist, in addition to the Costas Center, we're fortunate to have the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences and the Center for RNA Therapeutics both ably led by uh, Dr. Cook, uh, and the Department of Nanomedicine, led by Dr. Alessandro Grattoni. The Center for RNA Therapeutics is a unique academic program that aims to be the first hospital-based center for RNA therapies. It's already one of the premier academic centers for developing RNA drugs, and our scientists have created more than 100 RNA constructs for researchers around the world. Collaborating with Dr. Grattoni's Department of Nanomedicine, the group conducts first-in-man clinical trials, manufactures clinical grade RNA. The potential for such therapeutics is, of course, immense, and that is why we are all here today. We're excited to share with you some of the accomplishments and the potentials for these technologies. I also would like to acknowledge uh, George and Angelina Costas and their family. And we're delighted to have uh, Cynthia and uh, Georgia here with us today. George's dedication to science, uh, Angelina's deep faith, and the couple's belief in giving back to the community all led to the remarkable support that the Costas family has provided to Houston Methodist. The funding provided by the family is the catalyst for these annual international meetings. 
and for the collaborations between our departments and centers in nanomedicine and RNA therapeutics. Their generosity has enabled us to be a leader in nanomedicine, and I want to express again our deep and sincere and enduring gratitude to the entire family for their support. Our speakers are going to share fascinating new insights today from the benefit of nanotherapeutics applied to cardiovascular disease, to the possibility of reversing aging, to genome editing tools. Uh, the meeting is going to be thought-provoking and educational. And I'm also excited to announce the uh, renewal of the Shark Tank competition. Um, last year, Carly Filguera and Nilesh Mathuria were winners of Shark Tank. And I'm delighted to tell you that their work has demonstrated uh, nanoparticle-induced photothermal heating uh, in cardiac tissue. It's resulted in a publication, five conference presentations, six external grant applications, and two invention disclosures. I hope that we'll continue this tradition with today's competition. So thank you again for joining us today. We have an incredible program with speakers from around the world an exciting panel discussion, and I'm sure you'll find it uh, well worth your time. With that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Cook to uh, begin the program. And uh, just on a personal note, I want to thank Dr. Cook for his incredible work, his incredible support uh, of uh, Houston Methodist and his uh, friendship. John. Thank you, Dirk, for those great remarks. And um, I want to, again, thank the Costas sisters for being here today and for supporting uh, our, our meeting. Uh, we have over 250 registrants as of uh, two days ago. I don't know what the current count is, but I think we have a lot of people joining us online, and I'm very happy to see a lot of people, faces in the audience uh, today as well. Well, I'd like to talk about, just kind of give an overview of uh, what the opportunities are uh, for RNA nanotherapeutics and its particular promise for cardiovascular disease. And just some disclosures, I have, I'm an inventor on RNA technologies assigned to Stanford University and to Houston Methodist Hospital and founder of Chromex Bio, which is developing RNA telomerase therapies and a member of uh, SABs uh, that are not relevant to this meeting uh, and PI on some sponsored research agreements uh, related to RNA therapeutics. Well, there's a great diversity of RNA species, and I, I don't need to tell this audience that. Uh, there's uh, small non-coding RNAs, there's large non-coding RNAs, there's circular RNA. But today we're going to be focusing on message RNA largely, uh, although we do have a talk later on uh, from Dr. Anderson from MIT, who's going to be talking about his work with circular RNA. And of course, the diversity of RNA drugs as a result. So all of these uh, RNA long and small non-coding RNAs are potential targets for RNA therapeutics. And the first uh, RNA therapeutics to get to the clinic were the small uh, RNAs, in, in particular the ASOs, uh, for example, for spinal muscular atrophy, uh, uh, nusinersen, which is uh, an effective drug for that uh, condition. Again, uh, we're talking about RNA today, largely, RNA therapeutics. And of course, we are all experienced now with the vaccines, the RNA therapeutic vaccines that encode the spike protein uh, from Pfizer-BioNTech and from Moderna uh, that uh, really got us through this uh, pandemic. Each of those uh, RNA vaccines encoded the spike protein and had some uh, modest differences between them, uh, but each of them were very effective in uh, the, uh, uh, treating the disease and preventing the disease. You might ask the question, why are we getting to RNA therapeutics now when we knew about RNA since, uh, message RNA since the 1960s? And in fact, in the 1990s, uh, there were first attempts at generating RNA therapeutics. Uh, there was uh, the uh, diabetes insipidus model, um, uh, Brattleboro rats uh, that were injected with RNA encoding vasopressor. That worked. Um, so that was back in the early 1990s. Why is it taking until now to see RNA therapeutics get to the clinic? Well, the main reason for this was uh, RNA toxicity. Message RNA has some toxicity itself, and it took the recognition of Catalina Carrico and Drew Weissman that modified bases were necessary uh, for the RNA, for the RNA to be tolerated by the cells. So um, message RNA in mammalian cells 
has up to, it uh, has many modifications, uh, over 150 now have been described. And they learned that uh, what by modifying the bases, uh, replacing uracil with pseudouridine, for example, uh, cytosine with 5-methylcytosine, they could reduce the recognition of the message RNA by pattern recognition receptors in the cells. And of course, the pattern recognition receptors in the cells are there to detect viral RNA. So uh, disguising the, the mammalian RNA by those modifications helps uh, reduce, reduce the toxicity. The short half-life, systemic delivery, and intracellular delivery, um, those were problems uh, with uh, message RNA that have been solved in part uh, by our current um, uh, delivery vehicles. And you're going to hear about some new thoughts about lipid nanoparticles and other ways that we may be delivering RNA in the future. Why is this now so exciting? This field is uh, expanding rapidly because RNA can target undruggable targets, basically biological software. The therapeutic development is rapid, as we saw with the vaccines, and the RNA molecules can be personalized. I mean, small molecules are very difficult to personalize, can't. Uh, recombinant proteins, very difficult to personalize uh, recombinant proteins. But RNA, basically biological software that can be personalized, uh, and a superior safety profile compared to DNA and uh, lack of integration with uh, the RNA. Uh, this was uh, last night's uh, market evaluations, market evaluations of the big three, uh, CureVac, BioNTech, and Moderna. They've lost a little bit since the beginning of the year because of macroeconomics, but uh, they're highly valued, at least Moderna and BioNTech, because they had successful vaccines and they've shown proof of concept for RNA therapeutics. There's a potential to disrupt the $200 billion therapeutic recombinant protein industry uh, that is driving these valuations in part. Also driving the valuations is the uh, ability, as I was saying, uh, for this biological software to be quickly turned into drugs, um, and uh, Moderna relatively quickly by comparison to, to the usual drug development. Um, uh, Moderna was founded in 2010 and now has 37 products in development, um, many of those in phase one, phase two clinical trials, and has three major pharma partners. But uh, the future of RNA therapeutics does not belong to big pharma alone, and I do believe we're going to be seeing more hospital-based RNA therapeutic centers uh, cropping up because um, RNA is, um, uh, is biological software, and, and the footprint that is required for manufacturing is relatively small. So I think we'll start to see regional centers around the country, uh, hospital-based RNA therapeutics programs. Uh, we are the first that can get uh, uh, the, uh, to all the way to the clinic with uh, GMP um, uh, uh, manufacturing practices. So we, in the 10th floor here, we have uh, our, our research uh, group that is uh, innovating uh, RNA, and then we, uh, on the 12th floor we have uh, the capability of making clinical grade RNA. Uh, and uh, we basically we can take a uh, small company, we do, small companies and uh, research groups and our own uh, products uh, through all the way through uh, to the clinic, we can have that capability. We have the RNA bioinformatics piece and we have RNA innovators you can hear about in just a moment, and we have the ability to manufacture and test. In fact, several companies have used our uh, GLP testing methods for their IND applications to the FDA. We have uh, first in man clinical trials unit and we have some regulatory help as well. And as Dirk mentioned, we've done uh, with the CPRIT funding from the state government, we've been able to help a lot of uh, small companies and academic groups with their uh, products. Um, one of the things that we can not do is large batch manufacturing. Uh, it's not something that we're, uh, we have facilities to do. It's not something we want to do. Uh, so we've teamed up with VGXI in Houston. Uh, they have... Uh, a uh, large facility that they're building over in the Dyson Industrial Park. Uh, they put the first 150,000 square foot uh, plant down. I, I visited it two weeks ago. It's an amazing facility uh, with uh, 150 liter uh, fermentation tanks for their plasmid DNA and uh, uh, 50 liter um, uh, tanks for uh, IVT for the RNA synthesis uh, in this one building uh, alone. Uh, and they plan to expand on that. Um, one of the things, innovations that we're doing coming out of Dan Kiss's lab is circular RNA, and I do think that we're going to be seeing innovations in uh, message RNA that is going to enhance its stability and its uh, half-life. You can see Dan's work here and um, his um, researchers um, and with circular RNA, and you can see how long this uh, can in induce expression of protein, up to 10 days, and uh, he's, they, I think that experiment is still going on. 
Uh, so circular RNA is much more stable than message RNA. Message RNA, uh, the in endogenous message RNA lasts two minutes to two hours, 90% uh, of it. And uh, most message RNA is gone within a few hours and uh, circular RNA lasts for days, uh, maybe weeks. And that's allowed us to get uh, in uh, uh, a collaboration with CEPI, Coalition for Reptile Preparedness Initiative, is a global coalition of 32 governments uh, that have put money behind uh, preventing the next pandemic. They had a call for proposals for new RNA platforms in February. Uh, they chose ours. Uh, we heard the good news last week uh, that we're going to be uh, helping them to develop an RNA platform uh, for the next global pandemic. So we'll be working very closely with them. They have several billion dollars under management and uh, great groups around the world that they're supporting and we get to participate in that. So very excited about uh, being part of that coalition. And you might ask, well, why is the cardiovascular department interested in vaccines? Well, here's a good example for you. Chagas disease is uh, the major cause of heart failure in South America. It's uh, uh, caused by Trypanosoma cruzi, a parasite that is transmitted by an insect vector uh, that uh, uh, bites you just like a mosquito and uh, then infects you with this Trypanosoma cruzi. So we're working with uh, our colleagues at Baylor, uh, Peter Hotez and Jerome Paulette, uh, to develop a vaccine against this uh, disease. They have a mouse model, and uh, the, uh, they've identified two, vac two antigens of T. cruzi. Our RNA vaccine against those antigens has been very effective in their um, trials. Uh, we have uh, in their preclinical trials. Uh, we have also done, made uh, cancer vaccines. This is a melanoma vaccine that we made for one of our colleagues here at Houston Methodist that was uh, successful in reducing metastases uh, to the lung in those uh, mice. And that's going to allow us to, to develop a personalized cancer vaccine program. I'm working right now with Jenny Chang and um, with uh, Chi Chi Hu uh, and um, Ming Yu to develop a, a process for generating personalized cancer vaccines. The idea here is you take the tumor from the patient uh, when it's removed at surgery, you sequence it, and with the bioinformatics, you can take that sequence, sequ sequencing information and target tumor antigens with your RNA vaccine. We couldn't do this without our colleagues in nanomedicine, uh, whom you're going to be hearing from today. Uh, they generate the lipid nanoparticles for us. Uh, and primarily uh, for, for what we're doing now, we're primarily using the nanoassembler, but they have other approaches. Um, and uh, they have some unique uh, uh, leucosomes that, uh, liposomes that they've made. This is the leucosome, which is basically a lipid nanoparticle with bits of white blood cell membrane integ integrated into the membrane. And those uh, leucosomes are quite good at finding sites of inflammation. We showed in a model of atherosclerosis, an apoe deficient hypercholesterolemic animal model, that the leucosomes could deliver uh, a, a drugs to the vessel wall. And then uh, we worked with a group in Boston uh, that uh, ha was interested in this transcriptional factor, activated YAP, uh, uh, yes associated protein, is a transcriptional factor that uh, reduces inflammation and that increases cardiomyocyte proliferation. And uh, using our uh, RNA construct for this, they were able to show that they could uh, enhance cardiac regeneration in a murine model of ischemia reperfusion. So these are just some things that we're doing in cardiovascular. One of the uh, local efforts is uh, on uh, telomerase uh, uh, RNA. We showed some years ago that telomerase mRNA could extend the lifespan of human cells here uh, with uh, four treatments of uh, message RNA over a period of about a week. Uh, we were able to uh, double the lifespan of human cells. So that's been uh, 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 followed up uh, by uh, my, co my colleagues in the laboratory, Anahita Mojiri and Elisa Morales and others in the lab are working on uh, this project to, uh, to uh, reverse aging in um, a model of uh, accelerated aging, the progeria model. So we have IPSC derived vascular cells from these children with progeria. And uh, the endothelial cells, that vascular cells are very uh, diseased. They uh, don't proliferate well. They don't function well. Uh, using the RNA telomerase, we were able to improve their function, their proliferative capacity, uh, restore normal uh, transcriptional profile, and uh, reverse, uh, essentially reverse aging in these progeria cells. And in the animal model, we've been able to extend the lifespan of those uh, mice. So we're very excited about this program, and we're moving that forward. 
Um, companies, uh, Avita has been interested in what we've done with uh, the telomerase RNA therapy. They want us to improve their product. They have a spray on skin. They, they take autologous skin and uh, disaggregate it, spray it on the burn site. It works very well in younger folks, not so well in older folks, so they want us to improve the product for older folks. And we've done that now uh, in, in a, in a preclinical model uh, using a, a mouse wound healing model where we can spray the skin or uh, allocate the skin to that wound human skin in an immunodeficient mouse model. So these are human skin cells, and we'll be able to show uh, that we can increase the number of uh, human skin cells that are proliferating in the wound. Uh, they, they express proliferation markers. They have a reduction in um, senescence markers and a reduction in DNA damage. And that, uh, interestingly enough, the uh, reduction in DNA damage is becoming a, 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 a major focus of the laboratory. Anahita and her colleagues are looking at the effects of radiation on um, uh, cells and have shown that uh, the telomerase can repair uh, or prevent uh, uh, radiation-induced damage, and that's led us uh, to a, a grant with NASA to a, a look at the effects of uh, space radiation, cosmic radiation, on vascular cells and accelerated uh, vascular aging under those conditions uh, using this microfluidic uh, vessel chip model uh, to study the uh, function of the endothelial cells exposed to uh, radiation to see if we can prevent the DNA damage and uh, restore vascular function. Uh, using this uh, human vascular chip model. Well, I want to thank uh, the, my, my group uh, who uh, have worked so hard to develop these data. This is an older picture before the pandemic. We've got to get a new one now that we can gather uh, together. But I also want to thank uh, my collaborators. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, th thank you. Well, that was a very quick uh, run through a lot of data. Um, I think we're, I'm going to move, in the interest of time, actually move on to the next speaker, uh, who's our friend, uh, Dr. Jeremy Willis uh, from uh, Baylor across the street. He's the Ruth McLean Bowman Bowers Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Baylor, and he's also the director of THINK, which is a strategic research center at Baylor that is uh, more interested in translation of fundamental insights into RNA biology. And so it's perfect to have you here because it's kind of a, our opposite number there at Baylor. He was a faculty member at Penn before he came here. He came to Texas as a CPRIT scholar uh, in cancer research, and uh, we're very happy to have him here today. Why don't you come up, Dr. Willis? He's going to tell us about his uh, research. He's been characterizing how non-canonical RNAs are generated, regulated, and function. Why not, Dr. Willis? Thank you. Okay, so, so there's a pointer? No. Yes, there is. Okay. And I advance with this. Or I can use that. You can do either one. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, thanks so much, John, for the very kind introduction and for um, all of you being here today. It's uh, it was a very impressive talk. So it's very difficult to follow that one with all the things that you guys are doing here. Um, nonetheless, I'll do my best. <laughs> so, um, as John said, I moved across the street um, earlier this year, so it's been really um, exciting and trying to build more um, relationships over here. So. Um, certainly anything that I, I present here that you guys find interesting, please, please reach out. I'd, I'd love to hear more. Um, so I'm really a, an RNA biologist. I'm a basic scientist. That, that's really what I do. Um, and we're really interested in unusual ways that RNAs are processed because this reveals not only new biology, but also potential new ways for people like you that can really take advantage of this as new therapeutic targets or new therapeutic modalities. So I'm going to highlight not only the basic science, but then some of how this, the, the translational um, potential of this sort of stuff um, today. So if I show you a eukaryotic gene, it looks like this. And all of you can tell me what's supposed to happen here. You have, pull this over, you have exons and you have introns. And if you want to uh, have this gene be expressed, of course, you need to transcribe it. Uh, you need to make a functional RNA. I um, was born in New Jersey. Sorry, <laughs> should be a fun uh, next two weeks or so. Um, and so you make a, a nascent RNA that then has to be spliced to remove introns. And not only that, you need to stabilize the two ends of your RNA. So you need to put a cap and a poly A tail. And within this RNA, if it's coming from a protein coding gene, of course, there's an open reading frame. So somewhere within this is a start codon. 
So now you have an RNA where you have nice one continuous or if there's a stop codon somewhere and your two ends are protected so the RNA is stabilized and, and can be translated. And of course, that's what you know, genes are supposed to do. That's what we've all learned for many, many years. The point is to make a protein. Now the question we ask is, okay, this is all true. There's nothing wrong with this in any way, but are there other things out there that we may just not be thinking too much about? Are there gene out, other gene outputs out there? Um, and the example I always give are microRNAs. So like 30 years ago, microRNAs did not exist. Of course, microRNAs did exist. We just, as a community, didn't really think something that was you know, as short as 21 nucleotides would possibly um, be anything but just a random degradation product, let alone regulated, let alone regulate a lot of our genome, let alone a huge class, let alone be something that could be applied in, in the idea of, of, of small RNA um, therapeutics. So are there other things out there? And that's what really has driven my lab over the last number of years is are there other sorts of non-canonical RNAs that we can find that just simply don't exactly look like what's shown here in terms of a cap splice and polydilated RNA? And then we're really a basic science lab, so we want to find these RNAs, understand how they're generated, how are they regulated, and how do they function. And so that's the vast majority of how we spend our time. But it always leads us in interesting um, avenues that I think are of interest to people here, you know, is can we or others take advantage of our insights to de design new therapeutic strategies? Um, and so what I want to highlight today will ultimately kind of two aspects of our work, um, some stuff on, on three prime ends of RNAs and some on five prime, of, five prime ends of RNAs. And so in particular with three prime ends, we're really going to be talking about what happens if you don't have a poly A tail? Now, as John was um, just describing before, you know, in all these RNA therapeutics, if you don't have a poly A tail, you're supposed to be rapidly degraded and therefore you're not, not useful um, for the cell. So we'll talk a bit about that. We'll talk about some linear RNAs, a little bit about circular RNAs that were also mentioned. And then the last part, I'll just talk about a, a, a increasing interest of my group, which is looking at five prime ends of RNAs and particularly transcription termination events, but premature transcription termination events. And how are they regulated and might they be um, perhaps um, targetable um, in the future in interesting ways. So I got interested in this idea of kind of weird three pi mens completely by accident. Um, so when I was a graduate student, we were studying this long non-coding RNA called MALLET1. Um, and many people might have heard of this long non-coding RNA. If you've done RNA-seq on anything, you almost have always found it as a super abundant transcript. It's one of the most abundant um, RNA pol 2 transcripts, if not the most abundant RNA pol 2 transcripts in human cells, expressed basically everywhere, and then its levels further increase um, in human cancers. And what's interesting is that when you knock down mallet one you can limit metastatic growth, and so this has been an interesting therapeutic target. Now if you look at the mallet one gene locus at, at the surface, it looks really not interesting. Transcription would start here, and then there's a poly A signal downstream, there's no introns. So this is from a processing perspective really, really boring, in that you'd have a capped and polydentylated non-spliced RNA. Nothing to learn there. It doesn't seem, you know, that interesting. Um, and it would make sense. You know, this is like one of the most abundant transcripts in cells, so it should fit the dogma, you know, perfectly. Um, but of course, when we draw RNAs um, like this, this is not ever reality. No RNA is just, you know, a nice single-stranded stretch, no proteins bound to it or anything like that. Of course, it has proteins bound, it has structures. And so we showed a number of years ago that I'm just highlighting a small part of the mallet one structure, but several hundred nucleotides upstream of this AAU AAA sequence, which is the polydenylation sequence that triggers that addition of a poly A tail, there's a, a region of the RNA that folds into this cloverleaf structure here. And that, as you probably can recognize, resembles a tRNA. And because it resembles a tRNA, it gets recognized by some of the same machinery that recognizes canonical tRNAs. In particular, this enzyme RNase P, which is endo, an endonuclease, will cleave right at the base of this uh, tRNA-like structure, ultimately leading to a set of events that lead to the release of a tRNA-like small RNA. Now, what this cleavage here does is not only release this small RNA, but actually make the three prime end of that mature, superabundant transcript. So again, on the surface, we would have thought mallet one not interesting at all. A single, uh, single transcript, it's polydenylated, but in fact, no, there's actually two RNAs that are being produced from it, and mallet one is not polydenylated in the classic sense. So why does mallet one accumulate to such high levels in cells? 
So when we looked here, if you look at the sequence encoded just upstream of this tRNA-like structure, it's sort of interesting because it is rather A-rich. And so when we initially, initially published this story, we thought, well, okay, maybe it's just sort of like an encoded kind of poly-A tail um, like moiety. And, and that was partially right because, yes, this A-rich track is important for mallet one stability, but it's not the whole story because just upstream of it are two U-rich two motifs that are also critical. Because what happens is you have this A-rich track here. This is the very last nucleotide of the mature mallet one transcript. And so this A-rich track base pairs to both of these U-rich motifs one through a canonical Watson-Crick base pairing, and the other on this Hookstein face. So you're actually getting a triple helical structure um, on the end of your RNA. So if this is your very last nucleotide, it's almost like you have a knot on the end of your RNA, because if you want to uh, degrade this RNA, you now need to open up this advanced structure on its three prime end. And so that's really um, interesting and cool. And I say, again, from this look is where we thought nothing interesting was possibly going on. No, not only did we have two RNAs that were being produced, not one, but this superabundant mallet one transcript now had not a canonical poly A tail, but another structure on its three prime end. Now, remember I said before that mallet one's superabundant in cells, but if you knock it down, you can reduce metastatic growth, and, and groups are going after this as a, as a new cancer target. Well, how do you, you know, target RNA, specific RNAs through a small molecules, for example? That's rather difficult if you just think of RNA as this nice linear piece of RNA. There's nothing unique about it. But if you have specific structures that you can now target, and those structures are important for function, now you have a handle for how to manipulate mallet one levels. And that's exactly what you have here. At the end of mallet one, this triple helix is required for stability. And so this is not work I did in any way, um, but Nathan Baer's group and Stuart Legrees took the stuff that we were finding and look for small molecules that can bind to this mallet one triple helix. And they found two of them here. And so these would bind in this triple helix. And so by binding there, it should open up that structure, cause the end to become um, non-protected, become degraded, and mallet one levels should be reduced. And so if you measure mallet one levels here by qPCR, indeed with these two compounds, they're reduced compared to um, wild type levels. And then if you do a functional assay, so this is in, in 3D tissue culture, looking for uh, uh, branching morphogenesis, which is a kind of a combination of proliferation and migration of the cells, you see that indeed when you reduce mal at one levels, you also reduce this phenotype, which would be you know, suggestive of, of a way of limiting metastasis. So I think this is really interesting because it says, I just come at this from a purely basic science perspective to say, how is mal at one being processed? You find cool things. And now you can exploit it. And I, I, I really, um, um, you know, I think what they're doing is, is really, really interesting. Now that raises an interesting point. So most mRNAs have poly A tails. Mallet one's clearly unique. It has this triple helix. But are there other things? What else can stabilize an RNA? So we've been interested in this for a while. Um, can other non poly A sequences stabilize RNAs? Now we all learn about, you know, mRNAs have a poly A tail, but it's been known probably since I was born, to be honest, um, that there is one class of mRNAs in human cells that aren't polyadenylated, and those are histone mRNAs. So histones are unique in that they really need to be expressed in one particular time of the cell cycle, which is of course S phase when you duplicate your genome. And histone mRNAs um, kind of have taken advantage, or the cells I guess have taken advantage of that unique requirement by making histone, histone mRNAs look different. So instead of having a poly A tail, they actually have a, a stem loop on their three prime end. And because they have a stem loop, now they're regulated differently. And so we're wondering, you know, are there other things that are out there? And so what we've been doing here is we take a set of GFP reporters that all are exactly the same, except here we simply keep the same promoter, keep the same GFP open reading frame, but now simply alter their three prime ends. So for example, we can put a polydilation sequence and we can see that will make a polydilated mRNA. But we can also now put other things down at the three prime end. So histones have a stem loop sequence. So if we put the histone processing signals, we can make a GFP mRNA that ends in the histone stem loop. And then what we can do is now put in a ribozyme sequence. So this will self-cleave. And so you just put this sequence on the end of your RNA. The RNA will naturally cleave itself right here. And so whatever you put upstream of this will now be what's present on the end of your GFP RNA. So for example, we could put the mallet one triple helix there. We can put uh, different viral sequences, which is what I'll show you here. So viruses also have interesting problems because they have to 
um, allow themselves to, to proliferate, translate, but at the same time trying to kill um, host translation. And so how some viruses do these, these Bunya viruses, is they make non-polydenylated RNAs. And so we were, it's not really exactly well understood what are the sequences that are important for them, how do they work, and so that's really what has driven our work. Um, but we just wanted to see if we start cl uh, cloning some of these non-polydenylated sequences from the ends of viruses into this GFP reporter, do they work? And do they give you any advantage? Or do they give you um, unique biology that might be intriguing here? So we're still pretty at the early stages of this, but I'll just give you um, a sense of some of the things we're interested in. And just for note, we're doing this in Drosophila cells. We do this a lot in Drosophila, but we've done some of this um, in human cells as well. Um, so if we take our GFP um, plasmids that have all the different um, three prime ends, and then we're just doing northerns here, just look at the levels of the RNAs that are being produced. So if you have a normal poly A tail, this would be the amount of RNA that you're getting, and then you get varying amounts with the different ends. So if you just have a ribozyme sequence, you get a very little amount of RNA, and depending on you know, what sequence you get, you have different amounts. You know, one thing that I find interesting here is this is uh, a three prime end from Rift Valley fever virus. It's, it's a Bunya virus. Um, if you look at the sequence, it looks nothing like a poly A tail in any way. It's very, very C-rich, but if you look at the RNA stability, it's pretty darn good compared to a, a poly A tail, and not only does it promote RNA stability, um, but it's also promoting translation of the RNA. So here, even though this ribozyme sequence is a little bit stable, the RNA, the ribozyme ending GFP RNA is not translated in any way, but if you look here, you can say, indeed, with this Rift Valley fever virus 3 prime end, it is being translated to a decent amount, especially compared to your canonical poly A tail. So, you know, what are the exact unique um, circumstances for why this would be useful or not? I think that's an interesting question, but I think it's interesting to think about that you can have different ends on your RNAs, and if you're thinking about RNA therapeutics, do you want to target at a specific time? For example, if you need something in the cell cycle, uh, an S phase of the cell cycle, maybe you want the histone stem loop, things like that. Why you exactly want these viruses, I don't know yet, but I think that's an interesting um, avenue to think about. And so, a lot of what I've, of course, been talking about so far is all about the three prime ends of linear RNAs, because you need to protect those ends from degradation. But as, as John already mentioned, as many of you know, um, cells are pretty smart. And so if you want to protect yourself from degradation and you're an RNA, probably the most smart thing you can do is just not have it end at all. And that's forming a circular RNA. And over the last about, about 10 years or now, it's, so now it's become increasingly clear that cells make many circular RNAs. And the way they do this is rather um, cute, I would say, because you take advantage of very standard um, splicing reactions where all you're doing is joining a 5 prime splice site to a 3 prime splice site, a 5 prime splice site to a 3 prime splice site. That's all you do to make a linear RNA. Um, and yet, to make a circle is not that complicated because you're going to do the same thing. So for example, let's say you've taken this pre-mRNA, you take this 5 prime splice site, and you join it to this 3 prime splice site here. It's the exact same reaction, joining a 5 prime splice site to a 3 prime splice site, but now if you do that, now you actually get a covalently closed circle because you've connected the end of the exon to the beginning of the exon. I do consult for Laron, which is a company interested in circles and, and disclosure, but what really drives me is the, the basic biology of this because if we think about this from a, a gene function perspective, if this is a protein coding gene that's supposed to encode some kind of protein, when you make the linear mRNA, it has that start codon, it has the stop codon, and it makes the protein that it's supposed to make. But if you took this, this gene and transcribed it, and then instead of subjected it to backsplicing, so this was the RNA that you got, this start codon isn't present. So even though this transcript is coming from a protein coding gene, it's clearly not translated to make what you think it should be. And so I think that's really interesting because the output of a protein coding gene could be a non-coding RNA, or it could be some sort of other protein that you have no idea about, and it really opens up a lot of biology that I think is really um, quite exciting. So the question, of course, is, well, how common are these circles? Are they made commonly or not um, in cells? And so looking here, for some protein coding genes, actually circles are super abundant. So these are just doing northern blots where we're using a probe to the second exon of two different genes and looking to see um, what are the transcripts that contain exon 2. So we're looking at either the muscle blind gene or the lactase 2 gene in these cases in two different cell types. 
Um, and so you can see up here, these are the linear mRNAs. These are what these genes are, quote, supposed to make. Um, but if you look down here, there's additional transcripts that you can see. These are cell type specific, and when they are expressed, they can be super abundant, and these are circles. So if you look here, if you compare the, the um, intensity of this band compared to up here, this circle is as abundant, if not more abundant, than the canonical mRNA that should come from this gene. Same idea here. This is more abundant than this. So circles at some genes are not just some rare, seemingly error that we should ignore, but if you didn't know any better, you would think these circles is probably what I should be studying, and perhaps the linear RNAs are the rare mistake that, that we should not be thinking too much about. So I think that's you know, a really interesting thing to think about. Now to me, what really drives me is trying to understand, for example, here, why, are our, why is this circle expressed very highly here, but not at all expressed over here, and, and vice versa? Why is it that not every exon forms a circle? How is all this controlled? So I'm just going to summarize only a part of the work, to be honest, in, in, in half a second, to be honest. Um, so to try to understand, you know, why is this exon circularizing, what we've been able to figure out is that the flanking introns are really major drivers of that. In particular, when you have repeat sequences in each intron that flank it, they're able to base pair to one another and drive these circularization events to get circular RNAs. And once you know that, that for how circles make, and this is also regulated by proteins and all sorts of things as well, but once you understand that this is the basic thing you need to make a circle, these two flanking introns that have repeats, now I'm sorry I just didn't bother to change the colors, this blue exon would be the equivalent of this orange exon here, you can make plasmids where now we have the flanking introns that have these repeat sequences, here would be the exon that circularized, but instead of having that endogenous exon there, now we simply put in a multi-cloning site. So now we can put whatever we want. So if you want to make a GFP circle, you want to make a therapeutic circle, you can make whatever you want. And given that this is a cardiovascular focused meeting, I thought I would just talk about a, um, results from a few years ago that we published um, in collaboration with Raj Kishore's lab um, at Temple, um, where they came to me interested in, in circular RNAs that change after myocardial infarction. And particularly, they were interested in this one, this um, circle from the FNDC3B gene, as they had found that in mouse models of myocardial infarction, it was going down. But also, if you looked at human patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, it was also being reduced. And so they had this idea that, well, what if we re-express this circle? Would it perhaps do anything? And I said, well, I have no idea. You, you have to tell me that. But I can help you make the circle. And so we took our our methods for, for making circles, where we have these repeat sequences, we clone their particular circle in, um, put it into an AAV vector, and when they did their um, surgeries to induce the, the heart attacks in mice, they also then put in either a GFP control virus or a circle that over, or a virus that overexpresses this particular circle, and did a number of, of um, physiological um, assays. So I'll just show you one, because it's the most obvious that I can see is when they were looking at the heart and looking at the infarct size, which is, of course, tissue death, and you don't want tissue death. That's, that's not great in the heart. And what you can see here is that when you put in your control um, virus compared to when you put in the, this circle overexpression, you're greatly reducing the infarct size there, suggesting that perhaps this ha could have therapeutic benefit. How this works, all this, I think, is interesting. Um, um, but I think it, it minimum highlights two different things. One, by putting in specific circles, you can have physiological effects. But not only that, it highlights how by putting in circles themselves, that can be a therapeutic modality. So it's kind of both sides of that coin, um, which I think are quite interesting. So that's what I want to say about 3 prime ends. Um, I think I've hopefully convinced you that there are ways around having a poly A tail, and I think they each have their own interesting aspects, whether you're a linear or a circle, and I think a lot of exciting work is being done here and by others as well on, on these areas. The last maybe five minutes or so, I want to talk a little bit about um, our work on five prime ends and kind of um, sort of put it out there because it's something we're really excited about and I think it's um, something that people should think more and more about. And so this is about premature termination. And so this we got into again sort of by accident um, because we were studying, uh, we were doing high throughput screens where we had a reporter gene where we simply um, um, had a reporter gene and did a high throughput RNAi screen to just see what are all the regulators of that reporter gene. And what we found was that um, a complex called integrator was one of the most potent negative regulators of, of this um, reporter. 
that when you knock down integrator, all of a sudden the levels of this reporter went way up compared to anything else. And I won't uh, highlight all the details of the study, I'll just highlight the model, but what we basically found is integrator is a multi-subunit complex that has an endonuclease activity, and it's being recruited to the promoter, and what it's actually doing is cleaving the nascent RNAs as they're being produced. And by cleaving these nascent RNAs, it releases an RNA, and you cause transcription termination. And what's happening here is, that's interesting, is where you're cleaving the RNA. So you're cleaving it very early on in transcription, maybe 50 or 100 nucleotides downstream of the transcription start site. So the RNA that's being reduced, uh, released is only 50 or 100 nucleotides, not functional, rapidly degraded. And because you're causing transcription termination, you're preventing productive elongation, you're preventing full-length mRNA production, and so you're getting these premature termination events. So in our screen, when we were knocking down integrator, we were losing these premature termination events, hence we were getting more mRNA being produced, hence why we saw it. Now we saw that in this screen, but there's many genes that are regulated by these premature termination events. So if you deplete an integrator subunit and do RNA-seq, you can find hundreds of RNAs become upregulated. And what I love about this data is the scale. So this is a log two scale. So for some of these genes, they're going up eight-fold, 16-fold, 32-fold, 64, or even 100-fold or more when you deplete integrator. So integrator can be a really, really potent regulator um, in cells. Now what's interesting further about this is we didn't discover integrator. So integrator has been known for almost 20 years now as, again, this multi-subunit complex that has an endonuclease, but it was originally shown the function at snRNA. So Ramin Shekhar's group showed that at snRNA genes, it does something pretty analogous to what it's doing at protein coding genes. It cleaves nascent RNAs as it's being made, and that releases the transcript and causes transcription termination. But now at a protein coding gene where you're cleaving the snRNA is at the end of the gene. So actually you're producing a mature snRNA that binds to proteins, forms SNRPs, and, SNRP, and, and SNRPs catalyze splicing. I guess I should have said that. Um, and so integrator cleavage here is absolutely critical for making a functional snRNA and making you know, splicing happen in cells. And so that to me is really intriguing because you have the same complex that's now doing very different things in the cells. So at snRNAs, which are required for splicing, integrator is a good thing. You need integrator because you need to make snRNAs to splice and there tends to live. Whereas at protein coding genes, integrator almost does the reverse. If the point of a protein coding gene is to make a protein, by catalyzing premature termination, that's a bad thing. And so clearly integrator activity needs to be regulated. But you can't just turn it globally off in cells because you want to make snRNAs. So how do you do this? So that's what we've been really interested in and in now. Um, the good and bad of integrator is it's super complicated. There's many subunits, over 14 subunits. What is interesting is that mutations in many integrator subunits have been associated with developmental defects, especially in the brain. How exactly that works is not so clear. Um, but what we've been finding that I think is really interesting is roles for particular subunits that are help dictating this. So for reasons that I, I won't get into, we've been really interested in overexpressing integrator subunits and looking at the effects on, on gene expression. And if you overexpress one of the subunits int S12 and then look by RNA-seq what happens to the transcriptome, literally nothing happens. The only thing that got overexpressed was int S12, which is what we forced. Um, but if you now overexpress int S6, and we only see this with int S6, we've done this with all the other subunits, and we only see this with int S6, you can see now a set of genes become upregulated. And these genes that are upregulated are genes that are normally downregulated by integrator. So these are normally genes that are being repressed by integrator, suggesting that now there's a dominant negative effect and you've lost integrator activity. But if you look to see at snRNA genes what's happening, absolutely nothing's happening. So here what we're doing is we're measuring transcripts downstream of the snRNA. So integrators should normally cleave at the end of the snRNA and cause termination, but if you don't, you'll get reads downstream and they should increase. But if you overexpress int S6 or int S12 compared to control conditions, there's absolutely no change at all. So that says when you overexpress int S6, you can have effect on some protein coding genes, but not at all on, on snRNA genes. So you're getting, we're beginning to understand how this um, complex is regulated. And so ha what's happening here? So without showing you data, I'll just show you some models here. So there's now a cryo-EM or several cryo-EM structures of integrator out there. And so integrator is now known to have two catalytic activities. It has the RNA endonuclease activity that I've been focusing on, which is carried out by int S11, but it also associates with a phosphatase, protein phosphatase 2A, PP2A. 
And if you look where int S6 is in the structure, int S6 is very, very far away from the endonuclease, but actually right next to the phosphatase activity. And so what we find is that when you're overexpressing int S6, it's actually a competitive inhibitor or a sponge that basically pulls PP2A off from the rest of the integrator complex. So that now at loci, where it requires both the phosphatase activity and the endonuclease, now integrator is no longer active because you no longer have that phosphatase. If you only require the endonuclease, now you're still able to function. And so what we found is basically at SNRNAs and protein coding genes, we used to have a very you know, somewhat naive view, to be honest, that you know, the endonuclease was the whole story, but now we know it's more complicated than that. And that this protein phosphatase is really differentially required at, differential, uh, at different classes of genes, which I think is interesting. And being able to understand now, how would we target that? Because again, a lot of genes are being risk regulated in integrator. There's um, mutations in integrator that are associated with developmental phenotypes. How would we possibly target that? Well, we can't just get rid of integrator, but now I think we have a clue that this int S6 PP2A interaction is really critical um, in cells and perhaps pharmacologically modulating that could perhaps have interesting effects. We will see. In any case, in summary, what I've tried to do is take this rather simplified view that we have, which is exactly right, there's nothing wrong with this in any way, but try to add on top of it. You know, we know how RNAs are supposed to be transcribed, processed, how they're supposed to be look, and how they're supposed to be translated. But what I've hopefully convinced you is that, you know, RNAs don't necessarily have to be processed to give you a linear mRNA that's capped and polydentylated. They don't have to be spliced a certain way. You can have different three prime ends. You can get circular RNAs being produced, and even in the transcription process, these early transcriptional termination events can have a really major impact on the output of what's being produced. And so with that, I want to thank um, my current lab, people in the past that have done a lot of this work, collaborators from the past. Even I went back to even uh, grad school and postdoc work, so my grad school and postdoc mentors, um, and, and um, thank all of you for um, having me here, and I'm glad to take any, any questions you have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeremy. That was great. Uh, we have time for a few questions. And uh, maybe also we have uh, microphones up here on either side of the aisle. And I'll start, Jeremy, with a question. You had showed us uh, earlier a circular RNA that uh, seemed to uh, go down uh, during myocardial ischemia in an animal model. And uh, then when that was when you and your colleagues overexpressed it, that reduced the injury uh, caused by cardiac recovery. And I was just wondering if we even understand the mechanisms. Is that circular RNA, is that protein coding or? Okay. So, so no, so, so it doesn't seem to be protein coding. It's not, it's not clear the mechanism. There, there was something that was proposed in the paper. It, it, was, it was an idea. Um, one thing that we did go after was, you know, there's a lot of ideas of, of circles being sponges for microRNAs. Um, and so we specifically mutated the microRNA binding site, and that was still able to rescue the phenotype. So, so that wasn't the role, um, but exactly how it is working isn't clear. That one's a pretty small circle. It's only like 200-something nucleotides. So how exactly it works, not, not so obvious. But yeah, that, that's a very interesting question for, for going forward. Vittorio has a question. Fascinating work. <laughs> the, the, the protein coding circular RNAs only function with a single coding sequence, or do, can they also function as multi-systronic kind of? Yeah, it, it's an interesting idea. You know, you, if you want to make it um, a designer one, you can design it however you want. Endogenously, that's not so clear. And even just in general, whether circles or how much of circle endogenous circles are translated or not is, is controversial, we'll put it that way. And, and part of the reason is, for things like ribosome profiling, which are so great, you can't really distinguish a linear and a circle very well because the only thing that's unique about it is the junction. And so I think that's a very difficult question here to really address. Um, but I, I think it's really interesting. And, and, and there, I think there are examples where things are maybe in a different frame and that sort of stuff compared to the canonical ORF, which I think is really cool. Um, but it, it's, they're a little technically challenging, especially for the endogenous ones because of just the, the sequence overlap with the linear. But yeah, I think. Very cool direction for the future, yeah. One thing I really liked about your talk is, is how you showed us that uh, understanding of, of, uh, uh, of how viruses function. Um, 
uh, can uh, and, and have their translate of their proteins translated um, can can lead to improvements in RNA therapeutic RNA stability like that. Rift Valley fever virus you showed us that there was some element uh, it's not it's not a polyadenylated element but some element that allows translation uh, anything more on that do you know anything more about how that works no it, it's it, we, we've been trying to narrow it down it's already a pretty small region so it's only like 70 nucleotides but it's very poly C rich what about it that works it, uh, we don't really know yet but I think that's a super interesting way going forward but near certainly they're different mechanisms than we're used to. It's near certainly not binding poly A binding protein, but does it have its own unique partner and, and is it taking advantage of something? I'm, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, it's taking advantage of things that cells naturally use in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be really informative to understand. But, yeah. but no, I, I, I would love to have the whole story for you, but I, <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, we would really like to work with you and, and understand a little bit more together how, um, you know, these. Uh, these viral elements might be able to enhance our therapeutic yeah, RNA. That'd, sure. be, that'd be great fun to do that with you. Um, well, we have, um, for each of the speakers, we have a gift. And Christina Herrera um, uh, has, has uh, put together these really nice little gifts for all the speakers. We won't, we won't uh, open up all the gifts for, for you, but we're going to open up yours, if that's okay, Jeremy, to show you. Um, that is, uh, uh, thank you, Christina. It's very, very, nice. very beautiful, yeah. As a, as suitable for display on your desk, uh, it could also be may, maybe protect you in, in the right, case. If I need to get it. <laughs> for the next week, I might need this. So just it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's a very substantial. I did uh, see the Houston Astros flag at the, at the outside, <laughs> uh, flying like, oh, well. but it'll be fine. It'll be fine, guys. Thank you, Jeremy, for yeah. a great talk. Okay. We'll move on. Thank you, Jeremy. That was great. We'll move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Lior Zengi, uh, who is joining us today from Mount Sinai. He uh, was trained at the Weizmann Institute of Science and at Harvard University, uh, and now he's an associate professor with tenure at the Icon uh, School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And he's done some really um, important work. Uh, his work uh, early on with modified RNA, uh, message RNA, for um, cardiovascular regeneration. Uh, he uh, was the first to show that uh, VEGF mRNA uh, could be used to uh, improve um, recovery from myocardial ischemia. And uh, that work led to a program by Moderna to, to assess the utility of, um, of uh, VEGF mRNA in myocardial ischemia and uh, went, underwent a successful phase two trial with uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, but today you're going to be talking to us about smart RNA, so looking forward to that. Thank you, Lior, for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So we use uh, modified mRNA to treat uh, ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of death in the world. Upon myocardial infarction, you have a blockage of the coronary arteries which create a ischemic injury in the muscle. And ischemic injury in the muscle that result in the death of the cardiomyocyte, the contracting cells in, in the heart. And um, cardiomyocyte do not proliferate, so there's no replacement with new cardiomyocyte, but rather a scar. And this cannot be, there's no cure today that can replace uh, the scars with cardiomyocytes. The way we approach it is using genetic medicine with modified mRNA, the technology that was discovered by Cathy Carrico and Drew Wiseman. The idea is 100% replacement of uridine with pseudouridine that uh, create an mRNA that it's non-immunogenic and uh, uh, less, has less cleavage by RNAs and enhance translation, basically an ideal tool for gene delivery. We deliver it directly into the heart. Uh, there is no limitation of, of gene size. The pharmacokinetics is short. It's up to 10 days expression in the heart. You can give, of course, multiple administration. However, it's an open <laughs> chest surgery, so it's quite limited in how many times you can do the operation. Uh, it doesn't compromise the DNA. You have a control of the amount that you give. 
the gene expression is up and down because you can put an open reading frame to upregulate a gene or a mutated gene to downregulate it, but it don't have any organ specificity or cell specificity it will express in any uh, cell. The use of modified RNA in the heart started with our publication in 2013 when we showed with VGFA, modified RNA, when injected into a mouse a heart attack model, we showed that it induced cardiovascular regeneration and a prevent remodeling of the heart. This work were taken by AstraZeneca and Moderna into preclinical pre studies in, in pigs and show a reduction in scar formation and then moved to uh, phase one human clinical trial showing that in human it creates new blood vessels and uh, recently a successful phase two human clinical trial showing a six month improvement in cardiac function and uh, after injection of a direct injection into the heart. So in the last eight years, our, my lab in New York focused on using this technology to transiently change the gene expression in the heart to induce cardiovascular regeneration, cardiac regeneration, and cardiac protection. So we first uh, optimized the system to make the mRNA translate the best in cardiomyocyte in the heart and we published several of paper. This is color coded, so you can see the paper, and you're welcome to read them. Uh, how to make the best modern RNA for the heart. Then we took this optimized system, and we used it to identify six different targets that can reduce the remodeling in the heart and induce, as I said, a protection, regeneration, and cardiovascular regeneration. And last, and, and that's really the smart system. Uh, it's to overcome the lack of cell specificity and the need for open chest surgery that's uh, been used uh, today. And I'm going to talk about it. But before going into the smart system, I will start with our top target. So it's been known over a decade that the key to induce regeneration in the heart is to induce cardiomyocyte proliferation. And we know that because if you take a, a mouse or a pig in day one after birth and you create a heart attack, a cardiac injury, the heart can repair itself. And the way it repairs itself is via cardiomyocyte proliferation. And if you wait one week, you have a scar. So this is the key, cardiomyocyte proliferation. Many have shown that uh, this uh, use of cardiomyocyte proliferation works in the uh, in, in mouse heart, and, uh, and we also identify a gene that's called PKM2, pyruvate kinase muscle 2, that can induce proliferation. It's an anabolic gene. When you give it with an mRNA injected directly to the heart, it stays for 10 days. And we hypothesize that this gene can induce proliferation of cardiomyocyte. We indeed did a model in mouse when we took, a, a, we did a heart attack we give an injection of PKM2, and in day seven, we evaluate proliferation via BRDU, KI67, and PH3. And we found that cardiomyocyte proliferate. So we achieved our goal. But what was the problem? Also, the non-cardiomyocyte proliferate. All the cells that take PKM2 proliferate. And we want cardiomyocyte proliferation. So to put us all in the same page, Basically, uh, modern RNA have the 5' UTR, the gene of interest, and the 3' UTR with poly -ATL. In this case, it's GFP. We are injecting it naked, so we make the modern RNA in a sucrose buffer, directly inject it into the heart. The mRNA, the naked mRNA, uh, taken by the cells, the cardiomyocyte and the non-cardiomyocyte, because it's modified RNA, it have 100% replacement of the uridine. With pseudouridine, when it's get into the endosome, it's not been recognized by the toll-like receptors that recognize only uridine, and it's allowed to escape the endosome and go and be translated in the ribosome, like this mRNA that comes directly from the nucleus. And you have translation of GFP in the cells, and again, the, the key that it's cardiomyocyte and non-cardiomyocyte. And we want translation only in the cardiomyocyte. We don't want translation in other cells. So to achieve that, 
we build a system that calls SMART, specific modified mRNA translational system. Mm -hmm. The idea is that mRNA you can deliver one or two or three genes, it doesn't matter. Uh, so here we deliver two. One is a suppressor gene, L7AE. L7AE is, is, is a protein that know how to recognize a certain uh, RNA K motif, uh, motif and it cuts it. You can think about it when this mRNA translates to a protein, the protein behave like a scissors and just cut like a microRNA that recognize a certain area and cut it. So when L7AE mRNA and, and this gene of interest, in this case GFP, that have K motif are both being transfected to cells, you don't have translation because the L7A will suppress the translation of the GFP. Here occurred the smart part when we put a recognition element for microRNA 1 and 208. What's unique about MIR 1 and 208? They're exclusively expressed only in cardiomyocyte. So this construct will not translate in any other cells in the heart, but just in cardiomyocyte, MIR 1 and MIR 208 will recognize this recognition element destroyed the L7AE, which allowed the GFP to translate only in cardiomyocyte. Another interesting thing that MIR1 and MIR2 a are detrimental to the heart. They've been upregulated after a heart attack, and they induce apoptosis and fibrosis in the heart. So by using this SMART system, we actually take microRNAs that detrimental and give a gene in our case will be PKM2, that benefit the heart. So just to see that uh, in a video, those two mRNA can go, again, to the heart direct injection into non-cardiomyocyte. In the non-cardiomyocyte, the L7AE translate the protein of L7AE, recognize the K motif, and destroy the GFP. So you don't have translation in non-cardiomyocyte. In cardiomyocyte that have me one and me 28 the both recognize the L7AE and destroy the L7AE, which allow the GFP to translate, and then you have translation only in cardiomyocyte and not in non-cardiomyocyte. To look in, in real life how this system looks, this is a, a left ventricle of a mouse, post MI, stained for troponin I in, in red. It's a specific marker for a cardiomyocyte. And a CRE modern RNA that it's expressed in non-cardiomyocyte and cardiomyocyte. So in non-cardiomyocyte, it's create green cells. In cardiomyocyte, create yellow cells. And you can see you have green cells and yellow cells when you use the, the modern RNA. However, when you use the SMART system, the expression is only in the cardiomyocyte, so you see only yellow cells and not green cells. So we put in the SMART system the PKM2. This is F. And as you can see, we repeat the same experiment that I described before, but this time there is proliferation of only cardiomyocyte and not increased proliferation of non-cardiomyocyte. So we achieve exactly the goal that we wanted to to have from the beginning, and then we moved to functional, and we saw that uh, 28 days post a uh, heart attack, we have a, a better functionality. The video doesn't run really well, but you can see over here that the left ventricle, uh, it's much, uh, the contractility is much reduced in compare to the PKM2, and the injection function is being uh, improve and the long-term survival. So all the parameters that you want for cardiac regeneration uh, can be seen. Okay. So we conclude this work in mice that when you take smart, uh, cardiomyocyte smart, for PKM2, directly injected into the heart, you induce anabolic metabolism in cardiomyocyte, induce their proliferation, and for that, you get uh, cardiac regeneration, you have 
new muscle, as you can see, there's a much thicker wall with new cardiomyocyte. We next wanted to move into a large animal model, into pig model, that we work in with uh, Jay Zhang from Alabama. So over there, we started by uh, doing a heart attack, a wait a week, and then direct injection into the heart, and wait another week to collect the, the pig heart and to look at the expression of lag Z with X gal staining, so you have blue color where you have a, the, a, a tr translation of the mRNA. And you can see here clearly the MI area, this is the necrotic area after a heart attack, and the mRNA in blue surrounding this uh, area uh, with a, a mode RNA. So next we wanted to see if the smart system can work in large animal. So we use here same uh, approach, but we injected nuclear GFP because uh, we wanted to see that if it expressed only in cardiomyocyte and it's hard with the li uh, high autofluorescent in the heart. So nuclear GFP is the right model to do it. Uh, and here you can see clearly in the nu nuclear GFP mode RNA, there's translation in many cell types, including cardiomyocyte. However, when you use the SMART system, you have the nuclear GFP expressed only in cardiomyocyte, but not in other cell types. So this is really specific and work in pigs. Then we put the PKM2, and again, the same, the same model, heart attack, one week later injection, and then uh, evaluate proliferation. We use uh, KI67 and PH3, showing that there is induction of proliferation just in the site of injection, but not in, in remote site or, or in, the, uh, in a non-injected uh, pig, in the control pig. All of that led us to do it in a long-term study. Over here again, we make a heart attack, we wait one week, we give the injection of the human PKM2, we, we show that mouse and human PKM2 both uh, behave similar, so we're trying to humanize the system. So human PKM2, and then we had echo and, uh, to evaluate contractility, <coughs> MRI in day 56, and collecting the tissues. And you can clearly see much better contractility of the um, pigs treated with the human PKM2. And over time, you see here after heart attack reduction around the a, a mark of a 20 fractioning shorting and injection fraction. This is fractioning shorting is how strong the heart can work and the muscle, and injection fraction is how much blood is being pushed into the, the aorta. So both really major parameters of heart function. And you can see that there is an improvement with the human PKM2. Just to have a comparison, a, a, a year ago, a, bro, uh, a group uh, from him, from Jim Martin, used AV uh, with short herpin RNA uh, to activate YAP. They showed that uh, in pigs, uh, uh, there is, uh, after day 60, the control group have 30% injection fraction and the treated 39. In our very similar experiment, in day 56, control have 30% but treated 57. So we think that this tool, it's much more e efficient. And of course, uh, the injection function went up significantly, the stroke volume, the uh, end systolic uh, volume, so the way it contract is much better. And also the scar, the infarct size and the infarct volume that were calculated using MRI showed uh, a reduction after treatment with the human PKM2 cardiomyocyte SMART. And you can clearly see a difference between the vehicle heart scar formation versus the treated that you see a very small scar in the middle of the muscle. So that in cardiac regeneration, and that's ongoing, and the next step will be to do a heart attack, to wait one month, and then to do an injection and see if we can really 
induced cardiac regeneration after the muscle is really been uh, fully remodeled. But the, where's the future and how all of that uh, related to, to nanoparticle? So we have another problem in the cardiology besides heart attacks, which is the cardiac toxicity, which take like 13% of, of all a cardiac incident. And the cardiac toxicity mostly come, mostly come from a, a cancer-related agent. So there's a lot of chemotherapy that have been uh, used that have an effect on the heart and detrimental to the heart. The most famous one is doxorubicin. So the, the question was how we can protect the heart from the harmful of those agents and doxorubicin. We have published a, a couple of years ago that we identify a gene called acid ceramidase that cuts ceramides. And one of the mechanisms of doxorubicin is to upregulate ceramide. So if you have something that can reduce ceramide, that this could be good. And we show that, of course, in, in, in a heart attack model, when we show that it prevents apoptosis and infiltration of neutrophils to the heart. So we thought that this could be a very good gene to use to protect from doxorubicin. The problem that this was by direct injection, and you're not going to do an open chest surgery for someone that they go into uh, chemotherapy. So here comes the need to make uh, a smart that you put on nanoparticle that will deliver the mRNA specific to the heart. So instead of taking like with the modern RNA that you inject directly into the heart, we have now an IV injection of the smart system inside a nanoparticle that have lipids with affinity, with tropism to the heart. And when you put all this complex, you have translation only in the heart and not in other organs. When, so this is IV injection of this cardiomyocyte smart in uh, a design in, with more <coughs> microRNA recognition element to kill the translation in other organs in the lung, in the, in the spleen. And all this construct, basically, when injecting IV, gives a very nice translation in the heart. And when you use it cardiomyocyte smart, you have translation only in cardiomyocyte. The pharmacokinetics is quite quick, so 10 minutes after injection, you can detect a, a translation in the heart. After four hours, you have a, a nice protein expression, 24 hours. Day two, it goes down. Day three, it's go back to basal level. However, if you give an, another IV injection, you can replenish the mother RNA in the heart and have translation a, if you give an injection every three days in the heart. So then we move to the model. First of all, we showed in vitro with neonatal cardiomyocyte that indeed when you give an AC model RNA, you have uh, a reduction in apoptosis that caused due to doxorubicin. And then we move to our first experiment, which, will, which was giving IV injection of this AC Cardiomyocyte smart, we call it smart 2 because it's a new generation because it's in a nanoparticle. And <clears throat> that's a day later we give the doxorubicin and we show a 60% reduction in the toxicity of doxorubicin in a single injection. So the idea is that it's a known toxicity. We know there's going to be toxicity in the heart. So our key is really how to prevent it, but not prevent it, you think about you can use small molecules, but then you prevent its function in the cancer. So you have to make it very specific. So here, because we know that toxicity is, is coming, we know that we're gonna give the drug day later, we suggest to have an injection that will give a protection and day later to give the chemotherapy. So I hope with my talk, I convinced you that cardiomyocyte smart is an ideal tool to treat uh, cardiac disease. You can give it IV or direct injection as, again, no limitation of size. The pharmacokinetic can be long or short because every three days you can decide if you want to give more or not. Uh, you can give multiple administration. It doesn't compromise the DNA. You can control 
the expression. A gene expression could go up and down, as I mentioned, but you have now organ specificity and cell specificity. And I'd like to finish by thanking uh, my lab, uh, Magdalena Jacques, Jamin Yu, Anna Nukurian, Gaia, and Matthew, a former postdoc, Karat Kaurin and Jit Magadu, academic collaboration with Jay Seng, Zeng and uh, Jason Son. Um, and our uh, grant from industry from NantRNA that allow us to go into large animal. Of course, my uh, two hour ones that <coughs> focused on PKM2 in small and large animal and donor recognition for the Son Chiong family and Ingo Conrad and Sue Bloch for their donation. And we are looking for a new and bright scientist that will join us in New York. So if you're interested, you can email me, and uh, please follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lior. That was super. And I'd like to remind everybody, again, we have uh, uh, microphones on either side of the aisle. Uh, Dan Kiss has a question. Uh, I think I have to turn it on there, Dan. There we go. Uh, first of all, Lior, excellent talk. Very elegant system that you've designed. Um, you. Now, the first question is, well, the first question, I know you've done the controls and probably published them in the paper, but what's the off-target of effects of expressing the L7AE just by itself in any target cell? Uh, are there many or any? Uh, the, the function? Yeah, because it's an RNA endonuclease that yeah. targets a specific sequence. So is that, I'm guessing that sequence can't be very common in the transcriptome. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not that common, no. Okay, uh, so have you done RNA-seq just to assess off-target effects? No, we haven't. But this is, would be something interesting to check. We haven't seen uh, uh, severe toxicity. One, one of the ideas is that this is a transit expression, so it's, it's not really probably not that, that uh, efficient and not uh, highly expressed in the cell. We definitely will have to do it with uh, one that IV delivered. So we'll, this is something that uh, definitely has to be evaluated in any immunological effect and um, a cutting of the oral uh, side effects of the L7E in general. Now we also use another system which, call, with, which have a similar result, which is with Cas6. So Cas6 also have a hairpin that's been recognized. And we moved now, so most of this data, I didn't want to bother you all with all the details. Uh, details is more for papers, not for talks. But uh, Cas6, it's much more efficient because the L7AE, you need to put the K-motif, and the K-motif reduces uh, translation uh, of the mRNA. So we change it now to Cas6 with hairpin, we, when the hairpin of, of Cas6 do not reduce the reference. Yeah, and uh, you just stole my second question by answering with Cas6, so <laughs> I am done. Okay. Hi. Hi. Oh. Um, uh, my, many compliments for your presentation was great. Um, I have a question. In regeneration, the timing is important. So in your, in, can, you, can you comment on how you choose or if there is a window of treatment? Because right now we don't even have uh, a referiment on that. There's nothing over there that tells it, tell us, okay, inject three days after or for five days or so on and so forth. Yeah. A beautiful question because we, we check that. And the best way to induce regeneration is as fast as possible. So the best result will be if you inject immediately. And that's what we have done in our mouse study. So you can tell me, okay, Leo, if you know that, why you didn't do that with those pigs? Why? Because those pigs might die and mRNA is very expensive, you understand we inject like a 7.5 milligram per pig. So we want to make sure <laughs> that they are, they are okay when we go and inject them, that was one. And number two, of course we uh, knew that clinically 
it make a lot of relevant, not immediately to go and inject the, the patient, it will give them a week to, to recover, so we understand the logic. And also, we, we thinking of, for the future, that we would like to see after, what I said, the next experiment, after one month, so there's like a complete remodeling of the heart, can we have some influence? And that will be really the, the challenge, yeah. Let's see. Dr. Bimrush? Yeah, excellent work, I think, very, very fascinating and, and targeted. Uh, my, my question is about the specificity of the smart system. You're, you're, you're making it specific to the cardiomyocytes using microRNAs, yeah. if I got it right. Is that translatable to use different microRNAs for other kinds of cells, or will we be limited in the specificity when you try to target other cells? Yeah. So great question. We are a, absolutely you can do it to other cells. And basically my lab, that's exactly what we're doing. We have smarts to every organ and cell type. You give us the organ, you tell us the cell type, and we will target it. I know, and Dan Pierre will talk about it, that you can target it with, with a nanoparticle. And, and you can put peptides on, and you can put antibodies on. But that's partially work. What I'm claiming that it's imperfect system to use only the nanoparticle. We suggest to do a fusion of using the nanoparticle, which have some tropies into certain organ, and then to use the smart to give it more specificity and cell specificity. The money that we got from nanoRNA was to, to do it in, in the heart and in cancer. So we have a, a work, an unpublished work on uh, triple negative breast cancer, that you could, again, inject IV, IP, inhalation, and it goes specifically to the uh, breast cancer, and, and translate there, we have for monocyte, we do it for the lung, and we did for skeletal muscle. So again, if we have new bright students, we probably have new smarts to other organs. With the, uh, the uh, glycolytic enzyme, uh, the PK RNA encoding yeah. the PK pyruvate kinase, uh, that was amazing. Uh, and, and now you've uh, shown in a large animal model that, yeah. that, that you can uh, increase ejection fraction from 30%, which is like heart failure, to 57%, which is pretty much normal. Yeah. Uh, in, in a large animal model, uh, that's, that's spectacular. Yeah. And, and um, this is without arrhythmia. So there's no significant arrhythmia, there's no significant death. Mm -hmm. One of the work that were published a couple of years ago in Nature <coughs> with Moro Chaka from England showed that when he put on AV uh, one of the, his MIR, he had MIR199A that induced proliferation of cardiomyocyte, the pigs do very well in day 40 but start dying. And by day 60, all the pigs die from arrhythmia. So triggering proliferation has to be transient. And that's basically the key of, of and, and the importance of using mRNA <coughs> and not using other uh, very aggressive type of uh, gene delivery system. Yeah. Sometimes the transient nature of message RNA is actually a benefit, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, one thing, though, I, I would say that the glycolytic switch occurs in the heart with ischemia yeah. anyway. So how is it that you need more of a glycolytic enzyme when, when a glycolytic shift is occurring in the heart. Is, is the pyruvate kinase doing something else? Yeah, absolutely. So it attached it, it to beta-catenin and activates CMYK and cyclin-D1. So this is an anabolic gene. This is, uh, uh, you have PKM1 and PKM2. And uh, PKM1 do the work quite fast and PKM2 do it quite slow. And because of that, they, all the intermediate steps are being delayed and being pushed into the fentose phosphate pathway, which is an anabolic uh, pathway. Together with that, the PKM2 directly attached to beta catenin and activate those genes. So he has many different ways to activate. He also activates YAP. Is a master regulator for proliferation. Okay, very yeah. good. Well, one last comment. I think uh, you didn't show us what happened with dumb PKM RNA. I mean, what, what, um, what I mean by that is if you don't target the cardiomyocytes, if you target the entire heart, yeah. you might have a benefit as well because we've so shown we have that. So we have done that in, in, in mice. 
Okay. In mice, one of those uh, uh, indications showed that uh, uh, this uh, have proliferation and more scarring. But okay. again, that's in a mouse. We haven't done that in, uh, in the pig. I hope the reviewers will not ask it, but mm. if yes, we'll have to. Very good. Well, well, thank you so much, Lior. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, applaud Lior again for his great presentation. And stay up here for just a minute. I just wanted to give you the, come on up, Christina. We have a, a gift for you as well. I think there's another question. And uh, while she's coming up, uh, uh, why don't you go ahead, Alessandro, for your Yes, question. in fact, I, I just had one last question. So from your uh, Murin model of uh, cardiomyocyte regeneration with your smart RNA uh, construct, I was wondering if repeated administration of the construct would, you would imagine having even a, a greater effect. And uh, I was wondering why you didn't, at least perhaps you, you just didn't show it, but why didn't you uh, perhaps test it in multiple administration if it's a matter of cost, perhaps, or? For PKM2 you're talking about. Correct. Yeah. So one, we have done that again in the paper in the mouse. We did uh, a, a two injections. So every two weeks we gave an injection. This was very tough model to, to master. We saw some beneficial effect. But uh, the reason we haven't went there, and, and John mentioned it, the results were good. When you have, when you strike, you strike oil, you don't keep digging. Uh, of course, I believe that if it will have a, if there will be a need, I'm quite sure that will be more beneficial if you wanted to go even and to induce more cardiac regeneration. But to do it in an open chest surgery, that will be very problematic. However, when we give it IV, as you saw, it goes into many other organs, so maybe you don't want PKM2 there. And therefore, the IV system were more for the cardiac protection that you don't, you want it to be in all the cells. So I think for your question, yes, that will be more beneficial. If that was an, a gene, if that was an organ that we can approach very easily, that will be beneficial to give uh, even two injections every two weeks or something like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Lior, stand there for just a moment. I, I want to get a picture of you uh, holding the, the trophy here because Christina went to a lot of effort in putting this together. And maybe we can get a close-up. Uh, it has your name on it. It has uh, also the name of our uh, George and Angelina uh, Costas Research Center for Cardiovascular Nanomedicine. We could get a, a close-up of, of that for the folks at home. Can, we, can, can you bring the cameras in? Actually, stand over there, too. Sorry. Sorry. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she put me. so much effort into it. <laughs> Vittorio, I know from uh, Stanford, uh, he and I worked together at Stanford uh, uh, quite a few years ago uh, when um, uh, Yamanaka came out with his uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cell technology. And Vittorio trained us all how to generate iPSCs. Uh, he ran a, a stem cell uh, seminar for our uh, UO1 consortium uh, and uh, did a spectacular job uh, uh, at that. Um, Dr. Sebastiano is uh, now an associate professor in the department of OBGYN at Stanford University. And he's developed a really interesting line of research on something called partial reprogramming. So using the Yamanaka factors, uh, OC4, SOX2, KL4, CMIC, these are transcriptional factors for pluripotency. Um, what he found was that if you stop short of inducing pluripotency, you can actually induce a, a regenerative response in cells and in tissues, and that led him to, um, to uh, develop, uh, co-found a company, Turn uh, Biotechnology, which is developing this uh, research avenue for uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, Vittorio, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, it's uh, for, for the kind of introduction and for inviting me, it's really a pleasure. And you know, it, I'm really blown away by the quality of the, of the speakers. So I hope I can be you know, as good as my <laughs> predecessors. So yeah, today uh, I will be talking. So I'm, I'm kind of wearing two hats today. I'm wearing my academic hat and my kind of pharma industry hat. Uh, as a disclaimer, as, as John said, I am a co-founder and also the head of research of, of TURN. But I still have uh, an academic life. 
Uh, and so today I will tell you about ERA, which is uh, what we call you know, the epigenetic reprogramming of aging. <clears throat> in the first half of the talk, I will tell you how ERA uh, came all about and, in the, uh, and give you an example of its potential in regenerative medicine. And in the second half, I actually got to share brand new data, very exciting that you are going to be the first to, to hear. <laughs> Uh, and so hopefully this is going to be exciting for, for everybody in the context of, of immunotherapy. <clears throat> so obviously the problem that we are trying, that I'm trying to, to tackle, again, both academically, but also from an industry standpoint, is the, the, the quote unquote problem of, of aging. Well, why? It's pretty obvious. Uh, because aging is the number one risk factor for a variety of different indications and different diseases. And it is because of the fact that we age that we are actually more susceptible to develop uh, uh, any of those diseases that you see that you see here. And this has a huge impact, not only on the healthcare system, obviously, but it has a huge impact also on the uh, you know, social uh, life of people uh, on the, and on the, on the society, uh, broadly, broadly speaking. And so what really I'm trying to do is to develop something that could potentially impact uh, not so much the longevity, this is a question that always comes, I'm not so much interested about you know, making people live longer, that could be a kind of a, <laughs> a collateral damage of what we're trying to do, right? But what I care about is really increasing the health span of elderly people to impact their quality of life. Now, if you combine this, and you combine it also with the, with the fact that we are actually aging in particular the western society is aging at a very at a warp speed uh, you, you you take the two things together and you know all of a sudden you realize that in 30 years from now approximately uh, uh, 20 percent so 2 billion people will be age 60 or older which means again being exposed or being at a higher um, chances to develop one of those one of those diseases so really this really speaks for doing something and doing something now, today. <clears throat> uh, so classically, the approach that we have, yeah, we have taken, does this work? Yes. Classically, the, work, the, the approach that we have taken has been preventative in the sense that we try to slow down the process of aging, but by doing so, we are actually increasing the time window in which the people are more frail. More recently, there has been kind of a, a new way of looking at this problem, and r rather than developing a preventative approach, if we develop interventions, so if we try to keep the tissues, the cells, the organs youthful, maybe we can you know, prevent the diseases of those organs from, from, from showing up with, with age. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Thinking that if we can tackle the problem of aging at its very core, we could potentially prevent many, if not all, of these diseases from, from, from showing up, from happening. <clears throat> and so how do we tackle this problem? Well, when I started thinking about this problem, being a developmental biologist by training, you know, I'm kind of simple-minded here. <laughs> the, re the way I, I thought I started th thinking about this problem was really an epigenetic problem. Uh, so to me, the fact that cells lose functionality over time, uh, and I'm not necessarily meaning that this is the, the cause of aging, it could be the cause and or the consequence, but at the end of the day, what happens is that the cells are losing their functionality. And that can be explained only by the fact that their epigenetic program is somehow messed up, okay? And this is true across many different epigenetic features, uh, from DNA methylation to histone positioning, histone modifications, 3D organization of the chromatin in the nucleus. So it's not just a single instance of epigenetic dysregulation, it's broad uh, changes. But again, the epigenetic program is really responsible for the loss of functionality of the cells. But that's good news in the way because the epigenetic program, unlike the genetic program, is an analog program. So it can be reset, it can be reprogrammed. It doesn't exist in a zero-one conformation. It actually exists you know, in a variety of different nuances between uh, black and white, in a way. So it can be reset, and that's great, that's good news. And that's exactly what, you know, era is all about is a resetting of the epigenetic program so that the cells can be more juvenile and more functional. And ERA, of course, you know, didn't come from out of the blue. Of course, it builds, as I used to say, really builds on the, on, or it stands on the, on the shoulders of giants. 
which is basically the work that uh, uh, many uh, before us, uh, over decades of, 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 uh, of research, have done before us. So all the way from the somatic cell nuclear transfer and to the discovery of Shinya Yamanaka uh, of the iPSCs. But I really think that ERA it is definitely one of the weapons that we're going to have in the future, a powerful weapon for personalized regenerative medicine. <clears throat> so how does it work? I'm pretty sure that you are pretty much all familiar with the, the idea of iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. So basically, the way it works is that you can take any somatic cell of any age, and by virtue of expressing a cocktail of reprogramming factors, you can turn that somatic cell, age cell, into an iPS. Uh, it's an embryonic-like cell, which uh, is, has two features, uh, important features. First of all, it's pluripotent, so that means that it can, can, give, can give rise to all the cells of the body, virtually. Uh, but then it's also very youthful, okay? So this process of reprogramming takes, uh, depending on you know, the method that you use, it takes about two to three to four weeks to happen. So you need to constantly express these factors exogenously to turn, for example, a skin cell into an IPS. So the question that we had was, and sorry, I should mention that it, was, it is also known that this process is kind of a, a continuum in a way. And so there is an area initially which is called area of return where if you stop the reprogramming, the cells kind of revert back to their original identity. So if you start with a skin cell and you stop the reprogramming early enough, you don't end up with an IPS, but you end up again with the starting cell, cell type. Now that in the IPS field that was considered to be a failure, right? Because the, of course the goal was to try to get iPSCs. But what we thought was like, wait a minute, that's a failure if you want to make iPSCs. But what if we actually take that as an advantage? Because the cells are not losing their identity, so they're still the same cells you started with. But what if they are younger in that window of time? What if we can achieve rejuvenation, which happens in iPSCs? What if we can achieve rejuvenation, but at the same time avoid cell identity loss? Because if that's the case, we can start thinking about you know, this as a, as a method to rejuvenate the cells, even in vivo to, at some point, without having them to lose their identity. And that's really simply what ERA is all about. So we hypothesized that this could be achieved by transiently expression, uh, expressing the, 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 the reprogramming factors and really controlling the time, the dosage, and the duration of this process. Uh, and so, to make a long story short, we have shown that actually this is really true, and so obviously we're using mRNAs, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> so we are using a cocktail of mRNAs, and we are providing them to aged dysfunctional, dysfunctional cells. And we have shown that you can make a younger version of those cells. And this is true across many different cell types. And since we are really working at the core level of uh, uh, aging, the aging process, you are not just changing the epigenome, you're actually affecting, as a, as a kind of a virtuous cycle, you're actually affecting a variety of different downstream manifestations of aging. Uh, and we have shown that actually we can affect most, if not all, of the hallmarks of aging. And again, by doing one thing, we can have a broad spectrum of uh, uh, phenotypes. <clears throat> and this is just a list of the cells that we, have, that we have shown. So let me just give you an example. This is published, okay, so you can see the, 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 the details in the publication, but I think it's one of the most striking examples of, of what the potential of ERA. So in this case, we, did, we use mouse uh, somatic stem cells, the muscle stem cells, so the cells that regenerate the muscle. Uh, we took them, we isolated them, we put them in vitro, and then the, the, the stem cells were separated in two groups. One that was untreated or, or treated with GFP mRNA, and the other one that was treated with the rejuvenation factors, just for 48 hours, so just two days of, of uh, uh, transfection. And then the cells were transplanted back into a host aged match immunocompromised mouse to basically see the capacity that these cells had in regenerating the muscle. And the muscle, of course, was also injured at the same time. 30 days after, we took the muscle out and we measured the force of that muscle. And so 
here in red you see the, the average muscle force of an aged mouse, which has been left in the cage uh, for, for 24 months. So, you know, it's a wild type mouse, but just aged. That's the average force of, that, of, of the, the tibialis anterior, which is the leg, the leg uh, muscle. Uh, obviously, it's much uh, smaller than the, the force that, an a, uh, that a young sorry, mouse uh, muscle has, as you can see here. So that's the average uh, force. Now, if you take that same aged muscle and you transplant aged matched cells that have not been treated in any way, you restore the physiological force of that muscle. It makes sense, right? But now you take the same aged muscle and you transplant aged matched cells but the cells now have been treated with ERA, you restore the force of a young untreated muscle. So it's about 40% of, mass, of uh, force induction, which is comparable to, to again, a, a juvenile, a juvenile uh, force. And here you see the single data points. Good news is that, of course, I mean, as much as we, live, we love mice, you know, we, you know, at the end of the day, we don't, we don't care so much about making them stronger, right? So we care about regenerative capacity of this technology. So we did also this, similar experiments with human muscle stem cells and similar things. So you see that the treatment with ERA restore the regenerative capacity of those muscle stem cells aged to the levels of young uh, untreated uh, stem cells. And what's really intriguing is that if you, uh, when you stagger the samples by age groups, you see that you start seeing a massive effect when you start dealing with aged stem cells, suggesting again that there is an, uh, something that is uh, happening at the epigenetic level due, due with, with time that ERA can take care about. And here you see, for example, this is the, the ratio between uh, the, the, the luminescence signal from the treated uh, lag to the one that's untreated, and you see that there is a massive effect in that, in that regard. So this concludes the first part of my talk. So ERA can be used, and I have a, a number of other examples. I just don't have time to, ro to go through them. But uh, I want to switch he gear here for a second and say, well, obviously, this has potential for aging and aging-associated indications. But ERA actually has a potential to be applied to any situation where there is an aging-like phenotype that may or may not be linked with chronological aging. What do I mean? Well, one of the examples, most, most obviously, is exhaustion. I'm pretty sure, again, that most of you are familiar with this phenomenon, right? So T-cell exhaustion, uh, so first of all, CAR-Ts are uh, cells that are now receiving a, you know, a huge interest because they can be used, it's a, it's a potent weapon against cancer. Unfortunately though, despite the promise, uh, each single CAR-T therapy has one bottleneck, which is cellular exhaustion. What does that mean? It means that the cells, because of the manufacturing process, and because of the fact that in vivo see the, micro, the tumor microenvironment, they start aging, they start senescing, right, because of a, a variety of different reasons. So that's an aging-like phenotype, if you wish, uh, which is obviously explained by epigenetic changes in the cells, where ERA could have a potential, potential benefit. <clears throat> Uh, and so, yeah, if you think about a, a, a weak uh, aged immune system, CAR T exhausted cells, ERA could potentially revert those cells, uh, similar to what we have seen in the muscle cells, to a more uh, youthful and, and functional phenotype. Uh, I'm showing you this not because I care so much about the potential, you know, revenues of what we're trying to do, but uh, this is just tells you uh, how the field is moving. Uh, and so again, immunotherapies are becoming one of the ways to go. But unfortunately, and this is what I really care the most about, is that CAR T therapy right now is the last tier intervention because of the cost and because of you know some some of other issues. Is really the last weapon that we use against cancer. Well, if we could make this process much cheaper, much more affordable, and much more potent, it could actually become the first tier intervention. It could have enormous uh, implications for the life of the patients, which is, again, what I really care about. So let me show you the data that I spoke about. So this is the experimental setup. So again, uh, we are mimicking uh, the cellular exhaustion of T-cells by overactivating the, the T-cells in culture. 
uh, and at some point the cells enter enters an, um, exhaustion, and we separate you know these cells ex uh, pre-exhausted cells into into uh, groups. One that doesn't receive any treatment, or I should say, they receive you know GFP treatment, and the other one that receives the ERA treatment, so the cocktail of of factors. Then the cells uh, of the two groups are engaged, are characterized, of course, in vitro, and I will show you that data, but they're also engaged in vitro with tumor cells. So the cells are supposed to be killing the cancer cells. So we want to measure if that killing capacity has been enhanced by the, by the, 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 the ERA treatment. Uh, and here, just to tell you that the cells are over uh, multiple times exposed to cancer cells, again, to mimic that uh, tumor microenvironment that uh, exacerbates the exhaustion phenotype. Uh, and obviously, the cells are, are, are exposed always to fresh cancer cells uh, that are you know, uh, there to be, to be killed for them. And so here you see an example of uh, using a young donor Okay, so obviously cellular exhaustion affects young and old donors, but affects the old donors much more robustly because also there is a chronological aging component there that needs to be taken into account. So you see here that using a young donor, we have an increase in proliferation of the cells. So the cells are cycling much faster uh, compared to the control GFP. But not only that, they're also more potent in killing the cancer cells over, uh, over different uh, um, uh, engagements. So here you see, for example, engagement number six, five and engagement number six. Uh, and they are much more robust, in particular when the cells are challenged, meaning that they are exposed to a much higher number of cancer cells compared to their number. So that's good news, but again, in the young donor, maybe you don't see that much because, again, the cells are still kind of juvenile and they're still kind of healthy and, and fit. But what's really exciting is to see the fact that if you use old donors, the, the, the effect that you see is much more pronounced. So here I'm summarizing, for example, uh, the data. So this is T cell proliferation. You see that compared to the no treatment in this case, but the GFP is the, is the same, you see that two, three, or six times of ERA treatment boost uh, the number of uh, proliferative cells in the, in the culture. And not only that, you have a boost by five times of their killing capacity. <clears throat> so again, here you see, in particular with the most challenging, with the most challenging conditions, you see that, uh, uh, and this is the third engagement, you see that the ERA treatment really, by five times, enhances their killing capacity. Uh, and I want to show you also here. So this is just a snapshot of the third engagement, but you see actually that this is true also at the fourth, at the fifth, and in the sixth engagement. Again, showing that the treatment with ERA really augments the capacity of these cells, not just to proliferate in response to the exposure of the cancer cells, but also to actively kill them over, over time. <clears throat> now, question, well, are the cells losing their identity? You remember that my, my kind of, you know, my mantra was, well, we don't want to lose cell identity, otherwise the cells may become carcinogenic, right? Well, one way to answer that question is, uh, given by the killing capacity of the cells. The T cells, of course, are T cells if they can kill the target cells. If they become something else, they lose that ability. And we are already showing that that killing capacity is still there and it's even enhanced. But we went further with our characterization. And first of all, we characterized the number of double positive or single positive CD4, CD8, and we don't see any major difference. We don't see any difference in terms of expression of uh, 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 cellular specific markers, again, suggesting that the cells are not losing their T cell identity. But what's really intriguing is to show the fact that uh, they start expressing slightly higher level of uh, uh, stem cell markers, and they're starting to, 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 to uh, reduce significantly the expression of exhaustion markers in line with our experimental hypothesis, that the cells now are much more potent, much more fit, and much more powerful in their uh, you know, ability to recognize and kill and kill cancer. All this was done with electroporation, and you can obviously imagine that electroporating you know, T cells six times has its own impact on, on the cells. So obviously the company is also working on a much better and milder and less cytotoxic way to, to deliver the Yamanaka factors. And I just want to conclude the talk by showing that 
we are developing successfully now uh, proprietary liquid nanoparticles that can very effectively deliver the, um, the, the, the reprogramming factors into, into the T cells to the levels that are you know, comparable to the, to the levels that you see in electroporation and obviously with a much, much lower uh, cytotoxicity and, and increased viability. So the plan is really to package now the error factors into, this, into these particles and use this and potentially use it for any CAR, uh, CAR T therapy uh, that is existing out there. Okay, so with that, I want to, I skip this for the sake of time, but I want to thank uh, obviously my lab uh, for, for all the work. And I obviously also want to thank all the people at TURN. And I just want to leave you with this kind of schematic or, or rendering showing what we are trying to do that again, potentially can be applied to, to any cell type in the body. Thank you. Really spectacular and promising, Vittorio. Thank you so much for that. Uh, just on that last uh, bit about the CAR T cells, um, you know, we're talking about immunology, but that, uh, that work uh, is highly relevant to cardiovascular as well. And there was this nice paper in Science last year by John Epstein's group showing that message RNA uh, could, uh, lipid nanoparticles encoding a CAR T directed against fibroblasts could reduce cardiac fibrosis. And, uh, you know, so I think that what you're doing is highly relevant to to cardiac uh, disorders as well. Jeremy. That was really beautiful. I, I know nothing about this. So um, so I was curious, so you, you hinted at it towards the end that there's certain changes that you're seeing in, in, in key genes, but in, I guess in any of your systems, how, how broad are the changes that are, whether in the transcriptome or the epigenome, or I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So. Uh, which kind of bleeds a little bit into also safety, a safety question. Uh, so obviously, ERA can be applied ex vivo or in vivo and or in vivo. Uh, the, the vision is to one day being able to actually deliver the factors directly in the tissue and being able to rejuvenate the organ or the tissue without extracting the, any cell from the body. That's the big dream. But we are starting ex vivo because uh, uh, ex vivo, of course, there is a number of stringent characterizations that you can do to make sure that the cells haven't lost their identity, they're still more accurately the same, uh, and uh, they are not carcinogenic in a way, obviously followed by transplantation studies. The CAR T therapy is a beautiful example of that because there is an existing pipeline uh, that has one fundamental bottleneck, which is exhaustion aging, and that's where ERA beautifully can, can kind of orthogonally intersect and make that product much, much better. But you're absolutely right. There is a number of things that we need to study. The good thing about the mRNAs, going back to your beautiful talk, was that actually the mRNAs have, by their own nature, a lot of ways to be regulated, engineered, uh, to, be, to make them safe, to make them targetable, druggable. So that's why I'm so excited. And that's why, I mean, I hope to establish also new collaboration with you guys, because, you know, that's, it's the way to go. <laughs> Another question? Go ahead. Uh, great talk, thank you. So I saw that you saw that it said it had T cell identity preservation. I was wondering if you looked into functionality like cytokines or somatic cell interaction. Uh, not yet, but we are starting those studies very soon. We also do see a reduction in uh, uh, some cytokine, uh, increasing some cytokine expression and decreasing some other cytokine expression. And we think that that could also have a beneficial effect, a kind of immunomodulatory effect when the cells are in the, in the, the, tumor, the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so hopefully next time, maybe if you invite me again. <laughs> so. Dr. Bimrash. Oh, excellent talk. You know, and, and the concepts of aging, as you said, probably go to all other pathophysiology. But a part of aging, does, is there an advantage in aging, like we are wiser as we age? There's an environmental adaptation of the cells. So in your epigenetic signatures, are there areas of aging which are more advantages that you would preserve versus reversing? Ah, that's, that's a wonderful question. No, I never thought about that. Uh, how, I think probably the one way to, to look at that problem could, to, could be like in terms of uh, uh, memory function or, or something along, it's like for example, if you reset the age of a neuron, 
are you resetting the memory capacity? <laughs> are you keeping the memory of the neuron? <laughs> and are you, or are you completely resetting it and you know, all of a sudden the brain is remembering something that never happened before? Uh, I, I, I need to think about that. It's a, it's a wonderful question. I, I need to think about how to measure the, kind of the, the, the good aspects of, of aging in a, quantitative, in a quantitative fashion. In some cases, erasing an epigenetic memory in the brain might be good for PTSD, for example. Right. Um, I have a challenge for you, and it's not thrown out by me, but it's thrown out by James Kirkland. James Kirkland, who is at the Mayo Clinic, so you, you're probably familiar with his work. So he's a proponent of senolytic therapy, and that's the idea that you get rid of senescent cells. You don't rejuvenate them. And the, pro the, the idea is that you get rid of those cells that are causing, releasing inflammatory cytokines and making all the other cells around them sick. You get yep. rid of those cells. And what he would say <clears throat> to you is that if you allow those senescent cells to survive, they have DNA damage. And now you've got cells that are rejuvenated that are, have DNA damage, and you know that's a precursor for some bad things. Yeah. So, uh, two answers to the question. There's some I've seen some posters actually about people that are working on rejuvenating the senescent cells, and there could be some beneficial effect in rejuvenating those cells as well, provided that the cells that we are dealing with are not severely, you know, genomically damaged. That's one side of the story, so there's more to come. I have seen some, some work in, in, that, in that respect. The second thing is that obviously I'm not saying that ERA is the only you know, way we're actually treating aging in the future. It's one of the many uh, tools that we're going to have in the future. So I actually look forward to seeing experiments where you combine, for example, senolytics and ERA. Because even if you let's imagine you get rid of the senescent cells, you are not left with a younger body, you are left with a still aged body, right, which is, you know, senescent cell less. But that doesn't mean it's younger. ERA can come in, and now that you have, get, have you gotten rid of the, all the senescent cells, and I'm not sure it's a good idea to get rid of all of them, by the way, because I think they have a beneficial also kind of, you know, work there. But uh, that's where ERA come, becomes you know, very powerful. So you get rid of the, of the bad cells, and now you reinvigorate and you rejuvenate the existing ones that are left behind. That's a great response. Um, before you leave there, let's uh, give Christina, if you could come up, and we'll give uh, Vittorio his gift. Uh, There's one last question. And uh, one last question while we're waiting for Christina. So, so my question is a little bit along the same lines. It was about DNA damage. So naively, you think you pick up DNA damage randomly as you age. Are you thinking that's more of an epigenetic? It would be more, you know, not random, but like regulated in, its, in how you're collecting the damage. And then the second question would be, do you suspect then when you set the cells backwards, do you have repair systems that can be turned back on or are more efficient? I mean, do you think that that gets repaired or do you think that, that, that you're, because I mean, it's a difference with, with senescent yeah. cells, they're really crippled, but. Yeah. All cells may have damage, right? Yeah. So no, there is no, obviously there is enough. Era uh, has nothing to do with repairing those mutations that have occurred over time. But uh, having said that, it's also true that if you rejuvenate the cells, you rejuvenate themselves to the point where they are also coping with DNA, DNA damage in a much more efficient way. Because DNA damage, damage happens in young cells as in old cells. The fact is that the young cells can deal with it much better because they can repair more effectively. So that's how I'm thinking about this problem. And again, to go back, I don't think ERA is going to be the only way. Like There's going to be gene uh, correction methodology in the future that maybe it's enough to correct one, two, or three bad mutations. But then again, generally speaking, the cells are still aged. If ERA can make that now fixed cell younger, that's, that's the, winning, the winning scenario. So that's uh, how I'm seeing it. Thank you, Vittorio. In the interest of time, I think we'll close this session by awarding Vittorio his gift. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. We're looking forward to hearing more about your work. And now I'm going to hand over the session to Alessandro Gattoni, my co-moderator. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Dan Peer. Dr. Peer is the director of the Laboratory of Precision Medicine, uh, Precision Nanomedicine at Tel Aviv University. He's also the vice president for research and development at the same institution. Dr. Peer is the founder and managing director of the SPARC Tel Aviv at the Center of Translational Medicine.
and is member of a scientific or the scientific advisory boards of numerous international companies. His laboratory works at the interface of basic and translational science and his work was among the first to demonstrate systemic delivery of RNA <laughs> molecule using targeted nanocarrier to the immune system and pioneered the use of RNA in drug discovery for immune cells and implication with the massive implication in cancer, inflammation, and infectious diseases. Dr. Peer. Thank you. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, I think it's the wrong presentation, but let's move and see, okay? <laughs> Central dogma of biology, it's gonna be quick and nice, okay? I, wanna, I want everybody to be very efficient in terms of looking at the difference between RNA and DNA, okay? Double strand, single strand, somebody to copy from. As you can see, that's the dogma. However, it's very hard to target tissues and within the tissues and organs, the cells. And actually, I, I personally do not believe in terms of organ specificity. I am an advocate for cell specificity, which is a different nightmare, okay? So, in terms of therapeutic approach, we know how to, or we believe that we know how to target the DNA, we know how to target proteins today, and, of course, we know what to do with RNA. And over the past years, uh, a lot of work has been done on silencing using RNAi and other approaches, in activating using mRNA and other approaches, and in editing and in replacing, mostly in CRISPR, but in other approaches, stylins, and, uh, as well as others. We've been involved with this for Ooh, almost 20 years. So in silencing, uh, we use sRNA. We're the first to show systemic delivery of sRNAs in vivo in a cell-specific manner to immune cells. That was back in 2007 and then 2008. Messenger RNA, we were the first to show systemic delivery of messenger RNA in an animal in a cell-specific manner. And that was not too, too long ago. Again, less than 10 years. Um, and genome editing, again, we were the First, I think, to show that we can do genome editing in vivo in a cell-specific manner in a very highly efficient, just again, less than three years ago. So, you know, the challenge in RNA therapeutic is twofold. The RNA, that is lots of issues there, and of course, the delivery. And I'll talk today predominantly about the delivery, and I will mention some of my uh, financial disclosures during the time that we'll go through this. In terms of requirements, we need an efficient encapsulation. Uh, we need a vague clearance mechanism to avoid toxicity in immune activation. The carrier must internalize or facilitate the internalization, everything you know, and RNA release, and of course, specificity. Super, super important. And we are advocating uh, uh, the field of lipid nanoparticles almost 20 years. Uh, basically, identify the mechanism by which cationic lipid agonized toll like receptor. And I was a persona non grata in 2008 in most of the pharmaceutical company because we identify that cationic, fully charged amines can create a lot of damage. Downstream, basically, a classical NF-kappa-B signaling effects or pro-inflammatory cytokines, interferon-responsive gene, everything is a bit crazy. And then uh, in 2010, I was approached by Peter Kulis and, and some other, and Carl Hansen that started a company uh, named Precision Nanosystem that actually wanted me to join. And we, I was on the scientific advisory board for 11 years until the company was sold last year to uh, Danaher. And basically, this helps us very much in terms of formulation study. So we can do different lipids. And I'll talk a little bit about ionizable lipids today. And of course, oligos or mRNAs or sRNAs or different kinds of RNAs. And with microfluidics, we really can get a lot of efficient uh, small particles. A lot of compounds, most of them are very known. And the ionizable lipids is basically the most important part of it. The advantage, as you know, they're biocompatible, biodegradable, nucleic acid protection, increase stability in circulation and therapeutic effect, and some of them are clinically approved. First one was on PATRO, an siRNA that Al Nylon generated, and approval was in 2018 in August. 
Uh, TTR amyloidosis, siRNA is the payload, and lipid nanoparticles, and of course, the Moderna and BioNTech uh, slash Pfizer vaccines uh, with mRNA. So my lab predominantly works in two directions. Okay, so we have a delivery people. We do everything from synthesizing novel ionizable lipid. In fact, we generated a few years ago probably the largest lipid library, I think, uh, that is being tested. Some of that is in clinical evaluation. Some of them will be in the clinic in next month. And I'll talk a little bit about this. We also generate antibodies and targeting moieties. And the other part of the lab is doing biology. Start, try to identify new therapeutic targets, and of course, in an ideal world, you want to combine those two. So we all know that uh, human disorders are very complex. There are lots of organs and cells that are involved in this. And my lab has a lot of interest in different kinds of RNAs, from siRNAs, mRNA, SA RNA self-amplifying, and circulate, uh, circular RNAs. Um, okay. So how we target to specific cell types, that was a mystery uh, for us already in 2003 and 4. And over the years, we have used different types of targeting moieties, decorating the surface of, of lipid nanoparticles with different approaches. But today, I'll only talk about antibodies and give you some examples. So antibody-targeted LNP construction. And we tried and worked a lot on chemical conjugation. And we discovered that it's not very efficient. So I like chemistry, being half of a chemist. But there is a limitation in terms of efficiency. Antibodies are not alike. Some of them have glycosylation. So it's very hard, really, to create something that is robust enough. Click chemistry is very good. Nobel Prize was awarded this year. However, leukocytes hate azide, hate. So basically, if you do click chemistry and you inject it systemically, don't be surprised that most of the T cells will die. So very good approach. FC exposure, it's also an issue. So you cannot really control your orientation with chemistry. And then you have a problem. If you're going to inject this into an animal or to a human, it will be taken out very quickly by cells having FC receptors. A very good approach if you want to target them but a very bad one if you want to go to other cell types. So we were really struggling, and about seven years ago, we created what we call a linker strategy. We generated an antibody that recognized an antibody, like a secondary antibody, but a monoclonal. And this is basically a, an antibody that recognized an FC portion. So we have different types of these guys. And they are targeting specific FCs of specific isotype, IgG1, IgG2, A to B, even 4. And then you basically need only one conjugation. We created the approach of lipidated, and I'll show you this, lipidated single chain. And then basically you have only one uh, conjugation. And with tiny amount of antibody, you just mix it. And like magic, the affinity is very high and they can go to different direction. So we call it the asset system, anchored secondary single chain FB enabling targeting, predominantly the work of Ranit Kedmi, now a new faculty in the Weizmann Institute. Oops, the Weizmann Institute. Or I don't go back, go back, go back. Yes. OK. And Ofar Weiga, who is a new faculty in Leuven in Belgium, a cell biologist, and basically this is the construct, which is uh, one transcript we found bacteria that lipidate basically a single chain. And uh, we, took, we took over of this bacteria, and basically we have lipidated single chain, and now it could be produced in mass productive also by C, uh, CROs. Um, and just mixing 250 fold less antibody and you get a very precise way to go to subsets of leukocytes. Just an example, OK, if we inject it, if we put on the surface, for example, an anti-beta-7 antibody, it will go to all leukocyte subsets. If you put an anti-CD3 to T cells, anti-CD4, CD4 cells, and CD25 to a subset of the subset. And this is when you have an siRNA, for example, Cy5 labeled inside. 
And we have shown and demonstrated that it uh, works in terms of uh, some animal model in therapeutics, and I'll show you some examples today. We have a lot of interest in hematological malignancy, solid tumors, inflammation of infection, and genetic disorder. We're involved in 12 clinical trials with different companies, predominantly uh, with BioNTech, with Neovac in Oxford, and hopefully with gene editors soon in the US. And um, I'll, I cannot really show you everything, but I'll give you some examples uh, of some of the things, for example, uh, mantle cell lymphoma, ovarian cancer, maybe glioma, colitis, and if I have time, COVID as well. Mantel, it's a quite rare uh, non-Hodgkin's uh, uh, lymphoma, about 6%, I think, has those. It's a very aggressive, and uh, it's still considered to be incurable with the median survival today with all the new pathway-dependent molecule for five to seven years, and we were interested to tackle this um, and we did a silencing approach, looking at pololikinase 1, PLK1, cell cycle regulating molecule on the surface, an anti-CD29 or a beta-1 integrin. And this is a model that was done in Charles River, uh, blinded, and you can see the results. So it's not great, but basically it gives you a, a potential, um, basically increasing the median survival here a little bit, and um, well, it's not median, it's overall survival. Uh, but basically, we are working on different combination. It's a very aggressive model, but different combination of, of this strategy. So in terms of, you know, potential, we believe that this has a potential. Another example in cancer, another silencing example, this time with hemoxygenase 1, a very interesting target that can do two things in parallel uh, with a target receptor that will be an anti-PD1. PDL1, and behind his work was Seong Byung, who uh, was a postdoc in my lab now back in Korea as a faculty. And this is uh, quite new, and actually it's very nice because hemoxygenase basically is a very interesting target that can do chemosensitization of chemoresistant cancer cells, that has been known, and it can also do immune modulation in tumor myeloid cells, that also was known. But putting together in one carrier actually gave us two very interesting uh, results. And I actually, uh, if you're interested in this, just read this paper that came up uh, two months ago. I think it's, it's, it has a lot of potential as well to explain this work as well. Okay, I'm moving on. Again, it's not my presentation, original one at least. <laughs> okay, but I'll, I'll improvise. Inflammatory bowel disease. What? Okay. So, uh, as you know, GI tract, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, chronic puchaitis, and here the current treatment are anti-inflammatory drugs, immune system suppression, and surgery. And we wanted to create a different approach in terms of, uh, for example, silencing. We chose interferon gamma for obvious reason, and the target receptors uh, will be an integrin alpha-4, beta-7. Behind this work was uh, Niels Dams, a PhD student in my lab now in Janssen uh, in the Netherlands. And basically, Nick, Niels decided to take it to the next level. The next level is not only targeting a specific receptor on immune cells, but the specific conformation of the receptor. So we were inspired by leukocytes homing. I did my postdoc with Tim Springer, so you understand that I'm really interested in this field over the years, and conformational changes and their role basically on endothelial cells and how leukocytes interact with endothelial cells are crucial. And we were interested in the alpha-4, beta-7 integrin, and we know that some chemokines can, oops, sorry, some chemokines can create an inside-out signaling event basically from a bent conformation, non-binder of the natural ligand, like uh, Medicam-1, to a high affinity conformation of this integrin. And what Niels has done is basically to engineer the first domains of the natural integrin, D1, D2, merge it into NFC, and then we can use our linker strategy. And in fact, we show that this has a lot of potential when injected systemically, IV, and we identify a very tiny 
population that has been silenced in leukocytes, it's mostly lymphocytes, which is about 15% of them. This is CD44, a pan-leukocyte marker, and only in the mesenchymal lymph nodes uh, during IBD. We also ask, can we do this as a marker for imaging using a micro-PET CT? So together with Alan Packard and Jason Darling in, in Boston Children's, uh, we identify that this strategy could very or early show the onset of the disease where leukocytes home into the gut area, only in colitis mice, not in healthy. Everything else, as you can see, goes to the liver. So we also have some uh, therapeutic effect, which was quite remarkable. As I mentioned, we chose interferon gamma as one of our control. And again, if you read the paper, lots of uh, colonoscopy there and histology. Uh, but just to show you an example of how this system is effective, this is the colon lens of a normal one. These are pyroxicum, these are IL-10 knockouts with pyro normalized with pyroxicum. So it's a short model. Uh, and basically you can see here all the relevant control. This is what we get with a targeted system. These are with controls. And this is an antibody against TNF-alpha. So it's kind of, you know, mixing a little bit bananas with oranges, but still we wanted to make sure that tiny amount of cells, which are probably kind of new to us, we try to identify what are their source, and we are collaborating with the Doamit, the Weizmann Institute, doing RNA sec on a single cell level to try to identify exactly those cells in colitis, both in human samples and in mouse models. Okay, the opposite approach, so this approach seems to be good in silencing. The opposite approach is, of course, activation with mRNA. So the target gene was IL-10, and this is a tip I got from Dan Littmann in 2010. You know, try to deliver mRNA, or try to deliver IL-10, that was his tip, uh, into the appropriate cells, and then they probably may change the gut environment. So what we have done is to target Lysic-C in inflammation, inflammatory leukocytes, and the idea behind it is making IL-10 basically cell factories, right? So you're using mononuclear phagocytes as your potential target. We inject this systemically. They're penetrating into mononuclear phagocytes, releasing the RNA. It's been translated, secreted, and the hypothesis was that it will change the gut a microenvironment during colitis. And it actually happened quite well. Um, this is just an example of luciferase. This is what we call a targeting index. So it's targeted versus isotype control on the surface. You can see two logs of uh, order of magnitude here in Lysix is positive and negative. This is flow cytometry, so you can gate in and out. And basically, you can see the expression of luciferase. So all those uh, leukocytes, mononuclear cells that are mononuclear phagocyte inside spleen, intestine, and liver, and again we isolate them, they're expressing this uh, luciferase. And we also show that IL-10 is super uh, potent there. You need probably tiny amount, and it looks good. So that was kind of an old example as well. So let's talk a, a little bit about lipids, and Srinivas Ramichetti spent about 10 years with me, now he's in Oxford and basically uh, took the MC3, oops, sorry, the MC3 version and uh, engineer it, uh, basically changing head groups, changing linkers, changing tails. And we came up with about 60 lipids family that encodes to 1,200 different lipids. We tested all of them, and we licensed some of them, and as I mentioned, some of them in the public domain to BioNTech in 2018. They are in clinical development for cancer indications and to other companies. Um, so basically, we use this for sRNA, just identifying a new potential formulation with new lipids that can do new things. Um, and quickly, I just want to mention that we have demonstrated that they're both safe, fully degradable, and in terms of biodistribution, reach the cells, of, the cells that we want to reach, mostly an area of uh, macrophages and some lung cells and some liver cells. Um, our small contribution in the mRNA vaccines, well, hopefully it will increase in a few months. 
But basically, together with the Israeli Biological Institute, we have used uh, transgenic mice with human ACE2, um, and we challenge it with an RBD human FC that we generated in the lab uh, with our lipids. And two papers were published uh, last year uh, on this challenge. We went up to 3,000 3, PFU, um, and I think it's uh, quite interesting as well. And uh, basically, just to show you that it seems that the world is ready for what's going on now in fast uh, mutated pathogens, and there are lots of options as well right, right now in the clinic, and you can do quite quickly these new designs and, and new types of carriers as well. So the history of pandemic, if you put COVID in perspective, COVID is not a huge damage worldwide. I mean, it was a financial damage, but if you look at this as, is it really something so scary? The answer is probably not. Only 0.08% of the entire world population, at least recorded by uh, 7 of August uh, 2022, are uh, uh, passed away from this in a population of 7.9 billion, 6.3 million. But if you look at the others, historically, Black Death, all the plague are very, 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 very dangerous. And still we do have plague. There is no licensed vaccines to plague. For the most aggressive pathogen, Hysteria pestis, that can cause both bubonic plague and pneumonic plague. And we were very challenged from this uh, approach and Kathy Carico, Carico, who is our very good colleague, said a few years ago that bacterial vaccines cannot be generated with mRNA. And we decided to challenge this and started working on this about four and a half years ago, much before COVID. And what we found is that, sorry, this is the bubonic and this is the pneumonic. One of the things is the very interesting biology that Hysteria pestis has. It has this F1 capsule. We design a lot of sequences, both bioinformatically and tested them as well, with some tricks. And, okay, and this is an example okay, of, of the both homoral response that we can get and the cellular. And again, I, I can't get into the detail. We deposit it in bioarchives so you can read it. But basically, it's very interesting. The most interesting part is that we get very good protection from this. And again, we get a very good homoral response and a very good cellular response. And we did a challenge, and this needs a BL4 lab. Because again, one bacteria kills one person. So together with, we don't have BL4 labs at the university, but the Israeli Biological Institute do have those for like rare pathogens. And so what we have uh, done is three experiments. Each one has three, uh, 12 mice per group, and you can see 100% protection. We deposited it August this year, and just about uh, two weeks ago, we got a call uh, from um, an area in Zaire that has Estesia pestis. And they basically read the paper and said, can you help us? So together with Adrian Hill, uh, the head of the Janner Institute in Oxford, who's made a lot of vaccine, including the AstraZeneca vaccine, and now converted into an mRNA person. So we are uh, going into this and probably going to do a very quick clinical trial with this as well. So just to show you that we're working on some other exciting lipids as well, these are thermostable lipids, uh, about 100 different lipids, just an example to show you that they can be stored for one year. We're going to test it clinically, hopefully by the end of this year again in Oxford in a trial, uh, just to see that, you know, size is maintaining and many other parameters. And we have also generated antibodies from Omicron for this. So I just quickly talked about these things, about silencing and activating. I want to show you some example on, on CRISPR and behind this work with Daniel and Anna, now a husband and wife, now in NYU. And uh, they've done quite nice as PhD students. Uh, and why cancer? You know, you can imagine other diseases, but we were sure that if you take driver genes out, you might get interesting results. And, okay, this is why cancer. 
And this is what you need. You need a cas protein and you need a guide RNA. And what I'm going to tell you is a story that started a very long time ago in 2014, when they started their PhD. And it took us a long time to understand. So you know there are two options here, if you have a template and if you don't have a template. And we wanted to use this because it seems to be easier in 2014. And what happened is that, okay, that uh, this is the reality. You can put either a Cas9 protein and, and guide RNA and an RNP. You can do a Cas9 plasmid, or you can take both of them, a Cas mRNA with guide RNA. And we decided to do this. And it's actually, it's large. It's about uh, 4.6 uh, kilobase, just the Cas mRNA. So we decided to coin trap Cas mRNA with single guide. It took us about three years to understand what we are doing and finding the right lipids. Um, because, as you probably know, this is the mechanism by which they're entering. So now you have a Cas9 mRNA that will be translated, but the single guide will be degraded. And again, it took us three years to understand this process. It's kind of a pasta and sauce case. One needs to wait to the other, okay? So together with Mark Belke and his team in IDT, we started modifying the single guide RNA. And now you can commercially buy those Modi highly modified single guide RNA that can stay inside the cell for at least 48 hours. And that changed our life completely, this process, because we can get high efficiency. So also we started uh, basically looking at this, at the MC3 lipid, which was very, very popular back then in 2014. And we decided it's not good enough for us because we need higher payloads. And using uh, uh, different chemistries, we started with smaller library just to identify some new lipids that might fit well to our purposes. So we screened those. And again, I don't want to go into details, but we found that you know three lipids behave interesting. This is the MC3, and this is the percent of GFP positive cells. You basically want to see here uh, indels and you want to see them uh, uh, basically uh, editing and what we found that one of them is superior to the rest and we wanted to continue with this. We used two animal models, uh, Morino Totopic uh, GPM005 that we got from Inderverma at the Salk Institute uh, and human metastatic ovarian adenocarcinoma. Just quickly let me go into this. So we chose, G, uh, we chose PLK1 because PLK1 has, in both cases, high expression. And you can see here editing in vitro, okay? And this is massive. All the editing is based on NGS. Everything was done in Iowa, blinded in IDT. So basically, we saw that it works well. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but just to show you that a single administration intra- um, basically into the hippocampus where the cells have been reside, we can see editing of 70% or the GFP locus of 75%, and we also see the mechanism of apoptosis, and we also see a, a therapeutic effect, okay, with an increased overall survival, one single administration. We did the same for ovarian, Okay, using this system with a targeted system. Again, I don't have a lot of time, but basically you can read it. And remarkably, we got 80% genome editing in vivo that translated into a very, very efficient and potent uh, therapy. This has now been scaled up, and we want to test it clinically in ovarian metastatic uh, carcinoma. So just at the end, just to show you that we believe in terms of the vision that gives you endless opportunities. I apologize that I mix up with, uh, with another presentation, but I hope you can forgive me. And uh, I want to thank the people in my lab. We have openings always for excellent postdocs. Uh, we have people from basically all over the world, from Australia, US, uh, India, uh, Korea, and others, and Italy quite a lot. In Belgium, and I want to thank the funding agency, mostly the ERC, the NIH, and, and some companies that help us and fund us as well. And 
I'll end up with a short animation. Let's see if they have voice here. You can benefit from this. Cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide. Cancer cells divide without proper control due to genetic mutations within them. Most traditional cancer treatments are insufficient and cause severe side effects because they harm not only the cancer cells, but healthy cells as well. To make cancer treatments more efficient, we at Pe'er Lab have developed special lipid nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are able to recognize the mutated gene within the cancer cell and destroy it. Allow us to explain how they operate. We insert two RNA molecules into the lipid nanoparticle, a messenger RNA that has the instructions to build the CRISPR protein Cas9, which acts like a surgeon's scalpel, and a guide RNA designed to direct the Cas9 specifically to the target gene. On the outer surface of the lipid nanoparticle, we attach a special linker we developed called ASET. The ASET linker binds an antibody that recognizes a specific receptor on the cancer cells. After injecting the lipid nanoparticles into the patient's body, the antibody directs the lipid nanoparticles specifically to the cancer cells, sparing the healthy cells. The Cas9 mRNA is translated inside the cell to the Cas9 protein, and then assembles with the guide RNA. The Cas9 guide RNA complex enters the nucleus and locates the mutated gene within the cancer cell's DNA. Once recognized, the CRISPR scalpels cut the gene and permanently disrupt it. The treated cancer cells can no longer divide, no matter how much they try, and eventually die. Our highly effective and precise approach can revolutionize cancer therapy and improve the quality of life of cancer patients. That's it. Thank you. Phenomenal presentation. Uh, perhaps the easiest question to ask is, is there something you're not working on? Because you have shown pretty much everything. Now, for uh, sake of time, I would like to just limit the number of questions, and perhaps we, we can uh, engage with you later during the, the breaks. But uh, Francesca, please. I don't know. OK, it's working. I'm a huge fan, first, I have to say, in front of everybody. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. So looking the nanotechnologies and the nanoparticles, especially in cancer, but also in regeneratives, what we saw for liposomial formulation is that we had a lot of preclinical, but clinical, we didn't have too many products. And for LMPs, the, the hype was different because there was the 2018 first and then now with the vaccine. So my, my question is how you envision the pipeline uh, in comparison to what happened to the liposomal formulation and what actually LMPs can cover? Okay, very good question. I have a very simple answer. Uh, in January 2020, there were only eight clinical trials, that was a little bit before COVID, with RNA in general with lipid nanoparticles. If you go to clinicaltrial.gov today, and I haven't done it, I have done it two months ago, it's close to 2,000 clinical trials. And that's also a very big problem for the community, because if I want to buy mRNA, and I don't have connection with this gentleman here, okay? So I need to stand in line. And what was, and I won't tell you company's name, but if originally it should have taken, I don't know, six weeks, now it will take 16 weeks. So time is an essence as well, because you need to be part of the queue. And it's good or bad. I think we'll see much more approved 
formulations and approved uh, ideas. Look at what's going on right now with genome editing in Telia, for example, that have very good results and many other companies as well. Um, but I think the next generation will be going beyond the liver. And I really think that uh, this field is booming and I'm very happy that my original NIH grant that I submitted in 2009 with Derek uh, Rossi on, on uh, mRNA and lipid nanoparticle for potential vaccine was not even reviewed. <laughs> We got comments like crazy comments from the panel that this will never be scaled up, never be, you know, modification are crazy, something. And you know the results, Derek became founder of Moderna, left the academia, and I stayed. <laughs> so. Thank you. I'm also a fan. Uh, great talk. I wanted to ask about most of your delivery was direct injection and IV, if I noticed, or direct into the organ. And for I the CRISPR, you mean? Yeah. No, for the CRISPR, yes. For the ovarian, we do IP. But for what we do in the clinic is IV. So I wonder if you have discovered li good lipids for inhalation for the lungs. Because this is, could be okay, a very so we, we, great target. I think that it's not only the lipids, but it's the formulation and what you need for stability. You probably remember that there was a very good company, Translate Bio, that was doing CF, clinical trial, and was not very successful, but was bought by Sanofi for a lot of money just a few years ago. I think that their conclusion was that they didn't reach the right cells with the inhalation. I think that the formulation is one story, but you need stabilizer for nebulation and, or for other type of inhalation. Okay, so it's much more tricky. Perfect. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so and, much. Uh, for, again, for sake of time, we please reserve a question to Dr. Pierre for, for a break. So we'd like to present to you with, the, with the gift. And uh, fantastic talk. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Patrick Staten. Dr. Staten serves as the Distinguished Career Professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. And uh, after training in biology and chemistry, received a PhD in biochemistry at the University of Illinois. Uh, Dr. Staten is the founding director of the Institute of Molecular Engineering and, Science and uh, Sciences and the Center of Intracellular Delivery of Biologics at University of Washington. He has been elected as a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biomedic Biological Engineering and has been recipient of the Clemson Award from the Society for Biomaterial and the CRS Cygnus Recognition Award from the Control Release Society. The research group worked at the interface of fundamental molecular sciences and applied molecular bioengineering. His laboratory developed new material for application in a clinical needs in therapeutic, diagnostics, and regenerative medicine field. Dr. Staten has a strong interest in translating the group's research and has been awarded many patents as co-founder of three startup companies, Jewel Biotherapeutics, PhaseRx, and Nexgenia. So Dr. Staten. All right, well, thank you, Alessandro and John as well for the invitation. Uh, I've been learning a lot today. I'm uh, more on the chemistry side, and so I have to warn you about that. <laughs> uh, our lab has been interested in developing polymeric delivery systems uh, for uh, nucleic acids, including mRNA most recently. So let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, focus on mRNA, and also some uh, relatively new uh, developments where we're trying to add an element of delivery to uh, mRNA-encoded uh, cell circuits. Uh, so this would be for mRNA-engineered cells uh, to provide some new functional capabilities to such systems. 
And I'm going to start with a mechanistic overview of, of how we got into uh, the nucleic acid delivery field way back in the 1990s even. Uh, and we started kind of from the inside out uh, using the paradigm of viruses, such as the, the influenza virus shown here, in simple cartoon fashion. And we were particularly interested in this challenge of endosomal release and getting your cargo, once it was internalized, uh, to the cytosol more effectively. And of course, we've had to build out uh, pharmaceutical properties that enhance circulation time and targeting, and I'll come more to that later. One of the really cool things about biological pathogens that face this challenge is that they've evolved proteins uh, that are pH activated in the endosomal lysosomal compartments. Uh, and they undergo a transition of structure and also of activity. And so they became, become membrane destabilizing at endosomal pHs. And it's really tied to the structural transition. And so that is one of their secrets in how they uh, get cargo so efficiently out of those uh, membrane-bound compartments into the side is all where they can travel further. So if you blur your eyes a little bit, we started working with uh, polymer block compositions that used a carboxylate pH sensor. And that's very common in the biological proteins. They have a glutamic acid. And that glutamic acid's pK is shifted by a hydrophobe. In that case, it would be an amino acid, but we started working with these alkyl segment monomers. This is butyl methacrylate. You can go to longer segments, and as I'll show you, tune the pK even further. Uh, these are charge neutralized by also having uh, a partial cation that undergoes a similar transition across that biological range. In this uh, corona uh, segment, as they formulate as my cells, you can add uh, things like PEG or disulfide, a variety of different kinds of linkers for your biologic. And it turns out these undergo a similar architectural transition. So if you think it, about it at biological pH, they formulate as my cells because these are charge neutralized and there's a hydrophobicity of this segment. As you uh, acidify, however, these go in opposite directions and become unbalanced charges, and especially in the low dielectric environment of the micelle, these sharply destabilize to unimers that expose this endosomal releasing segment. And so this transition is concomitant with the same pH dependence of membrane destabilization. So we've built these out into a variety of different kind of carriers, a, a simple example, but as, as Dan mentioned, uh, these need to be carefully engineered cations. Uh, but the key part I wanna focus on again mechanistically is this endosomal releasing uh, segment here. And so we can do, uh, you know, they're not really probably true big libraries, but we can vary the composition in, in a rational way. And so, for example, if you increase across a series using the same uh, corona-forming segment, we call it a macro chain transfer agent, and polymerize then this endosomal releasing uh, segment, you can rationally, across a, a mole ratio, change that hydrophobe. These chains are built to be uh, at the same mole ratio, and they have to decrease as the BMA increases. This is taking advantage of a really big advance in polymer chemistry called the RAF polymer uh, synthetic technique that has really changed our ability over this time period to make these kinds of finely controlled uh, polymer compositions, and I, I apologize for probably not giving it enough time uh, but for this talk, I think you're more interested in their activities. So across this kind of rational series, if you... Uh, can I go back one? Sorry, I accidentally took two forward. Not sure how to do that. 
Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, so uh, as BMA is increasing across this series, you can see the induction of endosomal, not endosomal, but membrane destabilizing activity as measured in a hemolytic assay. So again, you can rationally investigate this mechanism and say, you know, what is the ideal BMA composition? In terms of membrane destabilizing activities, these are very sharply pH dependent, so they have no real membrane destabilizing activity biologically outside the cell. But once they come into the cell in that rapidly acidifying endosomal compartment, they express this very sharply and very potently. And if you looked at nucleic acid delivery, you see an increase in this case of small interfering RNA uh, ac delivery activity. So that membrane destabilizing activity across this series is highly correlated with better cytosolic delivery and activity of the RNA. So this was kind of sequential as we went from DNA to RNA and then to mRNA, but we had really looked at this mechanism in some detail and shown that the delivery is highly correlated with the fundamental properties of that polymer chemistry. And if you look at it more closely, it, it's really interesting because it's, it's very finely tunable. Um, and here we're going to 20% to 30% BMA. The transition occurs at pH 7. If you keep increasing it 40 to 50%, now you're in an in interesting endosomal pH trigger range. And you can keep going, and they uh, would be transitioning all the way down to the lysosomal uh, compartment and pH range. And so we looked and said, is, where is the optimal biologically? And initially with uh, plasmid DNA, sorry, this thing is not advancing very well. the old school way. <laughs> there wasn't like a, a, a complete increase across that series. What's interesting is that biologically, you really need to get your uh, nucleic acid out of the compartment at the right time. And so as the pH hit this optimal of around 40% BMA, you saw your maximal transfection activity in this case with uh, plasma DNA. But as you kept going, it becomes too late in the endosomal lysomal uh, evolution to uh, get out effectively. Yeah, I'm gonna do this, thank you. So uh, this is background. Um, at the, around this time, we started uh, really looking at commercializing this uh, uh, delivery platform and uh, that was done initially through Phase RX Pharmaceuticals, and this is my uh, disclosure. Uh, that's now owned by Arbutus Genovant uh, with the university, and also I'm on the uh, mRNA advisory board for Pfizer, so I need to tell you that. So uh, as we moved into mRNA, we, we took the lessons and began building these in a more sophisticated way. Um, but again, I think the key is that it worked kind of similarly. As you went across a series of that hydrophobicity, you could find optimal uh, compositions for mRNA as well. This is now done in a rapid throughput way with uh, this kind of cell biology readout. This is a, uh, a T cell activation assay, which we found to be well correlated with some of the company's interests. Uh, but the key is really this, you know, being able to tune it rationally through the chemistry. Uh, there are other ways, though, that you can use this kind of technology, and I, I'll highlight this uh, way. It, with the LMPs, you can also use these as an endosomal releasing excipient. And interestingly, it's possible to uh, go through regulatory as an excipient, um, which has some advantages. And so if these, the idea of this was we could co-deliver these 
and get more efficient endosomal release if these were co-targeted. And of course, in the liver, the LMPs go there very efficiently through a protein corona effect, a targeting effect. But this can also be targeted, uh, say, with the famous GALNAC to co-deliver to hepatocytes to increase uh, mRNA delivery. And so this has been uh, developed uh, up through um, uh, the regulatory for our initial clinical trial. And uh, the company called this the hybrid delivery uh, system, and I'll just show you a few highlights. But the basic idea is that this is uh, co-formulated with the LMPs as an excipient. They uh, are designed to co-target into hepatocytes, and the endosomal releasing activity should increase uh, the mRNA delivery and activity. And as an initial demonstration of this, uh, this is an inherited metabolic disease. Of course, many people using uh, mRNA are working in this space. And uh, so this is to show you that uh, with a reporter construct, the endosomal releasing polymer greatly enhances actually the mRNA activity. And what's interesting about it is the mRNA does go to other cells, but the, there is an additional specificity brought in by the GALNAC targeting of the uh, polymer so that you get enhanced the preferential mRNA expression in hepatocytes. So uh, here the GALNAC targeted polymer as, a, so, as opposed to the mannose or non-targeted polymer has greatly enhanced activity, showing that the targeting uh, really does uh, help you. Um, they've initially reported this in a, a ornithine transcarbamylase uh, genetically engineered mouse model that a lot of companies use. Uh, and uh, just to show you that when it's knocked out in this mouse model, this is about the level uh, that you see. Uh, if you do it in a normal mouse, of course, you get uh, up above 100%. And so they've shown that you can get very effective uh, delivery of uh, this enzyme therapy. Uh, the mRNA alone has some activity, but it really does still get trapped. There's an idea that uh, LMPs get all of the mRNA out, but that's not really the case. And especially maybe now in humans, there's emerging uh, information that, that it's even more of a, a problem uh, in some human uh, situations and cells. So the mRNA with the endosomal releasing polymer showed uh, much higher uh, activities. This is uh, with two times a week dosing, and uh, so you can see the significant extension of time. And this could keep going, but this is uh, one plot of the initial data. Uh, lastly, I'll just close with some other work in our lab that has, has been to add additional functionality to uh, mRNA uh, circuited cell therapies. And uh, our idea here was that, uh, that we could engineer in uh, a new receptor uh, and capture polymeric prodrugs that are designed either uh, for co-therapy, like a kinase inhibitor, uh, or a small molecule regulator that through a Degron pathway or some other type of gene circuit regulator could turn pathways on or off that had been engineered into the cell via mRNA uh, synthetic biology. And uh, this work has initially been done with Mike Jensen, who's one of the co-founders at Juno. So of course we were using uh, CAR T cells and also genetically engineered Max to start out with this demonstration. There's been a lot of interest in this. I'll just highlight one, Selecta Biosciences, where they've uh, uh, shown that a small molecule can be co-delivered uh, to induce immune tolerance. Uh, and so this idea, I think, is emerging of using small molecules together with cells that have been engineered in a, a compatible way for immune uh, applications, in their example, uh, for tolerance, immune tolerance. We're using a new platform for this. I won't go too much into the chemistry, but as opposed to the old uh, polymer conjugate field, we pre-synthesize uh, the building block monomers, and we, this opens up really a, a 
a much more complex set of linkers and drugs. And you're so limited by doing this kind of conjugation chemistry. Dan also alluded to that. Um, and then we can polymerize the t uh, monomers that include targeting ligands or the prodrugs. And so these are now made completely synthetically and uh, have been manufactured at scale. Just an example, simple example, uh, again, for liver targeting of these kind of regulators or small molecules, you can use the Galnac ligand that's built into a monomer, and then monomers that have a linker, design linker with the drug to control the release profile. And these target really beautifully in the lung. Uh, here we've labeled the uh, polymer in red, and you can really see every hepatocyte in large fields uh, have the polymer taken up. You can see it uh, through uh, IVIS imaging as well. But when you really get down into it, this is very effective with these kind of galnac targeted soluble polymer designs. And it, there's a, we've measured the PK of these, uh, and they, they actually deliver, say, from sub-Q injection with really good uh, uh, biodistribution and uh, drug exposures or uh, drug amounts, even compared to uh, oral delivery of these small molecules. And what's good about them especially, too, is that they uh, eliminate or, or greatly lower C-max effects of many drugs, which is a problem in the liver, uh, because of this targeting effect. And you can see that in the PK. It's, high levels of the drug where you want it, and much lower levels in the blood. With Tom Roberts, I'm just going to give you a couple quick snapshots uh, at Dana-Farber, who has really developed the PI3K kinase inhibitors to the clinic. Uh, we've been working on incorporating this type of P PI3K inhibitor just to show you that this, when you do this chemically, you really open up the sophistication of what kinds of drugs you can incorporate and build these highly functionalized polymers. Now, we also include a ligand, and Mike Jensen's lab engineered an SCFV receptor uh, against this small molecule that has 10 to the 10th uh, per molar affinity. And it gives us a way then to assemble these types of prodrug molecule, polymeric uh, molecules onto the cells in a bioorthogonal way. So it doesn't rely on endogenous receptors. It's actually an encoded receptor that can be built to be very high affinity. And in this case, they also are engineering the cells to produce checkpoint inhibitors so that you can get the benefit of the kinase inhibitor co-therapy with the uh, checkpoint antibody. We've also uh, worked at, uh, with Mike on CAR T cells that are synthetically encoding uh, protein therapeutics, but in a controlled uh, cassette. And here we've built in this uh, regulator, uh, CMP8. It's a Degron uh, uh, controlling small molecule and shown that we can assemble these very efficiently through this bioorthogonal uh, lock and dock, Mike calls it, <laughs> of the polymer on, and you can see the shift of the uh, fluorescently labeled polymer. It works really beautifully. Uh, and then the release of CMP8 gives you a very nice controlled mechanism for the timing of release. And when the drug is exhausted, then that turns off, and so it also provides an off switch uh, for these kind of circuits. So I think there's a lot of new opportunities here for uh, the, the synthetic bio has, you know, been going so fast, but this regulation piece is an important one, either for ex vivo uh, control during manufacturing or to deliver small molecules to uh, cells that have been endogenously administered. It provides a way of assembling the regulator with the cells that have been uh, put, the engineered cells that have been uh, administered uh, in vivo. So uh, I think a lot of collaborators. I wanted to highlight Mike and his group, especially at Seattle Children's uh, and our funding agency, and I'd be glad to answer any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Staten. Um, do we have any question from the public? Otherwise, I have one question for you. So, uh, your extensive work in the endosomial escape is fantastic because a lot of people know about a lot of biological barrier, but then they don't think about the endosomal escape. So my question is, is there some type of toxicity that is linked to the fact that we give a lot of things to the cells that then they have to pop up the endosomal in order to, to let our drug to work? So is the toxicity that we see in vivo is linked to the, only to the endosomal escape or there is a percentage that is, that is due to the endosomal escape? There is, um, so the answer is yes. Um, I can't give you a percentage, but it's one of the reasons why uh, we also wanted to develop this kind of smaller libraries uh, where that activity is, is varying. And uh, so there is no doubt that if you're too potent at endosomal release and membrane destabilization is the mechanism in this case, that there is a concern of toxicity. That's very dependent on concentration delivered and you know, in real life we're oftentimes with the opposite problem that most, 90, over 99% of our carriers, LMPs for example, don't really show up where they're supposed to. That's why these efforts to target them are so important. But uh, it, so in real life, it's maybe not the biggest problem. You have to be quite potent to get the small number of drug molecules, say the mRNA, to the cytosol where you want them. That's a bigger challenge in my opinion. Sure. Do we have any other question? Otherwise, we give him uh, the prize, <laughs> the famous <laughs> prize. But we're going to talk uh, later on in the panel for sure because we are running a little bit late for the next part. Thank you, Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Bianca Godin, and I'm going to chair the next uh, fun session. These are the Bliss presentations that uh, were chosen uh, from the submitted works. Um, I would really ask the speakers, because they are very short presentation, the two-minute presentation, to line up here on the, for me, right side of the room, if you don't mind, so we don't spend time on that. And uh, Christina, the, the, the slides will appear, right, Christina Herrera? I guess the slides will, okay. So. Our first speaker for this session is Yareli Carcamo Bahena from the Department of Nanomedicine, and she is going to talk about a spectroscopy based non enzymatic method to detect cholesterol for early familial hypercholesterolemia screening. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, or almost afternoon. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about a method that we've developed for early screening for hypercholesterolemia. Hyper, a familial hypercholesteremia is a genetic disorder that's characterized by elevated uh, low density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol, and it affects, 100, it affects 1 in 250 individuals, and um, typically of these individuals, only 10% of them get diagnosed at birth, and if the, and, um, early intervention is required in order to mitigate, this, um, mitigate, mitigate the effects of FH. Um, this is because medical intervention is required. So. Um, the, earlier the, the, the earlier the intervention, the better the outcome for these individuals, despite any sort of lifestyle modifications. What we're doing is, is to address the, the issue of early diagnosis um, by combining two highly specific, um, in terms of chemistry, highly specific um, analytical methods, which are thin layer chromatography and Raman spectroscopy. So we begin with cholesterol, of course, which is in, shown in figure A. Um, and then we're also using diolioleal phosphatidylcholine DOPC, which is a type of phospholipid. So DOPC, when it is in solution, it can form either SUVs or MLVs in water. Um, and we can also load these with cholesterol. Um, in brief, thin layer chromatography separates, uh, which is shown in D, separates compounds based on polarity. So briefly, they are spotted onto a TLC plate, which is polar. Um, and this is the stationary phase, and then it's allowed to develop in the mobile phase, and we are able to see the spot. 
Raman spectroscopy um, is used to determine the different vibrational modes of the analyte of interest. In this case, we are doing cholesterol and DOPC. Um, so A through E show different types of um, plates that we've developed in our lab, which are essentially made of cholesterol and DOPC. F through H show um, different sizes of the particle diameter, so we use dynamic light scattering to obtain these. Um, as you can see, the S2Vs, which are shown in blue, are a, are a lot smaller than the empty MLVs and the cholesterol-loaded MLVs. I through K show different uh, Raman spectra, and the um, I showed, um, I shows the uh, lipid vesicle, which is made of DOPC in solution, and we see a um, characteristic peak at around 720, which is indicative of the polar head stretching. Uh, J and K show cholesterol powder spectra, as well as um, the, the cholesterol shown in figure B, and that has um, symmetric stretch, I'm sorry, uh, steroid ring stretching at around 700 uh, inverse centimeters. Um, L, M, and N are actually done when we move the Raman probe up across the length of the plate, and we are able to see increases in signal intensity that correspond um, to the spot of DOPC relative to the origin. For example, we have some symmetric um, stretching of NCH3, which is found in the polar head group, and as well as CH2 bending and, and C carbon-carbon um, double bond stretching, which are from the tails. Um, in short, we hope to apply this method um, to more complex biological samples as well as uh, expand this combination of analytical methods. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Yoreli. Okay, now our next speaker is Ramiro Villarreal Liel from the Nanomedicine Department, uh, Dr. Bretoni and uh, Bruno Cordetti as well. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ramiro Villarreal, and I work uh, in the development of mRNA-enhanced collagen membranes for fibroblast trans differentiation to endothelial cells. And uh, essentially, we're working on the development of collagen membranes for treating chronic wounds, which can be uh, sub-implantable or used as collagen membranes to be suturable. And to do this, we essentially work with collagen as the substrate for our membranes. And we functionalize them with mRNA lipid nanoparticles that encapsulate four different mRNA sequences that drive the transdifferentiation of fibroblasts towards endothelial cells. And with this, we would enhance in situ vascularization and thus expediting the wound healing process. So our results so far indicate that the lipid nanoparticles that we produce uh, using standard formulations are nanoscopic in size, have negative surface charges, and are efficient mRNA carriers that protect the mRNA that they encapsulate. When used to treat fibroblasts at 24 hours, we see that the particles are internalized and that the expression of the mRNA cargo is uh, even uh, higher than that using of conventional transfection methods such as lipofectamine. And then when looking at the transcription, at the number of copies of the mRNA present at cells at 24 hours, we see also an increase. And this is also true for the expression of endothelial cell surface markers uh, in fibroblasts after 24 hours. And then uh, to specifically target our particles into our collagen membranes, we're devising a strategy by which we use uh, annexin 5, which is a protein that binds specifically to uh, the lipid phosphatidylserine that then we in introduce into our formulation of lipid nanoparticles. And our results so far indicate that we can successfully uh, functionalize the membranes with an exin-5, and when using phosphatidylserine to create our lipid nanoparticles, we see that these particles have very similar physical chemical characteristics, such as the particles that are presented earlier with the standard formulation, but to our surprise and much to our advantage, they seem to be better, better mRNA carriers that are delivered to cells compared to the standard formulations. And with these results, we are one step closer to developing uh, uh, successful mRNA-based therapeutics to treat chronic wounds, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ramiro. Uh, our next speaker for today is uh, Junda Kim from the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration, and he'll be talking about um, AIPBP is, is required for embryonic lympho lymphangiogenesis.
Hello, yeah. I am Jun Dae Kim from Tax Pengs Lab in Cardiovascular Science. Yeah, I am here to yeah, to introduce some yeah, function of A1 BP, BP in lymphangiogenesis. In in nature, yeah, cavalian one can yeah, block the, for example, receptor three dimerizations so on, on the membrane in lymphatic endothelial cells. Yeah, so we found that A1 BP and the HDL complex can fold out the cholesterol on the membrane in the lymphatic endothelial cell. That allowed to make the receptor receptor three dimerization and then. Yeah, can make in the signal transactions in in the inhibition of the A1BP A1BP more cavalian one can block the VJ receptors sorry dimerization. So actually, in the our Gibra PC endothelial A1BP knockout cells, there are more yeah, cavalian structure in the graph. Also, we made the Gibra PC A1BP Nagao models. They don't have the lymphatic yeah, vessel structure on the, in the development on the graph, in the graph in the below. Yeah. Also, we, we um, tested the pathogenic lymphoangiogenesis with, uh, in the, for example, using the mouse cornea pathogenic lymphoangiogenesis models. We, when we added the A1BP, with the VZFC, there are more pathogenic angiogenesis in the mouse cornea. So we think it is very clear that AONBP has some functions in the developmental and the pathogenic lymphoangiogenesis in the GBRAPC and the mouse models. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jinda. Uh, our next speaker for today is Amberly Royal, and she's going to speak uh, about encapsulation of NARP therapeutics in a bioengineered scaffold to increase retention in the myocardium. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Last year, I was able to share my team's findings over the photo photothermal heating properties of gold nanoshells and their ability to serve as a photothermal heating agent in cardiac tissue. Um, one of the biggest issues we faced when moving into an uh, ex vivo model was um, localizing the nanoshells retention in their region of interest. So we created this bioengineered um, scaffold that would allow us to encapsulate our nanoshells and de deliver them directly into our region of interest in the cardiac tissue. Since gold is inherently radio-opaque, we exploited that property to monitor and visualize the um, scaffold within cardiac tissue using CT imaging, as well as quantify the volume of the scaffold and the attenuation. So we injected either one mil or two mils of our, our bioengineered scaffold with the gold nanoshells into porcine cardiac tissue and used 3D slicer to create 3D reconstructions um, as seen here on the left side of the screen. Um, the scaffold containing the nanoshells is depicted here in green. So we used slicer, as I stated before, to quantify the volume over the course of an hour, which is how long our imaging session was, where we scanned um, every 10 minutes. Um, you can see here in figure G with the two mil injected volume denoted in red and the one mil shown here in black that regardless of the volume injected, the volume of the scaffold remains stable to over time. This was also seen with the attenuation of the scaffold as well shown here in figure H. Um, as, in, as, in, uh, sorry, as expected, there was a significant increase in the scaffold volume in the porcine cardiac tissue um, when the initial injection volume increased from one mil to two mil, um, and the attenuation also was seen significantly increased as well as shown here in figure H. Um, so just to recap everything we went over, we created this bioengineered scaffold that was able to encapsulate these gold nanoshells and deliver them directly into our region of interest in the heart. And they were able to maintain their position, attenuation, and volume over the course of an hour. This has many applications when it comes to cardiovascular nanomedicine and the treatment of cardiovascular diseases, since now you can localize nanotherapeutics in your direct region of interest. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Amber. And our next speaker for today is Madeline Franke from the NMED program, and she's going to talk about development of novel lipid nanoparticle drug delivery system for antisense oligonucleotide treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Hi, my name is Madeline Frank, and I'm a third year medical student here and a researcher in Dr. Terraboli's lab. And I'm here to quickly talk to you about lipid nanoparticles for use in heart failure treatment. 
And so as you may know, heart failure, there's two main types. There's heart failure where your heart can't contract and heart failure where your heart muscle gets really stiff and thick um, and has trouble filling. And um, so this second type of heart failure actually has um, it's less common, but it also has widely fewer treatment options, um, and especially no treatment options that affect mortality. Um, and so really what we're doing here is we're getting a lipid nanoparticle and we're embedding it with cargo that can silence a gene of interest. Um, and this gene of interest is RBM20, which is a titan splicing factor that has been known and researched to affect cardiomyopathy and this type of heart failure. Um, and so we're kind of using that combo of the lipid nanoparticle and then this splicing factor to silence it and therefore hopefully modulate um, downstream protein expression and therefore affect and alter disease progression. And so you can see the approach we have outlined below. Really this main phase um, part of this project was to establish feasibility and then also stability of the nanoparticles um, as a carrier. And so that's what you can see here. We looked at the size, the PDI, um, zeta potential, and encapsulation efficiency just to see if this was a feasible um, method to be able to carry um, this ASO. Um, and so as you can see, they were stable over time, so we're happy with the formulation. Um, and then next steps include um, embedding the ASO and then doing further testing. And then also um, a great um, thing that we've been talking this morning is just about how to get these nanoparticles to the um, heart and then staying at the heart because you don't want them to be washed out systemically or just accumulate in the liver. And so it's really exciting because that's a huge problem in this project. Um, and so it's exciting that we were talking about how we can target these to the heart. Um, and um, so just very exciting because it really makes uh, solutions like this possible. That's it. Thank you very much, Madeline. Our next lead speaker is Elizabeth Eversall, and she's uh, from the Department of Nanomedicine, and she's going to talk about comp comparing the phototermal efficiencies of nanorods with nanoshells. Thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to talk to you all today about just two of the many different kinds of gold nanoparticles. Um, so my lab was specifically interested in comparing both gold nano rods with nano shells. Um, figures A and B show uh, sample UV vis spectra of the gold nano rods in figure A. As you can see, they are cylindrical metallic nanoparticles that have both a longitudinal and transverse axis. Um, the nano rods have a pretty sharp peak around 808 nanometers and a much smaller peak around 500 nanometers, whereas the gold nano shells are spheric metallic, spherical metallic nanoparticles that have both an outer diameter and an inner diameter. And these exhibit a very broad peak around, absorbance peak around 800 nanometers. We then wanted to compare the photothermal capabilities of both of these nanoparticles by using a Set up similar to the schematic shown in figure C, we used a collimated diode laser set to 808 nanometers, um, and we varied the power um, between 4 and 5.5 watts. We used a forward-looking infrared camera to monitor the temperature change over time and transmission electron microscopy to image the particles. Um, as seen in the results page here, um, figure A shows the absorbance spectra of the gold nano shells um, at seven different concentrations. And that same, those same concentrations we used for the nano rods shown in figure B. Um, and figure C sums up that at every single concentration, the nano rods had higher absorbance values than the nano shells, um, just indicating their finer tunability and specificity. And figure D, um, for our photothermal portion of this experiment, the nano rods shown in blue were able to achieve temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius quicker than the nano shells at 5 watts shown in figure D and also 5.5 watts shown in figure E. And finally, figure F just sums up that again, at every single um, power, the nano rods were able to achieve necrosing temperatures at 50 degrees Celsius faster than the nano shells. Our lab is further investigating these photothermal properties for use of photothermal ablation to treat cardiac arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak here today. Thank you very much, Liz. So our next talk for today is uh, Rachel Kaiser 
from RNA Therapeutics, and uh, she's going to speak about evaluating the role of cytoplasmatic capping in the post-transcriptional regulation of no long non-coding RNAs. Good morning. So, what is cytoplasmic capping? Until recently, decapping or loss of the N7G cap um, was thought to irreversibly destine an RNA to degradation. However, transcriptome-wide studies have revealed a pool of uncapped yet stable mRNAs. The cytoplasmic capping complex is able to recap or return a cap onto the five prime end like you see in this process shown here. Um, until now, only mRNAs have been assayed. However, we're gonna start targeting uh, long non-coding RNAs and that is what this research is about. Um, decapped RNAs usually have a five prime monophosphate and at the f just like the first transcript shown here, and this is what we use to target in a technique called five prime race. Five prime race essentially adds an adapter sequence onto the five prime end, that five prime monophosphate end, and um, we'll use this to capture that sequence, amplify it with PCR, and eventually sequence it. Once sequenced, the five prime N that's captured will be compared to cage data or cap analysis of gene expression. This technique was developed to um, identify where transcription start sites are located, essentially where the caps are. However, there's about 25% of these um, cage tags are not actually transcription start sites. Here we show an example of one of our five prime raise captured products, GAS5002, and I've zoomed in to show the cage tag counts near the five prime end of this transcript. It was captured from cells that cytoplasmic capping was actually blocked, so this means that any transcript that would have theoretically been recapped by this complex was not able to do so because the enzyme was inhibited. For GAS5002, the 5 prime end actually is the annotated transcription start site, which is very strange that we captured it in the uncapped form, because you would think theoretically it should be in a naturally capped form. But this could also be suggestive of a process called cap homeostasis, essentially the wax on, wax off of capping. So our main takeaways are that using CAGE, Others have detected M7G caps at the five prime ends of captured link RNAs, and also uncapped link RNAs increase when cyto cytoplasmic capping is blocked. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And our next speaker for today is Elvin Blanco from Nanomedicine Department. Uh, the title of his talk is Mitochondrial Replenishment in Plaque Macrophages for the Treatment of Atherosclerosis. Thank you. Good afternoon. Feels good to be back. Um, this is the continuation of uh, some more previously funded uh, Costas work uh, involving mitochondrial transplantation for uh, uh, several cardiovascular diseases. Um, it's mainly the work of, uh, of Dr. Hao Ran Liu in the lab. Um, and so it involves a uh, delivery of mitochondria to plaque macrophages in atherosclerosis. Um, again, so macrophage phenotype uh, plays an important role in disease uh, progression in cancer, fibrosis, uh, atherosclerosis as well. Uh, in atherosclerotic plaques, uh, the predominant phenotype is the M1, or classically activated uh, macrophage phenotype. And so this phenotype is, is tasked with kind of sustaining an inflammatory uh, microenvironment in the plaque and leads to, uh, again, to this, this um, ever expanding and, and, and progressing a, a plaque in, in, in these lesions. Um, the M1 phenotype in macrophages is mainly associated with a glycolytic phenotype. And so there's increased glycolysis, which in turn leads to increased secretion of, uh, of inflammatory cytokines. Um, what Haran did actually was she, she was able to isolate mitochondria from, um, from mice, from mice livers, Functionalize them with a, uh, a polymer coating, kind of essentially making them a, a, a nanoparticle, and deliver them to uh, to these M1 macrophages. And what you observed was a um, a decrease in, in glycolytic flux, which you can see uh, up on the top or, uh, top top right. And uh, as a result of also as a result of the mitochondrial replenishment in macrophages, she saw a decrease in uh, cytokine secretion TNF alpha IL6 as well. Um, in vivo, uh, so the schematic basically uh, shows our, our approach. So these 
uh, isolated mitochondria were intravenously injected into um, APOE uh, mutant mice uh, that have atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic lesions along the aorta. And um, Haran was actually able to see accumulation of the mitochondria uh, in, these, uh, in these plaque regions. Um, she was actually able to co-localize the signal of the mitochondria with the macrophages in the plaque and after treatment, she was actually able to see a, a reduction in the, in the plaque uh, area. An interesting finding that came out of this was um, when Alran took out the livers um, and she looked at diseased and healthy and treated, um, just for the purposes of looking to see if there was any toxicity of the, of the mitochondria, what she found was that the treated livers were actually more, were very similar to healthy livers. And the uh, disease livers undergo what's called a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFL, and NASH, uh, steatohepatitis, all sorts of inflammation. Um, but these mitochondria apparently um, had effects on the, the liver of these atherosclerotic mice and did away with uh, the steatosis and, and, and a lot of the inflammation that you, that you would see in these mice. Um, so again, there's not only kind of a local effect of, of the delivery, but there's also potentially some sort of systemic effect that's happening when you deliver these mitochondria that can very well extend to, uh, to the atherosclerosis and, and maybe possibly other diseases as well. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alvin. Our next speaker for today is uh, David Chang from the Center of Cardiovascular Regeneration. And the title of his talk is Telomeras RNA Non-Therapeutics Enhances Engraftment of Human Skin Cell Suspension in Mouse Wound Model. Good morning. My name is David Chang. Our team of scientists consists of Rana Hoge, Karen Court, uh, Bianna Golding, Betsy Davis, Dr. Cook, and I. This is an industry-sponsored research project from Abita Medical, and our work aims to improve human skin cell engraftment on wound using RNA nanotherapy. Now, older individual has greater difficulty in wound repair and burn healing because senescent skin cells have impaired function and replicative capacity, partly due to telomere erosion. Previously, our lab has shown that in aged somatic cells, telomere erosion can be repaired and cell function restored by transient transfection with human telomerous RNA. This picture shows a very nice epithelialization of the human skin cells treated with telomerous RNA on a mouse wound model that we generated. We began by optimizing lipid nanoparticle formulation for the delivery of mRNA. We found that RNA complex with the cationic lipoplex, DOTAP, provide best cellular uptake, gene expression, and cell viability in fibroblasts and keratinocyte cell lines, as well as primary skin cells isolated isolated from patient donors. We demonstrated that human telomerous nanotherapeutic enhanced telomerous activity in human skin cell suspension in as short as one hour post-treatment and in a dose-dependent fashion. We developed and established a mouse wound model to study skin cell engraftment. This aggregated skin cells from human donor consist mostly of keratinocytes and fibroblasts were treated with HTERT mRNA and implanted on the back of immunocompromised mice. The wounded area uh, is extracted and um, uh, a week later for histological molecular analysis. We conclude that optimized telomerous RNA delivery in human skin cells, increased telomerous activity, enhanced skin cell engraftment and proliferation, decreased cellular senescence, and reduced DNA damage. Potential nanotherapeutic, including skin rejuvenation and radiation-induced skin injury and vascular defect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And now our last but not least uh, speaker for today is uh, for this uh, session is Elisa Morales from Cardiovascular Regeneration Center. And uh, the title of her talk is Systemic Administration of Telomerase mRNA Loaded Lipid Nanoparticles as a Potential Treatment for Progeria Mice. Thank you, Dr. Glein. My name is Elisa and I work with Dr. Cook Lab. And um, today I'm going to be talking about the systemic administration of telomerase mRNA loaded lipid nanoparticles as a potential uh, treatment for progeria mice. We have previously shown, as Dr. Cook mentioned in our previous COSAS meeting, that the delivery of telomerase into the mouse model reverses senescence and also extends the life of the mice. 
So having this in mind, we, we wanted to develop a lipid nanoparticle therapy now that we had this COVID and, we sh and it was shown that it was safe. Uh, we wanted to develop the therapy using uh, lipid nanoparticles loaded with m uh, mRNA for mTERT mRNA, and this will improve this, the symptoms of this AGPS mice, also uh, rescue endothelial cell function, morphology, and just overall life extension of the mice. So with this, we propose, we, we start working on this. As I mentioned, this is an ongoing research that we're doing. So we have three different mouse uh, groups. We have wild type M, uh, the, uh, receiving empty LMPs. We have our progeria mice receiving empty LMPs and our progeria mice receiving the m LMPs. So we are delivering the LMPs uh, via intravenous or intraperitoneal and we are doing it like every month for six months. Then we, we harvest the organs, we collect the blood and then we do the analysis uh, of, of the serum and also pathology that we see on the organs. Here on the left, uh, you can see there's the lipid nanoparticles components, and we did a physical chemistry uh, characterization of these lipid nanoparticles, showing that they are stable up to 28 days after. Then we wanted to know where these lipid nanoparticles are going. So after eight hours post-administration, uh, we noticed that they were going through the liver, then they go to the spleen, and then we can see that it's going to the lungs. Then now that we know where they're going, what is happening to the organs? So we check, um, because of the time, I'm just gonna choke on the liver. So on the liver, we check uh, uh, using AST and Simon the ALT. We wanted to find the optimal uh, dose to use. So we decided to go by two milligrams per kilogram, which it was uh, no significant difference with our PBS control. We also tried four, six, and eight, and it seemed that was the most optimal one. Then uh, we continue, so we follow the plan that we had. We administer the lipid nanoparticles, we collect the tissue, and we send for pathology. And as I mentioned, I'm showing here just the liver, but we noticed that there was toxicity. We saw congestion on the, on the liver, inflammation, and also small blood vessel necrosis on our group that they were receiving LMPs with uh, mTERD RNA. So, we also check other inflammation markers just to confirm this data, and we saw uh, MCP1 uh, expression, gene expression increase as on our group for uh, mTERD LMPs, and also we checked the lung, and we also were seeing the same. We also checked for uh, an inhibitor for the NF-kappa B uh, pathway, and we saw the same results. So we think that the combination of the LMPs along with the RNA is causing this toxicity, and we, for the future directions, we are collaborating with Nanovation, so then we can develop a better uh, lipid nanoparticles that uh, has been said that is not going to the liver, and also that will help us to have better, toxic uh, better tox uh, less toxicity on the liver, and we can decrease the number of doses, and also having a circular mRNA because it's more stable that means that it can stay longer in the animal and we don't have to deliver every month. So that will also help us to prevent this toxicity that we're seeing. And just this will help for the frequency and dosage for the LMPs. So thank you, and I wanna thank you Dr. Kuklav and Dr. Taravalli for helping us with this project. Thank you, Lisa. Well, that was our lightning blitz presentations, and uh, the judges are going to huddle and decide uh, about the winners. We're going to announce the winners uh, of the blitz presentations and the Shark Tank uh, later this afternoon, and the winners of the uh, Costas Grant Awards. Uh, that happens at 4.30 today. Um, now, this afternoon uh, is going to be uh, entirely um, virtual. You can stay here. We, ha we have lunch outside. You can stay here and have lunch and watch the show. It's going to be up on the screen. Uh, or you can go back to your office. Um, I'm going to take the judges, uh, or rather the um, speakers, from earlier today um, to the DeBakey studio, where we're going to have the panel discussion. We're going to have the panel discussion in the DeBakey studio. You guys can watch that uh, online. You can watch it here. You can watch it in your office. We're going to have the, um, some uh, presentations, uh, the strategic impact project presentations. We're going to have the shark tank. And uh, then after that, we'll have the awards announcement. So we have a full afternoon, um, but it'll be virtual. Again, you can have lunch and watch it here, or you can go to your office and uh, uh, stay tuned. It's going to be a fun show in the afternoon. Thank you so much for coming this morning.
Welcome back to our uh, new part of uh, this um, uh, panel that uh, we're going to do in the broadcast. All the, all the part of the conference today uh, from now on is going to be all on the broadcast. And we are here with uh, our speakers to uh, discuss a little bit in a, in a more uh, question answer manner about what is a real new frontier of RNA uh, nanotherapeutics. So I will, uh, I, will, I will be humble to do the question to them. For example, the, the first question that I was thinking is that what are the steps that actually brought us today to speak about the RNA uh, nanotherapeutics? And whoever wants to start, I don't know, if you, if you want to start, Lior? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think that the, the technology that made the most uh, difference uh, for me was really the discovery of Carrico and Wiseman with uh, mRNA, of the modified mRNA. I think when you compare other companies that haven't used this technology with companies that have, you see a huge difference in the ability to do therapeutics. And I'm not talking just about vaccines, because if you want to go and start treating uh, diseases, you need to have something that don't have any innate immune response. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the, the change that they have, they have shown, because mRNA was being used for, for many years, as uh, Dr. Cook presented, but the, the key was that they are immunogenic, and they can elicit an uh, immune response that would lead to apoptosis. And they asked the fundamental question, why? Why mRNA is immunogenic? And they, they, in a series of experiments, they showed that uridine is the part that's been recognized by toll like receptor 7 and 8 and elicit the immune response that lead to apoptosis. And in our body, we have over 30 types of uridine, so they have tried others. And they discovered that uh, one of them, pseudouridine, and do not elicit an immune response. In addition to, to that, pseudouridine also prevent the recognition of RNAs and prevent a, and induce more translation, making it an ideal tool to use for, for gene therapy. Mm -hmm. I think this discovery, and, and, and I'm taking it very much to, to COVID vaccines, the only, uh, or uh, mRNA vaccine that we have, and the first two that was been used highly over the world are modified mRNA. This is not mRNA vaccine, this is modified mRNA vaccine. And I think it's open, it gives legitimacy for, for this technology. I remember the days, and, and probably then as well, before that we used that, uh, we came to talks, and people said, this is a niche, this will never get to the clinic. Even when COVID started, the people didn't believe that mRNA could do so well in a, in a, with an injection. And there are other M mRNA with uridine, uh, self-replicate uh, uh, mRNA that been used, but none of them reach so fast and so successful to the clinic. And I think that's opened for us the field. I think pre-COVID and post-COVID, it's two different kind of approaches regarding uh, mRNA therapeutic and the nanoparticle work. Mm. So it's going to be very interesting, and I think that's the major breakthrough, the discovery of Carrico and Wiseman of the modified mRNA for me. Probably somebody has yeah. something to add, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that, I think it's one of them. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a process by which, you know, the field of RNA has changed, but even before that, look at siRNAs that was modified before, not with pseudouridine, sometimes with. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a process. So you have the RNA, which is one compound, and you have the delivery system, which is mm -hmm. another compound. I think that in time, both made dramatic changes, mm -hmm. and I'm Absolutely sure that, you know, what happened in the, in the COVID changed our life. We know that around 15 billion doses 
have been already done in two years, which is remarkable from an mRNA standpoint. So I'm not diminishing anything uh, from Kati Carico or Drew Weissman discovery. Mm -hmm. But I think that it took a few years, and I think the field became mature, both with their discovery and experiments, as well as others in the field, mm -hmm. bo basically modifying the RNA. On the other hand, the delivery mm -hmm. systems also changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that what started, if we look at the lipid area, what started as liposomes over the years, mm -hmm. from a physical chemical properties that the community of you know, lipid experts have been studying for maybe 45 years, even more, prior to COVID, all those basic understanding, structural understanding, biological experiments, everything matured into something that could serve us at the end in the crisis of COVID. But I think that it happened in parallel. In parallel, RNA became not only a research tool, mm -hmm. but have been shown could be used for vaccines and therapeutics. Probably we are all very happy with the results of the vaccines and we are probably less happy <clears throat> from therapeutics. And this is probably one of your next questions. Yeah. <laughs> but I still think that in parallel, people that are delivery people made substantial contribution to the field and it ended up together, matured the field together and help us in this, you know, very unique one-time event that we hope will not, uh, you know, repeat itself. Repeat itself. Yeah. Absolutely. What about your field instead? In, well, in the, especially what, uh, for, for your work that is nanotherapeutics, what he was saying, mm -hmm. so we are not there yet. Right, but there is a lot of pipeline and a lot of envision, and yeah. why everything is arrived right now. Mm -hmm. So why the, as he said, the field is mature right now to provide at least this attempt. Right. So I, I wanna I wanna piggyback mm -hmm. on what they just said and maybe add a little bit of a philosophical spin to to the whole thing, which is really in in my opinion really the kind of the game changer unfortunately was what happened with COVID. I remember pre-COVID, Moderna was, was already around uh, and many mm -hmm. other companies and everybody was still kind of arguing, well, but what are they going to do? The mRNA, you know, maybe it's not safe, it's cytotoxic. So the, the, the people were talking about it, the technology was in a way already existing, but there was a lot of resilience and a lot of resistance in, uh, you know, in using this. And then we realized right away that uh, this is unprecedented. You know, the ability to generate billions of doses with uh, specific sequences, with now even mutated sequences, this is uh, absolutely unprecedented. And so what I'm trying to say here is that we suddenly became aware of the power of the RNA technology. And that's, I think that this is really what enabled, you know, the whole field to, to just explode. And now, Paradoxically, this is helping other uh, entities, other companies that are maybe developing something which is, you know, next generation. Because the hard work has already been done. The public is aware, the public sees, uh, you know, the, 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 the potential of this technology. And now we are mentally ready to say, okay, this is really the future. So I think that this is really um, what has, has changed the whole, the whole field. In addition to other uh, you know, intrinsic features, I think, of the mRNAs that are going to make, in my opinion, uh, the whole uh, implementation so cheap, so cost effective, that it's going to really democratize, in a way, uh, drug development, drug discovery, which is, which is amazing. I mean, this means that we, we can generate drugs for endless number of people and, and make it affordable. This is a game changer. Sure. And... Uh... What I, what I was thinking that democratize is always uh, a good thing, but sometimes we, as they say before, we need to understand the multiple entities that there are in these nanotherapeutics, that we have the drug delivery system and we have the mRNA. 
And somehow there was like in the field, there was this discrepancy that whoever do mRNA doesn't know too much about uh, drug delivery. But who does drug <coughs> delivery doesn't know much about, about the cargo, the genetic cargo. Uh, this is uh, completely doesn't make any sense speaking about what you do because you had to be an expert of both of them. So how can you comment the complexity of all the nano, uh, uh, nanotherapy approach, the fact that you have to knowledge different, ki uh, uh, different kind of backgrounds. Well, I, I like the word Dan used, which was community. I, I think I use the word tribe sometimes with my students. <laughs> Our tribe has been working so hard on so many different elements, and it, it, something we should be so proud of that we came together and talked with each other enough that we could deliver on such an incredible challenge in such a short time. And so for me, it's easy to look back and see even more connections to the past. If you look at the pegylated lipid, for example, mm -hmm. so much work with PEG in the past unrelated to RNA. Pegylated proteins came around as therapeutics, but the knowledge from that somehow gets transferred when we all talk and built into the lipid system. The idea of responsiveness, pH responsiveness, and tying that to lipids that were formulated stable, but also then could respond and help with cytosolic delivery, intracellular delivery. These are concepts that actually many people contributed to over so many years, and I think as we move forward now, we have made this hurdle in investors' mindsets and the mindsets of the public with safety. And we really are on a precipice now of realizing so much more if our tribe just keeps working and talking more like in venues like this between chemists, biologists, we need people manufacturing, you know, because they're going to be a little different. Circular RNA is quite a different challenge that manufacturing wise. And so let's stay as a tribe and see what's possible. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, I think also that uh, uh, a lot of revolution that we saw during the uh, in the medical history uh, went after a crisis. Uh, if we remember what happened to the clinical practice and the in introduction of biomaterials in, surger in surgery, it went after the Second World War, in which they had an urgency and an emergency. So everybody uh, went together and pushed a lot. And some of those materials we are still having right now in the medical, uh, in the clinical practice. So I believe that uh, Somehow, for how bad was COVID, it was the moment of crisis that helped the overall field to push a little bit everything together and also overcome some limitation. But apart this uh, discussion, what I was saying that uh, the complexity of delivery RNA, it doesn't have to be underestimated. That I believe that is a message that we have to send is true. That is, seems easy when you speak about this kind of people that do for living this, this job for everything. But a lot of uh, times I, I said minimizing that now we can do everything with RNA. It's true, but it's not true. So what, uh, what do you think there are the new limitation or what you envision the uh, limitation in the future to the, or what are the most challenging application of RNA nanotherapeutics? So for me, uh, I think we, we spoke about it and, and my talk was around it, is the cell specificity. I think uh, specificity is the game. You need to understand that uh, some of this delivery will be detrimental, mm -hmm. and uh, it was especially if it goes to other organ. We mentioned uh, several study, <coughs> and John mentioned mm -hmm. uh, a, a paper about uh, CAR T cells uh, that uh, can, can attack fibrosis. But a lot of this mRNA actually went to the liver and to other organs, and having uh, detrimental genes in other organs is a problem. You need to know how to target it, how to get it to the cell type, and that will be the next generation that I think for mRNA therapeutic. What we, we see now is really the most first step, but it has a lot of, of problems. This is one of the 
the stability of the mRNA is another issue that uh, Dan spoke about it in his talk. It's very important work to make it uh, used in a in a normal uh, way that you don't have to have an ultra cold uh, storage of the mRNA. This is uh, very problematic, and and the uh, uh, the fear that was every time that the vaccine were has to be thaw and then injected, and if not, they were throwing it, which I think was uh, in a bit unnecessary. We have uh, checked and we saw the stability still stay for, for some time. Yeah. It didn't need su such a craziness around those uh, vaccines. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so I think better nanoparticle, better lipids, together with uh, more targeted mRNA. That's the, the future and that's the, the, the challenge that we face now in the preclinical, hope, hoping to go to the, to the clinical in the future. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that you need to define it or, or maybe to divide it into immediate challenges and future challenges. I think the immediate challenges are to improve for example, vaccines right now, storage issues, thermal stability is super important. There are countries that cannot get vaccines because of this, low and middle income uh, uh, countries. And, and that opens up also new pathogens, yeah. and new versions, new uh, derivatives of uh, viruses, etc. That's one point. Another thing, and, and I, I've talked about this, but I think we have very, very interesting solution that looks very promising, at least for one part of it. The second part that is also an immediate issue, I think, is uh, specificity. So I agree that cell specificity is, and going beyond the liver, is something we need to do immediately. And there are tools already to do it. I think companies right now start to realize that, you know, liver is a very important organ <laughs> and people had capitalized on the liver because they didn't have any other means. But right now there are new means that needs to be explored and can be used outside of the liver, maybe for particular types of indication, but it's, again, it's something that should be done and should be done immediately and it's already been done actually at least at the preclinical and also uh, in the translational phase uh, and i see those as an, another issue which is an immediate issue is large payloads mm -hmm. one of the things that viruses cannot uptake is very large genes or combination of genes together and we and others have shown that actually you can package a lot, like 17.5 kilobase mm -hmm. in wow. lipid nanoparticles. You can package a few mRNAs in one uh, particle, a few large mRNA as well. This opens up a completely new area, especially for rare genetic diseases, that you need to deliver them. Mm -hmm. And one last point for the immediate issues are, at least on, in my opinion, is the expression level. So expression level with mRNA is still an issue. So how can we make it longer? Or if, maybe we need other, maybe circular RNA is the option, I don't know. But I think that this is an immediate issue that the community or the tribe, as you mentioned, <laughs> should talk about and try to figure it out. These are all, I see them as, as immediate concerns that needs to get or deserve good answers. The long term, at least for my opinion, are finding the indications that will benefit from the current technologies with all their issues that we have right now. And those should be carefully, carefully looked at. Because I think that, you know, now it's a big hype. Everyone is so happy from the COVID that you try to build upon the success on any disease in the world. And practically it would not work. 
So I think we have to be realistic and for futuristic approaches, try to understand more the biology, where this approach of RNA can work and where it will be part of a bigger arsenal. So it's probably not going to solve all the problems in the world. But I think that we have the tendency to engineer everything. And if we, if we feel that we can engineer a solution, it's great. But we have to go back and understand more in deep the biological and the pathological issues and then choose the best solution. And that takes time. But in, in fact, uh, there is a lot of uh, untold story about the mRNA that you mentioned during your, uh, your talk, which is uh, uh, basically we are good now to have a, a stable mRNA. We are good to deliver because we can pack it and administer in vivo. But what is coming out uh, from all the publication in the last two years that the, the fact that one particle go inside a cell and then that mRNA uh, is translated is not so uh, immediate in vivo. There are some cells that uptake the particles, some cells that don't uptake the particles. We don't know pretty much. There are some papers uh, right now that are trying to explain this uh, phenomenon. And also there are some cells that not even if they get the particles, they don't express the mRNA or the, the efficiency of expression is very low. So all this part that is pertain the old biology you were talking about, we are still trying to investigate right now. So it's pretty much what you guys are doing <laughs> in your day-by-day. Yeah, well, day, I, I, I feel like that's a great point. And to build off of the prior comments, it's it, th there's some low-hanging fruit that we ha need to prioritize as we build this out into therapeutics, in my opinion. I mean, you could look at siRNA where, you know, Merck was going to make themselves an siRNA company and treat almost everything. And it, of course, it's not gonna quite work out that way. So if we build out the, the kind of lower hanging fruit and wiser people than me could kind of make those decisions, but there's a lot of delivery science underneath this. How do we really skew the population of mRNAs to the target cell? That, that's very difficult to do and there's not gonna be an off the shelf formulation that's going to do it all. Oftentimes, I think people at, at the pharma companies treat delivery like, well, here's my problem. Where's my, solution. give me your solution. <laughs> and the science of delivery, just really even quantifying where things are going in humans, especially, which are known to be quite different in important ways with mRNA. It's not there yet. And so there, there does, as Dan said, need to be a longer kind of investment in the key challenges and problems to advance our understanding. And that, that's gonna take a while. But there's also these great <laughs> lower hanging fruits that need to be prioritized. So I, I like the way Dan put that. And the, if I may, there is, to piggyback on, I, I totally agree, but just to add on, to, on that, for what we're trying to do, for example, it's not just about specificity. It's not just about uh, off-targeting, for example. It's also about how many cells do you target in the tissue? Because I'm oversimplifying it, but you know, when it comes to vaccines, it's enough that a certain number of cells express the, the, the epitope that is going to be recognized by the immune system. For what we are trying to do, we need to target at least 20, at least 30, at least 50% of the tissue you know, in order to have an effect. So biodistribution is absolutely fundamental and we need to study it. And I'm not sure we, need, we can study it in, for example, in animal models because the tissue organization is completely different. The extracellular matrix is completely different. We need to start developing organoids models that are suitable, human organoids models that are suitable actually for this type of studies. Um, so that's absolutely important. And as a kind of a, a flip side of, so the more you target the tissue, the higher are the chances that immunogenicity of lipids or any other components becomes a big issue. We have to be honest that there is cytotoxicity and there is immunogenicity, you know, triggered by the, the, the liquid nanoparticles. So we have to address that, that point from a safety, you know, uh, standpoint as well. So. 
and uh, like uh, <clears throat> um, follow up what you were saying that the low hanging fruit is true because uh, a, a lot of uh, things that uh, uh, we on this field that we have to control is this eye in order to don't do the same problem we, we had with the liposomal formulation in which we over-engineer everything. And then on the regulatory point of view, not too many species went to the uh, fruition of the patient. Uh, so we have to act smartly and we have to say, okay, this is actually something that can be, be beneficial of an RNA therapeutics. Because as you say, sRNA is not working in every case. It cannot be all the, the treatment of every disease, but it might be, be very beneficial for some kind of disease. At the same time, we don't have a dosage mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we have a lot of limitation to go in, in vivo on um, pathology. They are not like cancer right now, that they are not predicates or they are not vaccine actually. So there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, way that we have to run, we have to try to run as fast as possible to understand which are the target uh, uh, diseases that we can control with this technology mm -hmm. and what are, again, the limitation and, and recognize the limitation. I, I believe that sometimes in our field we are mm -hmm. trying to push as much as possible and we don't re uh, realize that, no, maybe for that kind of uh, pathology we are still good with drugs. But mm -hmm. for other kind of pathology, we cannot, drugs didn't work. So I, I agree with you, but we have to be uh, as much as possible sincere with, uh, like, um, scientifically sincere and say, okay, this is actually are the limitation that we have in the clinical and only sRNA, mRNA therapy or CRISPR-Cas9 can solve that, no matter the limitation that there are right now in the, um, uh, in all the process, because we, we spoke about, uh, for example, the, the, the microfluidic approach in particles uh, and LMPs fabrication is another tool that democratizes a lot the use of uh, LMPs. But sometimes I had uh, some uh, short back in, on people that come to me and say, oh, you, did, you say that these particles were working. And I'll say, no, you did everything. I don't know what, <laughs> what did you do over there. You just, uh, you just get a, um, a paper and re you reproduce the paper, but you don't have the knowledge of drug delivery system that other people has for years. So, so, so that, that's an important point. I think that there have been less standardization Correct. in the field. And one of the good things that happen, if you look at microfluidics, is that you can standardize mm -hmm. with some instruments, you can standardize protocols, you can create SOPs that everyone can use them if they use the same lipids from the same, for example, source or the same polymers yeah. right? mm -hmm. uh, or combinations, which I like actually very much. But <laughs> I think that that there was lack of standardization and therefore the reproducibility was quite low. Over the years, there have been a lot of red flags that people need to standardize protocols. Okay? And today, some of the publishing uh, uh, houses actually force you, ask you, it's mandatory to, for example, show your gating strategy in immunology. You have to know exactly which antibodies have you been using on their catalog number even. But it doesn't happen still in, our, in the science of delivery. Correct. And that needs to be changed where everyone can use, you know, and, and it will also help the people who wants to scale up those technologies because they will have a starting point that is highly reproducible. Right now, and we need to be very honest, right now the CMC challenge is still a challenge. Although you might say that you can have, you know, billions of doses have been generated. But even without, they have been generated in technologies that are predominantly T-line technologies, very, very old ethanol injection idea that came from liposomes, yeah. okay? All the microfluidics, and again, I'm very happy with microfluidics, I'm involved, I was involved <laughs> with this, but I still think that mass production with microfluidics did not happen yet, okay? There are temporarily phase one trials, mm -hmm. but it's not protocol that the FDA has approved for long-term 
uh, manufacturing. So I think that standardization at the basic science level is needed in the delivery field, as it is done in immunology, as it is done in cell biology right now. But it's not done enough. I mean, there is some starting point, but it's not good enough what we have in the delivery science. Yeah, I, I just really agree with that, Dan, because, I mean, and it's one thing to, again, say we have these standard LMPs, but if you really ask simple questions like, what's the exact ratio of your three lipid components? What is your size distribution? Well, how do you calculate and make a measurement of your size distribution? Different labs will find different particle sizes and they're always a distribution. Yeah. What's acceptable? What, what, are the, what are the cutoffs? And, yeah. and by which methods do you give yours? I may have a different method to get my distribution and get a different answer. And it ultimately impacts the science because there become lore in our field of delivery. You have to be less than 100 nanometers or you have to be less than 200 nanometers for this. But if you really went in and looked at the data and the standardization, it's not there. And so sometimes those rules can really hinder people from following an interesting application because it's treated as a rule. But in fact, it might be more lore without enough characterization and standardization. And I, right. so I would amplify it. You know, I follow saying. up with that because I did like it for, uh, because I had free time a review of the literature of the last two years that explode in uh, uh, mRNA therapeutics and also in big impact factor journal. And so I went to check the characterization of the nanoparticles. I will say that most of the 50% don't report, not even in the supplementary methods, the normal yeah. DLS so it depends, and encapsulation. It, it depends on the journal. <laughs> That's right? true, but true. at least it's one data that yeah. you should have it. If you did it, it means that you yeah. should have it yeah. and but, report it. But I have, I have the feeling, though, that that's still true in, uh, in academia. I think that, you know, at least in industry, there is, there is definitely also for, for, for obvious reasons. You it know? must be. It must yeah. be, exactly. But it should, so, be, also but it should also be in academia. I totally but agree. It but it will make the in translation into industry easier. much easier. simpler. I agree. Yeah. And Great. it will take probably less time and it will have less issues because there is always issues and always unexpected issues. And we can try to minimize this by reporting, you know, kind of standardization. And, you know, we rewrote some commentary about this in 2013, Ken Howard and myself in nanomedicine. A few years later, we wrote it in Nature Nano with a lot of other people about reproducibility mm -hmm. and standardization. And until now, there is no real standardization <laughs> in the field. Yeah. And, I, I and I think it's, it's so essential, and I'll say something more. In biology, there is a feeling, maybe it's my feeling, but maybe it's not only my feeling, that biology has less quantitative analysis. How do you quantify intracellular trafficking of your lipid nanoparticles? How do you look at degradation of, let's say, your RNA and your uh, lipids, in this case, inside the cell, in a quantitative manner, okay? I think this will be super essential. If we can create standardization also in the intracellular and in biological processes, it will help greatly our field and many other fields as well. Because my impression is that we have an echo. But my impression <laughs> is that we really need this. We need quantitative biology. And it's not quantitative enough. And any manuscript I read or review or write, I try to emphasize this because, and I don't get very good answers okay. most of the time, because sometimes there is, there is no way. There is no way, or people yeah. did not really yeah. put their mind into exactly. this. But it's very important. 
you know, for f- even if you look at expression, yeah. how do you quantify good expression? Expression could be, okay, I have a band in Western Blot. I have, a, I can do flow cytometry and identify. Plus, plus, plus. Plus, plus, <laughs> plus, 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 minus, plus, minus, minus. 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 <laughs> yeah. So how do I quantify this? Do I look also in function? Because if there is no function, you know, it could be expressed, but it doesn't work, right? So who cares? I think that those fundamental questions needs to be addressed. And sometimes when you even try to develop something quantitative, it's very depressing in biology. <laughs> because you learn that you're really off of anything that could be measurable enough. And reproducible. So let's say that is challenging. Yes. Not that it's impossible. <laughs> it's and not impossible, but it's challenging. To make it more complicated, you talk about translation of the mRNA. So a lot of time you say, okay, the 5' prime and the 3' prime UTR are then irresponsible. And then you find out that actually for, the, for a certain cell type, you need to use a different 5' prime UTR, so say, okay, that's fantastic. <laughs> then you find out that for different genes, you need to use a yeah. different 5' prime UTR. So you need for your target gene to optimize per cell type and per, per organ, per the delivery. So it's make it much more complicated. We need to understand that the answer are not easy. They are not simple. There's a lot of unknown. And you work on a certain cell, like I'm working on PKM2, I need to find the 5 prime, the 3 prime UTR that fits the best for PKM2 for delivery for cardiomyocyte in the heart. This is the work. And I can talk only about that. I cannot say, okay, now you bring yeah, yeah, your yeah, gene yeah. and, and well, that's we, going we to... We have a tendency to extrapolate <laughs> everything. Yeah. But, so yeah, yeah. I, since that we have five minutes, okay. so we have to send our last message to whoever is uh, <laughs> listening to us about what is for you, for each of you, what is the future of uh, RNA nanotherapeutics? So in w- basically one, one minute each we have. Okay. So I can start <laughs> by saying that we're going to see a lot of vaccines. That's going to be the, the near future, I can say. Uh, it, it was proven to work with vaccine. mRNA and nanoparticle work fantastic with COVID. I think we're going to see the, the, the lack of using other methods and, and focusing on those methods. And of course, the next thing is, is cancer vaccines that have uh, been developed by uh, BioNTech for years and also Moderna now started with collaboration with Merck to do it. And I think that's going to be the near future and hopefully uh, the far future will be a real mRNA therapeutic to organs. So I I echo you and completely agree. I think that the bar in therapeutics is much higher. Okay, and that's, we need to understand. So I think Mm -hmm. that there is a gap. We need to bridge it somehow. It's a lot of work. (laughs) But I think that there is also a lot of room for the entire community because Okay, you have one proof of concept. It's actually quite remarkable. Two different companies, two different lipids, ionizable lipids, two different formulations. Even the preservative are different. The sequence is very close. The doses are different. The end results is similar. That only means to me that the immune system works. (laughs) But it doesn't mean anything else, unfortunately. So for therapeutics, the bar is multiple injection, much more sophisticated. I think we're not there yet, but I'm super optimistic. I want to bring it to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> and with all the caveats that we discussed, we need, there is a ton of things that we don't know and we need to know. But imagine, I mean, I imagine a future where, for example, you could deliver the, the nanoparticles, the mRNAs at key stages of development. We can start thinking about fixing developmental disorders in utero before you know they 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 ma- they manifest they i yeah. dream about you know a, a future where a baby that is supposed to be born with a congenital disorder and is going to have a miserable life is going to be born normal just because at the right time he was given the right gene mm-hmm. 
so that's that's a dream for me, and I'm. It's a good dream, though. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's going to happen at some point. Sure, there is a lot of people that now are yeah. investigating to deliver into fetus and so on and so yeah. forth. Well, I'll end with the hope as well. I hope that it makes our healthcare more equitable. That we've touched upon it, and that it somehow allows us to think about the challenge in Africa in disadvantaged settings in a new way. Yeah. And I think they may be very different drug delivery solutions, for example, for that setting. There's self-amplifying RNA that somehow never came up, but in terms of if we could get down to nanogram levels, think how many more doses we would have just mathematically mm -hmm. and cost may go down and that we can put some effort into that as well as our well investment funded ideas and concepts in our world. So that's my hope. That's definitely. So we are almost close. I want also to share my point. I believe that uh, if we uh, somehow uh, put together all our efforts in the tribe, as you were saying, with with the view on not over-engineering too much and limitate ourselves, our nerd ourselves, because I imagine every time that we all of us enter in the lab wants to, ah, let's try to do this, let's try to do this. But unfortunately, regulatory-wise, if we want a product that really works, we have to be a little bit boring and we have to, say, we have to do as Dan was saying be reproducible as much as possible. And I hope that this is going to be an effort that we're going to start to see also in academia and academic environment in order to have more product for our patient. Because at the end, we all, all of us, I, I believe, we want to end, uh, arrive over there to the uh, bad side, uh, starting from our bench side. So Dr. Cook, you want to? Enter in this. I want to thank you guys for a sparkling <laughs> panel discussion. That was really, really great. I really enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot myself. I was listening in, at the studio here and uh, really a lot of wisdom and uh, excitement and promise. Um, I'm so glad you're all here today sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, thank you once again uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Francesca, for moderating. Sure. We're going to go now to uh, Bianca Godin. And uh, Bianca Godin is uh, going to be talk talking to us about a novel RNA therapeutic for skin regeneration. Uh, do we have Bianca on the line? Wow, that was a great panel discussion. Now I have the pleasure to introduce to you the next speaker, Dr. Biana Godin. Dr. Godin earned her PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from the School of Pharmacy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. She then completed her postdoctoral fellowship in cancer nanotechnology at the Brown Foundation Institute of Molecular Medicine at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston under the guidance of Dr. Mauro Ferrari. Dr. Godin is currently an associate professor in the Department of Nanomedicine here at the Houston Methodist Research Institute with appointments in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Houston Methodist, as well as the University of Texas Health Science Center in the School of Medicine. She also holds an appointment in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Texas A&M. Dr. Godin is a highly accomplished translational scientist at the intersection of biological and physical sciences, with more than 200 scientific publications and a solid history of federal and foundation grants. Today, Dr. Godin will present her work on RNA nanotherapeutic for skin regeneration. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Dr. Cook and Dr. Gotoni, for your kind introduction. I'm happy to present to you today um, a work of a great team of scientists uh, who I will introduce later in this talk. Um, as a matter of disclosure, this project is supported by Vita Medical. Um, so it's a sponsor research agreement with this company. Um, today, so our lab is uh, um, focusing on several uh, clinical areas of research. Um, cancer, infectious diseases, obstructive and gynecology. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about mRNA-based therapies um, and specifically in skin regeneration, which is a joint pro uh, project with uh, 
uh, Dr. Cook and his team. So let's talk about the burn wounds uh, in terms of the statistics. More than 300 deaths every year are caused by uh, the burns. Um, when non-fatal burn injuries represent a leading cause of morbidity and may lead to severe disabilities, especially in uh, younger um, population, uh, more than 10 million patients is here seek medical attention due to burn wounds with more than uh, half million in the U.S. only. Uh, for severe burn wounds, split and full thickness skin grafts when the healthy skin is taken from a less uh, visible part of the patient body and then grafted to, to cover the wound represent an integral part of uh, management of the clinical management. Recently, instead of uh, split thickness uh, skin grafts, um, autologous skin cell suspension or ASCS, as I will call it later, was proposed as a great alternative um, based on uh, several clinical trials. Uh, ASCS uh, therapy significantly can reduce uh, both the hospital stay and the cost of the therapy by um, almost uh, $25,000 per patient. So how does it work? Uh, um, generally, the partial thickness uh, skin is taken with a dermatome from an unaffected, un unaffected uh, region in the body. It is further mechanically disintegrated and then uh, chemically digested to obtain a suspension of the skin cells, which is then sprayed on the surface of the wound. Um, in fact, um, what is the great benefit of this technology is that uh, this uh, uh, suspension obtained from one centimeter square of the skin biopsy can cover up to 80 centimeters square of the wound area, making this procedure much more efficient for um, patients with large area uh, wounds. So the results are fantastic, actually, especially for younger pe uh, patients who are experienced up to a complete uh, skin regeneration within a few months. As you can see from here, this is uh, this are actually the actual uh, patient uh, that was treated with SCS uh, technology. Um, however, as we spoke today, multiple speakers actually touched this topic. Um, the, there is a, a lot of uh, problems that can be uh, caused uh, in older individuals. Uh, so they actually experience difficulty in wound and burn healing. Um, so while the strategy works great in younger individuals, um, there is a very, uh, the results in, in, in partial and full thickness burns in elderly patients are not great. So this can be directly correlated with the presence of the senescent skin cells, which are characterized by an impaired function and replicative and regenerative capacity. We heard today many talks about uh, different aspects of that, but um, I'll talk about the telomeres. So telomeres are the physical ends of chromosomes that are composed of randomly repeated uh, G-rich DNA sequences. And during the aging, uh, shortening of telomeres has been implicated in uh, different uh, aging processes, such as cell cycle arrest, senescence, and uh, eventually cellular mortality. So um, this can explain that the replicative capacity of the skin cells from the older population is uh, decreased. Um, telomerase, um, which was also mentioned in a few talks today, is um, a ribonucleoprotein complex that adds telomere repeats to the end of the shortened chromosomes. Human telomerase reverse trans uh, tr uh, transcriptase, or h 3rd is the catalytic subunit of uh, this complex and is involved in a rate, rate limiting step uh, in the activation of the telomerase. Basically, um, in the previous studies, our combined teams have shown that the treatments with h 3rd mRNA that induces the expression of h 3rd in the cells can revert senescence in various cells, including fibroblast and endothelial cells, like keratinocytes and other, um, as shown, for example, on the left for fibroblasts. Additionally, uh, cell isolated from hutchison glifford progeria syndrome patient treated with H30 mRNA regain their proliferative capacity 
um, what is important to know is that uh, HGPS uh, is characterized by lack of telomerase closing and accelerated aging. It was also mentioned today in a few talks. So um, in this specific work, we hypothesized that uh, nanotherapy with h 3 mRNA can increase the length of telomeres, thus reducing cellular senescence in ASCS cells and promote rapid healing of acute and chronic wounds. So first, we obviously needed to um, uh, select the nanoparticles. We actually use the lipids that are um, available. And so it is important to know that the procedures of the ACS engrafting is usually done during the surgery. And the process of preparation of this uh, uh, suspension takes around 15 minutes. Um, so mRNA, um, as you heard multiple times today, has to be protected from degradation and in order to enter the cells of the skin, has to be delivered in the lipid nanoparticle carrier. So we first uh, had to pre-select the LNP formulation that had, uh, was able to deliver to skin cells within a very short time frame and express mRNA ex vivo and in vivo after engraftment. It's important that this procedure is actually an ex vivo procedure. It's not um, actually injecting the mRNA into the body. It has to bind to the cells in the suspension and then um, uh, express uh, in when the suspension is engrafted. Um, so um, ACS uh, contains about 64% keratinocytes and about 30% fibroblasts. And these were our main target populations. And as I mentioned, the time was in, of uh, great importance. We used uh, three different uh, commercially available lipids for that. Um, uh, the cationic and two ionizable lipids. These two lipids are actually um, uh, currently used for different uh, um, RNA formulations in the clinic. Um, again, DOTAP is not used because it's conventionally considered uh, toxic uh, for cells, populations as well uh, as uh, it expresses some systemic toxicity. But since, since we treat in ex vivo the cells, uh, we kind of, this uh, consideration is less um, important. So this all of the systems had high encapsulation efficiency of uh, more than 90% and very low polydispersity index, uh, showing the homogeneous populations, and were stable at least uh, in suspension for at least uh, two weeks and four degrees. Uh, we first uh, went and checked uh, different um, uptake kinetics and mRNA expression in the skin cells of, uh, of interest. Um, in keratinocytes, as I mentioned, they represent uh, more than 60% of the ASCS. Uh, we have seen that uh, um, DOTAP uh, formulation was significantly uh, uh, better in terms of the faster uptake and uh, um, much higher expression in this cell population. We actually this is the only formulation that uh, that had a good uptake um, for this uh, specific uh, cells. And we have seen very similar results with uh, uh, fibroblasts. We then went to test this in the human um, AS, uh, ACS, the, the cell skin suspension, uh, taking from the, the human donor skin. And we saw that uh, we had a very um, great uh, uptake and expression of uh, in uh, both doses that we tested, in this case, 0.5 microgram and one microgram mRNA per ml. Um, and uh, that it resulted in a great uh, telomerase activity. Um, as you can see that, uh, that ASCS with LNPH3 was very uh, expressed the trap products. This is called the trap assay, and these are the products of uh, telomerase activity in a dose dependent manner. And we haven't seen this activity with uh, our control systems that are uh, LNP that have um, the GFP uh, protein um, mRNA. So, 
Uh, after that, we went and and uh, we needed to test the system in vivo. And for this purpose, we basically selected the LNP formulation that was able to be taken out by the ASCS suspension cells ex vivo, as, as uh, I mentioned, very fast. And then um, we have to do the in vivo pool thickness humanized skin mo uh, wound model. It was created in mice. Um, uh, basically, you can see from the schematics that in immunocompromised mice, the incision was made in the skin and the silicon dome was implanted to prevent the healing of the murine wound. The area one, then was treated with fibroid engine and the SCS suspension from human donor skin, um, which was pre-treated with H30 mRNA LNP or as a control, EGFP mRNA LNP. Uh, following that, after 7 to 28 days, the newly formed human skin was resected and tested for several histological markers, which included, uh, first of all, lamin uh, A, that is the human nuclear protein. We wanted to make sure that the skin that we are reproducing is from human origin and not uh, growing uh, the mouse skin back. Um, DAPI was the nuclear staining, PI67 was the marker for proliferation, P21 is an essence marker, 53BP1 uh, is a DNA double strand break uh, marker, and CD31 for uh, skin microvasculature. Um, as I mentioned, for the human cells, we, we saw that uh, the engraftment of the cells um, of the human cells was significantly higher when the uh, ASCS was treated with H30 mRNA LNP as compared to the EGFP mRNA control as well as um, ASCS by itself. And on the right corner, you actually can see this image because um, this is uh, this is the part of the mouse skin, and this is the part where the dome was uh, placed. So this is uh, you can see very distinct uh, distinct uh, features of these images. But the, I'm just going to talk about the quantification of this. So in terms of the proliferation, Ki67 cells in uh, mouse wound model showed that um, it was a significantly higher proliferation of the cells in the ACS H30 mRNA and P treated group. Uh, actually, we saw almost five times higher proliferation that uh, um, basically was the, the a great uh, finding because, uh, again, the problem with the cells that are senescence and the cells uh, of ACS were taking actually take, taken from the uh, donors who, um, who are uh, about 50 years old, usually, um, we don't see that uh, great proliferation, as you can see with the control. Um, the treatment also reduced the P21 plus cells, uh, the senescent cells in these um, mice, and uh, significantly decreased the 53 uh, BP1 uh, plus cells, uh, say, uh, basically showing that the DNA damage was also decreased. Uh, we have also uh, started to an anal uh, analyze the um, uh, the microvasculature, the CD31 plus. With I don't have the quantitative analysis because these are recent uh, findings, but uh, you can actually see that the vasculature stained in brown here is uh, produced uh, when the ASCS uh, plus H3 mRNA LNP um, are applied. So, to conclude, um, we designed mRNA H3 LNP suitable for SCS treatment. The H3 LNP had a fast uptake, which was very important for us in this specific uh, clinical protocol, and the, and the very efficient mRNA expression in skin cells and ASCS from uh, elderly donors. Then full thickness humanized skin model in mice was created, and uh, mRNA H3 increased the hum 
human skin cell engraftment, proliferation capacity, skin microvasculature, and significantly decrease cellular senescence and DNA damage um, in this model. So to conclude, H3 nanotherapy can benefit older patients with burn wounds, and uh, we hope to apply it to, to the clinical setting soon uh, with the help of a Vita Medical. And as I mentioned, this is a project was that was done uh, in collaboration with a great team of experts um, from uh, the um, RNA nanotherapeutics uh, department. Uh, from Avita Medical, from the Nanomedicine Department, and the, not to forget the surgeons that actually provided us with the um, donor skin. And I really would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Biana, uh, Dr. Godin, for your uh, wonderful presentation. I have a quick question for you. And uh, the question is, in the context of this model, uh, which is a skin graft model, um, it may be valuable to prolong the efficacy of uh, the mRNA construct, especially in cases where uh, the insult from radiation is extended over time. So can you please comment on the potential strategy to attain this uh, sustained efficacy from this mRNA construct that you and Dr. Cook have created? So first of all, there are several things that we're presenting during this conference and maybe there is some confusion. So this project is not about radiation induced skin injury. We will, pre we will have a presentation about radiation induced skin injury uh, later on. But for this specific project, it is very important to actually affect the cells um, in terms of the cellular senescence, the cells that are applied to the wound bed. So even before the application, because when this, the cells are engrafted from the uh, patient, uh, um, patients that are older, then the cellular senescence in skin cells prevents them from uh, engrafting uh, um, normally, like in younger individuals. So in this case, we wanted to prevent this effect. And um, the, of course, uh, as, as, you, as you've seen, the, um, the results that I've shown actually after eight days, we, and we are currently doing also a longer study for 28 days, uh, but the proteins uh, that you see here are actually not Im immediate uh, responses. These are the eight uh, days recovery process, and you can actually see that the factors that uh, we tested are um, uh, showing that the tissue is regenerating much better after eight days. Thank you, Biana. Well, uh, for consideration with time, I would like to move forward with the next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. You. Francesca Taraballi. And uh, Dr. Francesca Taraballi earned her uh, Bachelor in Science in Biological Sciences uh, and the first uh, Master in Biochemistry at the University of Milan, uh, Bicocca in Italy. After another Master in Science in Structural Biochemistry, she earned her PhD in uh, um, uh, Nanotechnology. Uh, and before to arrive at uh, HMRI, Dr. Taraballi spent a postdoctoral fellowship uh, time at the Material Science Department of NTU in Singapore. Dr. Taraballi is currently the director of the Center for Musculoskeletal Re Regeneration at Houston Methodist Research Institute, which is affiliated with the Department of Orthopedics and Sport Medicine at Houston Methodist Hospital. Dr. Taraballi's research is focused on the development of translational biomaterial, both injectable and implantable, to target the immune system toward tissue restoration. Dr. Taraballi. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Grattoni. Okay, I, I will start to speak about and to explain some of the uh, limitations that we have in uh, uh, nanotherapeutics that we discussed, for instance, uh, uh, in the uh, previous part of the, the day, as well as in our panel, which is the biological barriers. So uh, when we think about uh, nanoparticles, we think about uh, this idea 
of uh, a nano object that uh, we can we can find also in the in the movie in the fantastic voyage that is a very old um, uh, movie from the 60s in which they uh, think to develop this uh, nano uh, uh, machine that can travel around the bloodstream and arrive at the target site and kill whatever it has to kill in our case any kind of uh, um, diseases but actually the reality is not as we uh, as we think is easy as we were talking about before there are a lot of limitations that affect this uh, easy concept of uh, uh, traveling around the blood system and arrive at the site of the target which are called biological barriers this is a good review that has been uh, published uh, recently in 2020 in which uh, envisioned the different different type of biological barriers that we can find in the human body upon the administration of nanoparticles in, in the bloodstream. The first one is the MPS. So our immune system is programmed to arrive at the site uh, uh, to the foreign object opsonize the foreign object and remove from the bloodstream is our actually defense mechanism and that is a play against uh, the nanoparticles arrive at the site to target the second uh, barrier is the endothelial barrier so if we inject something iv and we want to target a stroma on a specific tissue we have to what we call extravasate so our nanoparticles they have to go outside the uh, bloodstream and diffuse in the tissue of interest. Then, of course, we have the extracellular barrier. The extracellular matrix is, is the scaffold, basically, where our the cells are organized. In some pathology, extracellular barriers are very different than uh, physiological uh, uh, condition. For example, in case of fibrosis, we have a very thick um, capsule formation that is typical of fibrosis uh, um, uh, uh, diseases as well as some solid tumor develop this uh, very solid capsule that is difficult to let them penetrate the nanoparticles within. And finally, uh, we have the endosomal barrier. So depending on where we have to deliver our cargo, especially for mRNA or um, sRNA, one thing that we have to do is deliver our cargo within the cells. So we have to be able to enter in the cells without causing toxicity, as well as releasing what we uh, uh, load on our nanoparticles in the easiest way uh, uh, ever. Of course, this is uh, something that is rationalized in this uh, big schematic, but it's very difficult to take care, as we say before, of uh, these four different uh, variables, and then we have more many other variables. So what we develop in my lab is a strategy to try to uh, uh, avoid uh, this kind of biological barrier or uh, exploiting a biomimetic approach. So basically we study what in, uh, in, in nature happened and what in nature already uh, overcome these biological barriers. And one of the, uh, the candidates that came out are leucosomes, so uh, um, white cells. So there are our cells that normally are meant to defend our body to the introduction of foreign body. But at the same time, they are very good to travel around the bloodstream as well as uh, target the site of inflammation, the site of trauma. They are able, because they are meant to do that, arrive at the uh, site of uh, trauma as well as extravasate the endothelial barrier and diffuse inside the stroma. So what we developed a uh, long time in 2016 actually is this uh, nanoparticles with this called leucosome. So what we uh, engineer is this nanoparticles that bring with, it, uh, with itself the, uh, the membrane protein of the leukocytes. And we use this membrane protein as building blocks and actually as a reagents in our, uh, in our way to fabricate these particles. These particles we are able to uh, synthesize with uh, uh, every kind of methods has been uh, uh, published before, as well as the new method as a microfluidic uh, uh, system. And uh, we, we became uh, very good to investigate what are the, the, um, the tropism of 
these particles. Actually, what we saw that these particles retain the tropism of the source cells. So the source cells are macrophages. Macrophages migrate on the site of inflammation. And so these particles behave as macrophages. So as you can see here, we have liposome, which is a liposomal composition without this membrane protein, as well as what we call leucosome. So these particles, they are um, functionalized with this membrane protein. And we saw that if you follow the signal in red, we saw that they uh, uh, migrate towards the site of inflammation in a more efficient way than liposome. They stay in circulation better, so they are able to avoid those biological barriers that I was talking before. Moreover, they retain the mechanism of adhesion of the leukocyte. In fact, what we what we uh, explain is that the um, adhesion to the inflaming endothelium is uh, um, triggered by the interaction between LFA1 and ICAN1. So what is the tropism is toward the inflamed endothelium. So we have right now and nanoparticles that, as well as their, the source cells, so it's a sort of uh, uh, synthetic, synthetic exosome that, can, that we can engineer in order to target the inflammation. And this is b basically all the application that uh, we demonstrate, or at least this kind of uh, approach can be extended. Uh, we, uh, we work a lot in cancer uh, kind of application, as well as in musculoskeletal and skin disorder. But today, I will talk about cardiovascular application. As I said before, and the reason why we are all here is because cardiovascular disease is still the world number uh, killer in the world. As you can see from this schematic, it's pretty uh, uh, astonished the, 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 this bad let's say, uh, Guinness that uh, CVD retain in the mortality rate. Uh, one of uh, those cardiovascular disease that uh, we thought it could be a, dis a, a, a rational target for the leukocyte are arteriosclerosis, which is the, it, it is a, a number one uh, cause of death. And especially the fact that arteriosclerosis is the degenerative disease that goes in a different kind of stage. And if you can check the first stage of this uh, cardiovascular, uh, this arteriosclerosis disease, it starts with endothelial inflammation. So we have a weapon that can target the early, early stage arteriosclerosis, preventing this uh, accumulation of uh, and, uh, and, um, and clogging of the main vessel that actually the, um, cause then all the uh, mortality that we envisioned before. So what we develop, it, uh, what we want to target is exactly this part, the first part of plaque inception of the uh, arteriosclerosis in which, if you can see here from the schematic, is ICAM that is overexpressed. That exactly mechanism that I showed you before that we uh, discovered treating cancer, but is actually very relevant for arteriosclerosis disease. And in fact, uh, what we want to try to understand if is these nanoparticles are able to selectively target the initial part of the plaque, and uh, as well as if we can prevent treat, uh, treating this kind of, uh, uh, sorry, it went over, um, this kind of disease using uh, some drug um, delivery. As you can see here, there is a little bit of engineering on the platform. We've been uh, very uh, lately uh, very constructive in uh, what we were saying before, try to develop an SOP, a standard operating procedure, in order to have uh, these uh, kind of particles as much repeatably as possible for what pertain their physical, physical chemical uh, properties as well as the loading efficiency and the retention of all the decoration that we were talking about of the uh, leukocyte derived membrane. And uh, if for this particular uh, application, we want to load these particles with rapamycin. Rapamycin is a um, therapeutics that is already used at the clinical uh, level is an mTOR inhibitor. And we can see here what we were looking for. So we were looking for the leukocyte in vivo arrive at the site of the plaque. In also been uptake by the macrophages that are present as a site of inflammation on the endothelium and regulate, uh, release rapamycin regulating mTOR. And this is the cascade, the, the, the 
the overall cascade mediated by NFKB, in which uh, we think that uh, uh, we, we hope that uh, there is a decreasement in uh, endothelium uh, inflammation, especially triggered by ICAM1 and VCAM1, as well as a decrease of the um, uh, uh, proliferation of macrophages, uh, which is one of the uh, uh, important um, um, characteristic of the first stage of arteriosclerosis. We inject this uh, macrophage, uh, sorry, this leukocyte in vivo, uh, IV in this particular case, and we check at the site in the APOE um, model, and we check if these, uh, these particles were able to target the site, as well as reduce the macrophage uh, proliferator. Of, of course, there is some limitation of um, this kind of technique due to the fact that the APOE um, uh, model is particularly challenging. It takes a lot of time to develop the plaque, uh, but and at the same time we don't have a standard regime in which we can start to treat. So we standardize as much as possible the animal model as well as the uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, leuco uh, leucosome treatment. And uh, we saw that, uh, and this is, was the work uh, uh, splendid developed by Christian Boada and Asaf Zinger, there were two of postdoc uh, uh, that uh, were in my lab as well as in the lab of uh, uh, Professor Cook and that resulted in um, circulation research actually cover uh, as sensational was the result because we, we proved that basically these leucosomes are able to target the plaque in the animal model and are able to show the first proof of concept, uh, concept result on the fact that they can stay and retain in the plaque and they can reduce the inflammation while, uh, while they are releasing rapamycin. Uh, what is the, uh, the the follow-up. The follow-up is the fact that, first of all, we can also use this kind of uh, uh, platform, since that is targeted very well the plaque as a screening method to detect the potential plaque before the treatment, as well as with the preventional treatment in order to decrease the, uh, um, uh, the rays of the arteriosclerosis in the patient. But uh, one of the discussion we were saying before is that uh, can we de deliver with this method mRNA or any kind of RNA? Well, this is, uh, took me a little bit of more time. At the beginning, we thought that the translation was uh, uh, so easy, but actually we are discussing about two different type of particles and I want to mention over here because uh, what we discussed before is that uh, what happened to the liposome and what is the the difference between liposome and lipid nanoparticles well when we uh, speak about ionizable lipid that you heard a lot uh, during this uh, this day is that we have a different conformation so leucosome was firstly conceived as the liposomal part, uh, formulation also because we use the normal biomimicry of the liposome as a cell membrane to be able to encapsulate in the wall the cell, me the, the membrane proteins. When we pass to a lipid nanoparticles, we don't have this double layer anymore, so we are a little bit um, uh, out of the rational, scientific rational. How can we embed it in, uh, in this kind of particles, uh, some membrane protein? So we try, and uh, again, normally uh, what we uh, decide to, uh, to do when uh, uh, what we were saying before, depending on the application, depending what we want to do, we have to select the different type of uh, uh, delivery system. And so depending on what kind of cargo we want to de deploy, it, we have to deliver, uh, we have to change the delivery system. So can we transform the leucosome platform in what is what we call leuco LMPs. So I cannot enter too much in details because of course this is under uh, patenting process, but what I want to show you that this conversion is not so easy. So if we use the same kind of uh, proportion that we use for do this kind of particles to this kind of particles, is not working. So as you can see here, the particles uh, goes all over in size uh, as well as in um, 
well, in a, in a Zeta potential is not uh, too much of a burden, but you can tell directly here that we lose a lot of uh, encapsulation efficiency of mRNA, as well as all the parameters, all the QC parameters that we normally uh, uh, decide to, to have a successful synthesis are completely uh, all over. So it took decent amount of time, I will say a couple of years, uh, to understand what are the parameters that link the, uh, the introduction of this protein within the mRNA. And you can see here that uh, we modify, and again, I cannot enter in the details because of uh, um, uh, about of, of IP pending, but you can see that depending on the different kind of variable that we change, we change also the outcome. And we can speculate that the PEG, of course, does a, a big uh, is a big issue when we want to introduce membrane protein, as you can tell from uh, this data over here. But at the end, I can tell you that we arrived to secure a formulation, which is a formulation for both sRNA and mRNA. We validate both formulation. You can see here that the particles are not more liposomal particles, but are LMPs, and also we uh, try to figure out, as we were saying before, if these particles are also efficient. So if we can uh, inject with the mRNA, we can load with the mRNA, we can inject with the mRNA, and we can express the mRNA. And so we, um, we, uh, we try in different kind of um, route of administration. You can see here the normal route of administration. Uh, here you can see the fluorescent that come from the particles. Uh, here instead the particles were um, loaded with mRNA expressing luciferase. And you can see that um, all of the biodistribution, of course, that is quantified over here on the right, uh, it tells you the normal administration. In this case, this is healthy mice, so we, we, are, we don't have inflammatory uh, based condition, and so there is a normal um, biodistribution. Having said that, we have a method to improve the, uh, the, um, the biodistribution as well as the targeting for inflammatory thing. And I want to conclude saying that uh, uh, it's always good to steal uh, tips uh, from the nature in order to overcome a lot of challenging that we have at the engineering level. And in saying that, I want to acknowledge all uh, my lab that you uh, can see over here, as well as my funding agency and the uh, academic uh, uh, collaborators. Thank you, Francesca, for a wonderful presentation. Um, we will have one question for you, and that's relating to uh, if you can comment specifically on the regulatory pathway for the strategies that you are developing. Sure. So, of course, this is a, a platform that is not just a lipid, uh, is not just a LMPs, right? And not only that we have uh, some predicate right now with the COVID vaccine in which we have uh, two different uh, um, composition that we can use in a clinical lab for vaccine, uh, we can say that we can steal a different type of uh, regulatory uh, from exosome as well as from LMPs. We are uh, right now here at Methodist, we are trying to push as much as possible uh, the, the, the scalability. And right now we did uh, large animal with this uh, platform. So we, uh, we are collecting data of stability of large batch of uh, this platform around 20 ml, which is uh, let, let us think that this process, it might take a while, but it might be uh, uh, very well translated for the clinical uh, setup. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the next set of presentations, which uh, relate to the 2022 Costa Strategic Impact Projects. And we will hear from Dr. Blanco Dr. Fang and Dr. Biana Gori. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers of the George and Angelina Costa Symposium for the opportunity to present our strategic impact project entitled MR Visible Bioresorbable Scaffolds for Coronary Artery Disease. A project that has been jointly developed with cardiologists Drs. Chunlin and Deepan Shah at the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Cardiac catheterization has enabled several life-saving endovascular procedures, one of which is the implantation of metallic stents for the treatment of intravascular stenosis or the narrowing of arteries. Present-day stents are metallic in composition, 
owing to their robustness and superb mechanical properties. And while these are commonplace in the clinical setting, there is a subset of patients, pediatric patients with congenital heart disease, in which metallic stents are not a MEM. This is due to the inability of the device to adapt to growth. It is not uncommon still today for physicians to encounter a metallic stent that is unable to be dilated further in vessels of these patients, which lead to disruptions to blood flow. The exploration of bioresorbable stents was born from this and other limitations of metallic stents. Bioresorbable stents are composed of biodegradable polymers that possess the same mechanical properties as metallic stents, but which ultimately dissolve in three to six months time, allowing for remodeling of the vessel around the stent, which do not leave a permanent metallic stent in place. Here to the right is one such bioresorbable stent from Abbott. It was the first commercially available FDA approved absorbable coronary drug eluding stent. <clears throat> Unfortunately, bioresorbable stents also suffer from drawbacks. This press release represents FDA approval of the bioresorbable stent. Please pay attention to the date. In a subsequent press release, not even one year after approval, the FDA issued a safety advisory against the use of the stent. The issue arose due to the non-homogeneous structure of the stent on in vivo expansion. You see, when the stent is expanded, micro defects are introduced which result in uneven degradation kinetics, which can lead to device failure and ultimately the presence of thrombin. This represents one limitation this project aims to address. The other limitation we seek to address with this work involves the procedure itself to implant stents in the first place. Cardiac catheterization is currently performed under X-ray guidance. This is the first known image of a cardiac catheterization procedure from 1929 performed by Dr. Werner Forsman on himself. The fear at the time was that such an intrusion into the heart would be fatal, but he ignored his department chief and persuaded the operating room nurse to assist him in his experiment. As a result of his pioneering work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1956 for discoveries concerning heart catheterization and pathological changes in the circulatory system. Not much has changed since then. Catheterization is still performed under x-ray, but cath cardiac catheterization with x-ray is limited by inaccurate navigation because of the inability to delineate soft tissue and several anatomical structures. <clears throat> Moreover, there is the exposure of the patients to x-ray. Doctors Lynn and Shaw and our wonderful mighty facilities here at Houston Methodist are pioneering interventional cardiovascular MR imaging. In contrast to x-ray guidance, ICMR allows for imaging in multiple planes, enhanced navigational accuracy, and reduced patient exposure to x-rays. However, this technique is limited by clinical facilities that integrate an ICMR suite adjacent to catheterization operating suite and the absence of ICMR compatible devices. In other words, devices that are visible under MR. At Houston Methodist, we already have two optimal sites for performing ICMR. One site is in the main building CMR suite, and the other is a hybrid OR CMR suite at Mighty. Our prior work, generously funded by the Costas Foundation, consisted of the functionalization of endovascular devices such as guide wires and stents with superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, or SPIOs, for use in ICMR. Here you can see a series of guide wires functionalized with SPIOs that appear as darkened regions in the image that are visible in thoracic and abdominal aortas. <clears throat> in these images, one can appreciate a series of clinically used metallic stents that were functionalized with SPIOs. Our objective is to develop an MR visible bioresorbable stent, one with SPIOs embedded in the actual stent that allow, will allow for accurate placement and monitoring of degradation over time. With our design, we hypothesize that these stents will be Visible under MR, aiding in ICMR deployment guidance and result in successful vessel expansion and remodeling over time with minimal to no thrombosis. To successfully complete this work, we propose the following aims. In the first aim, we will develop the MR visible bioresorbable stents. This includes fabricating the bioresorbable stent, examining its biodegradability and morphological properties over time using electron microscopy and mechanical testing. We anticipate that the bioresorbable stent will possess the mechanical properties comparable to conventional metallic stents, possess no defects upon expansion that could lead to device failure, and prove fully biodegradable within the desired timeframe. In aim two, we hope to deploy the MR visible bioresorbable stent in pigs. 
bioresorbable stent will be implanted in pigs via ICMR. Arterial flow and visibility of the stent will be examined at different time courses over a course of three months. Um, following, at the end of the experiment, SEM will be used to examine morphology at different time points, as well as histological evaluation to make sure that there were no adverse effects. We anticipate that the bioresorbable stent will undergo successful deployment in vivo, will be long lasting in vivo and demonstrate no signs of adverse effects. In conclusion, there are no bioresorbable stents approved clinically. No MR visible bioresorbable stents have been explored nor preclinically or clinically. This application stands to impact many lives, particularly those of pediatric patients. We believe that implementing ICMR through bioresorbable stents will create a paradigm shift in the field of pediatric and congenital interventional cardiology. I would like to acknowledge our lab members, as well as our collaborators at the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, in particular, Dr. Chun Lin and Dr. Deepan Shah. And I would also like to thank the generous funding George and Angelina Costas Research Center for Cardiovascular Nanomedicine. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure and uh, my honor to present my work at this Costa Foundation meeting. My name is Long Hong Fang, and I'm from the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration. The title of my talk today is targeting SIBP2 regulated angiogenesis to combat peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial disease, known as PAD, is a debilitating disease affecting 10 to 12 million US people. And the symptom of PAD uh, includes shining skin, leg numbness or weakness, and sores on the uh, extremity limbs. The underlying cause of PAD is atherosclerosis, the formation of the atherosclerotic plaque in the artery, and showing here is the atherosclerosis plaque. Now, surgical intervention can remove the arterial blockage. However, the surrounding micro, microvascular density is reduced, and also known as purification, perfection. It is postulated that increasing angiogenesis will increase microvascular density and increase blood perfusion to the ischemic region, thereby facilitating the recovery from PAD. You can think of angiogenesis in PAD as the process of moving a car in a traffic jam. You can add more power or reduce brake. In the case of angiogenesis, add more power means giving more pro-angiogenic component. While reduce break means reducing anti-angiogenic components. But adding more anti-angiogenic activators are difficult to control. And sometimes they elicit non-specific effects such as vascular leakage. So we propose an alternative strategy that is remove angiogenic inhibitors. And both of these two processes are expected to increase angiogenesis. Our pilot studies reveal uh, angiogenic inhibitors, SIPP2. SIPP2 is originally identified as a master transcription factor controlling classical biosynthesis. Here, we focus on its role in angiogenesis. Loss of function studies shows that SIBP2 deficiency increases angiogenesis in the zebrafish trunk. And it also increases angiogenesis in another vascular bed that is subintestinal vein. And showing here is quantitative data. In addition to zebrafish, we also use the mouse in the brain angiogenesis model to assess the role of SIBP2 in angiogenesis. Showing here is the 
vascular growth at embryonic stage 9.75 to 10.5 stage. Here you can appreciate that SIPP2 deficiency increased the vascular density as shown by the CD31 staining. As shown here is a quantitative data. Thus, by using both zebrafish and mouse animal models, our studies illustrate an uh, evolutionarily conserved role of SIPP2 in the regulation of angiogenesis. We then created an endothelial cell specific SIPP2 knockout mice and subjected these mice to hemium ischemic surgery. This is a preclinical model to human PAD study. Showing here is a laser Doppler measurement of blood flow, and the blue indicates ischemia, the wounded limb, and the red indicates good perfusion. And here you can appreciate the, that loss of SIBP2 in endothelial cells promotes the recovery of the recovery of blood flow in the ischemic limb seven days after surgery. And here is a temporal measurement and a quantification of blood flow in this wounded limb. Thus, our genetic studies show that loss of SIBP2 can increase angiogenesis. And this study suggests uh, the poten potential usage of targeting SIBP2 for the treatment of PAD. Does SIBP2 signaling regulates human PAD? As I mentioned earlier, SIBP2 is a transcription factor that regulates lipid biosynthesis. So we set the downstream, downstream gene expression. Indeed, some of the downstream genes are upregulated in this human PAD muscle. And we also isolate the endothelial cells from the muscle tissue. And here the data shows that the successful enrichment of endothelial cells. Importantly, the SIPP2 regulated lipid biosynthesis genes is uh, also upregulated in the endothelial cells isolated from the ischemic muscle compared with the non ischemic muscle. And compared to other therapies that promote angiogenesis, a unique advantage of our proposed treatment is that SIPP2 inhibition also reduces atherosclerosis, the root cause of PAD. And note that SIPP2 inhibition also lowers plasma total cholesterol levels and total triglycerides. They are the driver for atherosclerosis. So, in collaboration with Dr. Xue Wu Liu at the nanomedicine department, we propose a two stage microparticle mediated SIPP2 SIA delivery. Now, there is often heightened inflammation in the ischemic region. So, we engineered a microparticles that binds the inflamed endothelium, where the nanoparticles will be released and is expected to be taken up by endothelial cells. And the SNA will knock down SIPP2 expression, which will result in, will result in uh, accelerated angiogenesis and improved perfusion and tissue recovery. I would like to thank Jim Minno, Serbi, and uh, Pindai in my lab, and Dr. Rahimi for providing the human PD tissue, and Dr. Pono and Dr. Cook for helpful discussions. Thank you all for your attention. Hello, I'd like to introduce to you today our strategic project entitled Non Therapeutic Radiation Induced Vascular Injury. This project is based on the expertise of the multidisciplinary teams of PIs and key personnel uh, with expertise in RNA design, cardiovascular diseases, dermatology, pharmaceutical science, and nanomedicine. 
Uh, radiation is a common therapy in cancer patients, and in fact, in some cancer, up to 80% and total of 4 million people in the U.S. only of cancer survivors receive radiation therapy. However, gamma radiation can cause significant injury to the vasculature, which is based on several mechanisms, including DNA uh, double uh, strand breaks, uh, production of reactive oxygen species and inflammatory cytokines, dysregulation of cell adhesion and coagulation uh, processes. This leads to apoptosis and senescence in the vascular endothelia and the vascular stem cells. And all together, this process leads on the tissue level to endothelial aging, vascular degeneration, fibrosis, and uh, ultimately to the following pathologies, cutaneous radiation injury, stroke, ischemic heart disease, and cirrhosis. In this proposal, we'll focus on the cutaneous radiation injury since this is the more accessible for study and treatment vasculature. And additionally, the pathobiology of radiation-induced skin injury is well characterized. I would like to talk about our hypothesis. So telomeres are physical ends of the chromosomes that are composed of tandemly repeated G-rich DNA sequences. And during the aging um, or several pathological states, uh, there is a shortening of telomeres that has been implicated in cell cycle arrest senescence and uh, cellular mortality. In order to circumvent this crisis, telomerase or ribonucleoprotein uh, complex actually repairs uh, telomere repeats to the ends of the chromosomes. And uh, the H or the human telomerase reverse transcriptase is the catalytic unit, subunit of this complex and the rate limiting steps in the activation of the telomerase. So h third also has other uh, non-canonical functions that affect uh, ROS and inflammatory pathways. And with this, this project, we hypothesize gamma radiation causes shortening of the telomeres in thermal endothelium, and we can prevent or minimize this radiation-induced injury um, by introducing mRNA encoding for h third and encapsulated in the nanopod. The investigated hypothesis will propose the following specific aims. The first one is to assess the expression and biological activity of h third mRNA encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles and delivered into human skin explants by microneedling. Um, this will be done in those ranging studies. Um, we will assess the expression of telomerase by Western analysis, the immunochemistry, and uh, also uh, QFISH. And we will uh, uh, assess also the functional effects of uh, telomerase expression using trophies. In the second aim, we'll assess the efficacy of the H3 mRNA LMPs to attenuate that radiation injury. And in this case, the expanse will be treated with uh, increasing doses of gamma radiation. And after needling, uh, we will check uh, how the uh, H3 mRNA LMPs can prevent the uh, radiation induced damage using immunohistochemistry, uh, PCR for markers of DNA damage, and vascular injury. Uh, we have collected uh, um, a lot of uh, preliminary data. So the feasibility of our project relies on that. First, we have shown that the radiation induces double uh, strand DNA breaks. Um, and uh, this can be seen in gamma H2AX uh, staining in green in cells in vitro and in nuclear morphology. H3 mRNA treatment can revert this process and prevent the DNA break. We have also previously documented that treatment with H3 mRNA can revert uh, senescence in various cells, including fibroblasts, as you can see on the left, uh, keratinocytes and others. Um, on the right are the endothelial cells and isolated from Hutchison uh, Glyphod progeria syndrome patients. HGPS uh, is characterized by lack of telomerase, causing an accelerated aging. It can be seen that uh, in these cells, endothelial cells treated with H3 regain their proliferative capacity. Additionally, we have designed multiple LMPs with H3 uh, mRNA that will 
who will test throughout the study to optimize the therapy. The LNTs were created with various lipids and had a great encapsulation efficiency of more than 90% and very low polydispersity. So uh, point one showing that they're very homogeneous. Uh, we have also established a model of human skin explants that will be uh, used in this study. Uh, we will use a macroneedling device, uh, Dr. Pen, in order to overcome the permeation of upper skin layer stratum corneum, which is a very um, a hard barrier to overcome. And we have tested this approach with fluorously ducked uh, LMPs and GFP expressing mRNA and found that protein is uh, the GFP protein is efficiently expressed in the viable skin layers as a result of this um, strategy. So in terms of uh, our expectations, we uh, expected results. We expect that radiation will reduce the skin injury and we would be able to prevent inflammation, DNA damage, and other factors using h 3 mRNA LMPs. Um, moreover, in terms of the translational development plan, uh, in HMRI, we always have the patients in mind, and we know that we will be able to translate the results of the study, if successful, using the CGMP production facility and the GLP studies unit in the institute. We also strongly believe that the results of the study will enable us to generate subsequent funding using two pathways. One is translational, um, the translational research initiative that is, uh, we have in the Institute as all, um, and uh, also corporate partners such as Avita Medical and Mechanistic um, NIH, uh, DOD and Foundation grants. And um, uh, last but not least, I would like to thank you for kind attention and would like to express our appreciation and special thanks to the Costas family for their continuous support in the field of uh, cardiovascular nanomedicine. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dan Anderson. Um, and he is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, the Harvard MIT Division of Health Science and Technology at the MIT. Um, the research done in Professor Anderson's lab is focused on fundamentally developing new materials for medicine. And his work has led to advances in a range of areas, including medical devices, cell therapies, drug delivery, gene therapies, material science, among others. Uh, Professor Anderson received a BA in mathematics and biology from UC, Cal UC Santa Cruz, and then as PhD in molecular genetics from UC uh, at Davis. His work has resulted in the po over 450 papers, multiple patents and pa patent applications. And these advances uh, <clears throat> have led to products that have been commercialized or are in clinical development, um, as well as the foundation of multiple companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, and also in the consumer product space. Uh, Dr. Anderson is the founder of Living Proof and Olivia Labs, CRISPR Therapeutics, Sigillin uh, Therapeutics, Verisau Therapeutics, and Orna therapy, RNA Therapeutics, which I'm very familiar with, uh, Vaser RX, and others. Uh, without any further ado, here is Dr. Dan Anderson. Thank you so much. So let me get started. I'd like to talk about our work in uh, nucleic acid delivery and genome editing. And, you know, I thought uh, for this audience, it may be helpful to give a little bit of a background of the history of this field and where I think it's going. So first of all, it's an interesting time in the field. And I think there's no question that uh, people recognize the value of intracellular delivery of nucleic acids. And fundamentally, the real question is not, not whether or not nucleic acids have therapeutic potential, but rather how do we get these inside of the cells that we're trying to treat therapeutically? And you know what's really interesting to me is that now this has gone from a niche academic project to a situation where the vast majority of people in the audiences that I'm speaking to have actually had an RNA nanoparticle in the form of an mRNA vaccine for COVID. I personally have now had five shots. So, um, but I think what's less well known in in the fields is that you know these 
technologies did not appear overnight. In fact, they reflect decades of work by a lot of really smart people. And in particular, there's some really interesting stories about the development of small RNA nanoparticles and how that led to some of the vaccines that we use today. So I thought I might start off with a little bit of a historical perspective. And again, first, just for background, the Nobel Prize in uh, 2006 was awarded for the uh, discovery and characterization of RNA interference. And this is a fundamental pathway present in all of our cells, whereby small double-stranded RNA can, um, can induce specific silencing of a messenger RNA that's complementary um, through an endogenous enzyme system. And so, you know, this is really a fundamental mechanism whereby small RNAs can essentially turn genes off in our bodies. And it wasn't long after discovery of, of this pathway that scientists and doctors and, and investors realized that if we could just get small RNAs inside of cells, there was the potential to turn off essentially any gene that we wanted. And so my colleague, Phil Sharp, has coined the term modular pharmacology for this dream of essentially having one drug where just by changing the sequence of the nucleic acids, you can, uh, in essence, affect any genetic pathway. And so again, the, the fundamental challenge here was not the biology of RNA interference, it was really delivery. And when we conceptualize the challenges to delivery, it's really a, a multi-step challenging process. So we first envision creating a nanoparticle that is containing these nucleic acids. That nanoparticle has to travel through the body to reach our target tissue. So for example, if we inject it in the blood, travels through the blood, reaches the organ of interest, needs to leave the bloodstream and actually enter those target cells typically through a process of endocytosis. But once inside um, the cell, it's typically also inside an endosome. And so it needs to escape that endosome. Uh, the nanoparticles need to decomplex to release their payloads. And in the case of genome editing um, and some other uh, therapies, we need to also get these payloads into the nucleus. And so it's a multi-step challenging problem, uh, but there's been a lot of progress. And I think where, where we saw progress initially, was that certain organs naturally are destinations for injected nanoparticles. So uh, for example, organs like the liver and the spleen, the kidneys con sort of constantly filtering the blood and really across many different types of chemistries, nanoparticles injected in the blood will often end up in these organs. And so tissue accumulation really isn't the same as getting functional therapeutic delivery, but in, in essence, it really is the first step. You need your nanoparticles to reach the organs. And you know, fundamentally, nucleic acids are just not good drugs. Um, they're large molecules compared to most conventional small molecules. They're highly charged. They do not normally cross cellular membranes. They're prone to degradation, and they can also induce nonspecific immune responses through pattern recognition receptors. But of course, we've seen progress. And then first, um, from my perspective, these are really three of the keys to making nucleic acid drugs. The first is sequence selection. So a lot has been learned about how we can uh, use algorithms to find potent and specific RNAs. So whether that's an RNA, small RNA um, for turning genes off or a large RNA for messenger RNA encoding COVID vaccines, for example, a lot has been learned about how you design these and make potent and specific structures. The second is chemical modification, actually changing the chemistry of the nucleic acid so that it has drug-like properties. It has resistance to nucleases, it can reduce these immune effects, and also in some cases, you can actually facilitate delivery directly through, through chemistry. And then finally, encapsulation, which is where I'm gonna spend most of the time talking. The idea is to create a nanoparticle um, that can serve to traffic those nucleic acids to uh, the part of the body you're trying to reach. And so a fundamental question, if you're going to build an RNA delivery particle, is what do you build it out of? And, you know, this is, if you look at the vast majority of RNA delivery nanoparticles today, you will find um, that the majority of them are composed of four different lipids. And so your canonical formulation has RNA, of course. Um, it will have these four lipids. First and foremost is what we call the ionizable amine-containing lipid. That's what's shown in the upper right corner. This is one example of a ionizable lipid from my lab. Um, but they also contain uh, polyethylene glycol lipids, um, helper lipids like DSPC, uh, phospholipids, or cholesterol. These all serve structural purposes and, and various delivery purposes. But in particular, what's been found is that the ionizable lipid plays a key role in the potency, in the toxicity, in the tissue tropism. And so this has really been a focus of efforts for many of us trying to develop drugs with these nanoparticles. So these can, through controlled mixing, be, be formulated into nanoparticles on the order of around 100 nanometers or less. 
And when I first started this work, um, I was naturally inspired by all of the great work that had come before me. And of course, you know, at that time, people had been working for quite a while with cationic lipids. And so I've shown here some of the structures of lipids that existed when I first started thinking about delivery materials. And what I noticed is that, you know, the chemical diversity of the materials that had been tried at that time was just not that large. For example, DOTMA, the lipid shown here in the upper left is a lipid from the 1980s, actually, one of the earlier uh, uh, delivery lipids. Dilin DMA was published in Nature, I believe, around 2006 by Proteva as one of the first uh, sRNA delivery lipids. And, you know, the difference between those two is really only by a few atoms. And that's not to take away from the importance of this DLIN DMA lipid, but rather just to say that, you know, at that time, the chemical diversity had not really been fully explored. And so the, the first question is really a chemistry question. How do we make libraries of materials that have potential as delivery agents? And I'm not going to um, bore you with a whole lot of chemistry, but just to give you one example reaction. This is what's called a Michael, Michael type addition between an an acrylate and an amine. And it's a very simple reaction that you can do combinatorially. You just add heat in a stir bar and you end up with structures like this. So you'll notice there's the amine, there are tails and R1 groups here, there are esters that can degrade. And if we compare that structure to a conventional cationic lipid, you'll notice uh, certain similarities. And so we've gone on to make thousands of different materials using chemistries like this and other chemistries and then developed high throughput screening methods to identify those formulations that have uh, useful potential as RNA delivery systems. So really one of the uh, early examples of the use of uh, sRNA as a drug was for the treatment of a disease called transthyretin mediated amyloidosis. And so this is a, um, a protein that um, can be misfolded in patients with certain genetic um, abnormalities, and this can lead to the formation of amyloids. And those amyloids can travel throughout the body and in particular lead to damage in the nerve and also in the heart. And unfortunately, after diagnosis of the um, severe cases of this, uh, the life expectancy tends to be short. But you know, prior to work on nanomedicine, really the only um, high quality treatment uh, was a liver transplant for these patients. But it is possible to make a lipid nanoparticle that can specifically turn this TTR gene off in the liver. And so here's an example of an early experiment we did where we had an sRNA targeting this TTR gene. We have our four different uh, lipids, in particular the amine-containing lipid from my group. We inject a monkey and then we look at the liver. And what we can see in this uh, older experiment um, was that we could get very potent silencing um, after a single injection in the liver. So what you're looking at is silencing of the TTR gene, um, uh, over 90% silencing specific to the liver. Um, and even at the lowest doses tested of RNA, we're seeing very nice silencing. And so one of the interesting discoveries at that time was that this was actually easier to do than we had thought. So uh, we've created many lipids that can do this in, in rodents. We've created um, at least three that have shown to be able to do this in primates. And uh, at that time, then companies started also working to develop these materials. And in 2014, Al Nylum re reported the first human delivery of a lipid nanoparticle with sRNA for the treatment of this disease. And what you're looking at is a sustained knockdown of this TTR gene in patients. After a single injection, it's knocked down 80%. And through repeat administration, it can be maintained indefinitely. And so this led to the first uh, FDA-approved sRNA, uh, sorry, RNA lipid nanoparticle in 2018. Um, and so I think the important point is that when you look compositionally at, uh, for example, the Moderna vaccine, you'll notice that three of the four components in the uh, approved Moderna vaccine are the same as those that were in the Al Nylum vaccine. And that's not to take away from all of the innovation and hard work that Moderna did to get us these vaccines, but just to show you that, you know, this technology did not appear out of thin air and really reflects a lot of work um, that had been done over the years. So. Um, what I want to talk a bit about is where I see these types of delivery systems going. And first of all, I think uh, nanoparticle-mediated RNA is not going to be limited to uh, vaccines or to the liver. Um, it's also not going to be limited to lipid nanoparticles. And so another class of polymer with a long history, uh, but has certainly uh, recently not been as much of a focus of the field, are the polymer uh, delivery uh, nanoparticles. 
And so polymer nanoparticles for delivering RNA uh, compositionally, instead of having an amine-containing lipid, they will have a biodegradable amine-containing polymer. Um, and on top of this, sometimes we will add these helper lipids or polyethylene glycol lipids to facilitate stability and additional function. Um, these, like the lipids, can be complexed with RNA uh, to make very small nanoparticles on the order uh, in our hands from 30 nanometers to 100 nanometers. And importantly, they can deliver RNA in vivo. And so here's an example of an experiment where we delivered five different siRNA um, uh, targets in a single formulation to a mouse. And the reason I chose to share this um, because of the focus of this conference is this is delivering to the endothelium in particular of the lung, but of also, also to other tissues. So in this experiment, we have these five different siRNAs. We do a single injection in the, in the mouse, and then we look at silencing of these five gene targets with decreasing amounts of total RNA. Uh, and so this is 1.5 megs per keg, and then we decrease down to 0.25. So uh, what we see is good silencing of all five of these targets, Ty1, Ty Ty2, VEGF, R2, VE, Cadherin, and ICAM2. And um, we went on to show that we could also use this um, nanoparticle in primates we published in 2018. And so there are really two take home messages uh, that I wanted to deliver here. First, um, polymer nanoparticles can deliver RNA in vivo to important tissues. And second, um, it's not just the liver or a vaccine. You can infect it other tissues that are of importance like the endothelium. So there are other targets um, uh, that, that uh, we're interested in. And in fact, there's a growing list of cells in the immune system that we think are accessible with RNA nanoparticles. And really, when you look at, at the field, the earliest nanoparticles that uh, we could hit were the uh, uh, peripheral blood leukocytes, like macrophages and monocytes and dendritic cells. So here's an early experiment where we took an siRNA targeting the gene CD45. We make our nanoparticle, inject a primate, and then take peripheral blood. And what we could see was um, using the uh, the CD45 siRNA versus a control phrase, we could get 65% of those uh, cells showing substantial knockdown. And we've gone on to publish um, a number of papers in which uh, we use this to uh, treat disease models um, in rodents. More recently, um, you know, we've become intrigued by the possibility that we may be able to deliver to hematopoietic stem cells. So can we can we actually hit these stem cells that go on to make all of the components of the, the blood system, um, both uh, red blood cells and all of the different immune cells? And so the goal is really to hit these self-replicating long-term hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and so here's some recent unpublished data where we've finally developed a nanoparticle that can deliver RNA to these cells. And so first, what you're looking at here is, is just delivery of labeled RNA to uh, hematopoietic uh, LSK cells in the bone marrow. And what you're looking at here is just with the labeled RNA, you can see with two different formulations, in particular this one, we get 80% of the, the cells have become now associated with um, uh, labeled siRNA. Um, importantly, uh, we're actually seeing knockdown. So when we use an siRNA targeting CD45 with these new nanoparticles, we can get about 60% of the cells showing good silencing in vivo after a single injection. And this is importantly for those that work on these cells, this is not after mobilization. These are um, cells that uh, have not been mobilized. They're still resident in the bone marrow. So <clears throat> I've talked so far in particular about siRNA, but of course, Really, the other half of, of, of gene therapy, in my mind, is not turning genes off. It's turning genes on or delivering new genes. And of course, today, many of us are focused on messenger RNA for that. Um, when you think about um, the delivery challenges, sRNA, as I mentioned, is very large on a drug scale. Um, but there are a lot of tools that we have to make it a total synthesis, you know, do total synthesis at pharmaceutical scale. And while it's big in comparison to messenger RNA, it's actually relatively small. Messenger RNA is enormous. Um, we have less tools to make chemical modifications. And on top of that, it's largely single-stranded, so it's even more susceptible to nucleases. But um, we've seen progress. And here is an example of a messenger RNA delivery system to these long-term hematopoietic stem cells in mice. And so again, what we're looking at is, a, a, in this case, it's a messenger RNA targeting um, a, a encoding for Cree recombinase. 
And we use a mouse that has a lock stop locks code on um, for the uh, TD tomato. So basically, if you successfully deliver Cree or Combinase, you get an editing event that causes per, uh, activation of this uh, TD tomato gene. So it's a nice sensitive way of, of assaying whether or not we're getting functional delivery to cells. So here we uh, delivered uh, with our hematopoietic stem cell targeted nanoparticle in the tail vein of mice. We come back 72 hours um, and in the hematopoietic stem cell, uh, we're, we're seeing actually conversion of 94% of these cells in the bone marrow. And even more importantly for the long-term um, uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, we're getting 90% conversion. So we're excited by the potential of, of hematopoietic stem cell delivery, both uh, with uh, messenger RNA and also with siRNA. Um, one of the uh, other things that we've shown is that it's possible to target nanoparticles to certain tissues, not through the incorporation of antibodies and ligands, but actually just by changing the chemistry. And so here is, a, is an experiment where we take the messenger RNA encoding luciferase, and we use a nanoparticle that's a polymer nanoparticle that targets um, the lung endothelium, and another uh, particle uh, that's targeting the hepatocytes in the liver. And the same messenger RNA, we inject different mice at the same dose. And you'll notice that with nanoparticle one, you're getting good expression in the lungs of these mice. Um, but with nanoparticle two, you're not getting expression in the lungs. And then when you ask the converse question about the liver, the lung delivery system does not deliver to the liver and the liver system does. And so again, to me, this is a nice visual example of how you can actually target delivery to certain tissues just by changing the chemistry of the nanoparticle. Um, you know, injection IV uh, is not the only way to give nanoparticles for systemic administration. Another interesting way is actually to nebulize them. So creating a mist of uh, nanoparticles that can be in inhaled. And so uh, in this case, we're actually making polymer mRNA nanoparticles that are subjected to a vibrating mesh. This creates water droplets of around three to five microns. These can then be breathed in by mice. And what we show uh, in this earlier publication is that we could get nice delivery to the lung epithelium. And also uh, more recently, we can hit some of the lower um, cell types that are associated with um, replication. Um, but the delivery really is targeted to lung. So here it's again, firefly luciferase. When you look at the kidneys, the liver, the spleen, you're seeing no signal at all. It's really only in the lung where we see expression. Finally, <clears throat> you know, what actually brought me to MIT a long time ago, now 1999, was this dream of being able to do genome editing. I, you know, we didn't actually use, or at least I didn't use that term at the time, but can you actually make nanoparticles that can repair your DNA while you're still using it? And so if we envision, for example, a liver uh, uh, with disease, that's why I've drawn this liver in green, can we inject nanoparticles that deliver a genome editing tool set specifically to those cells? It will create an editing event that will repair it, and that uh, repair is now reflected in a healthy organ. And while this sounds like science fiction, there's now more and more evidence that this is going to be possible in humans with uh, nanoparticles. And so there are today a lot of different exciting flavors of genome editing. I'm going to talk about one of the oldest, not oldest, uh, the oldest CRISPR-Cas9 approach, um, which we call indel formation. And fundamentally, the way these things work is you want to take an advantage of the endogenous DNA repair pathways that we have in all of our cells um, and trick them essentially to creating a therapeutic editing event. And so specifically what we're doing is we're delivering the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So this is an enzyme that can be uh, targeted specifically to certain regions of double-stranded DNA through the incorporation of a guide RNA. And so <clears throat> the idea is to deliver this molecule, create a specific double-stranded DNA break and that double-stranded DNA break then leads to a therapeutic editing event. And so I'm focusing in particular on the left side of the screen, which is we're delivering this Cas9 enzyme. It's targeted by the guide RNA, creates a double-stranded DNA break. And if that break is um, reconnected, you've now created an, an, a, another site that can be cleaved again. But sometimes what will happen after a double-stranded break is there will be small amounts of editing that cause uh, after ligation, what's called an indel mutation. 
So this can lead to frame shift mutations and ultimately um, stop codons. And so here, in order to get this to work, we want to deliver the Cas9 inside of cells. So in this case, we're delivering it with messenger RNA. And we want to deliver the guide RNA, but it was not really clear when we first started this work what we needed to do to deliver that guide RNA into these same cells. So at that time, um, again, we looked at the literature and a lot of um, important work had been done on changing the chemistry of small RNAs to facilitate their delivery. And uh, there's a whole lot of uh, old great work here, in particular by companies like Ionis. But um, a couple chemical modifications in particular stand out, which are the two primo methyls, the phosphorothioates, and also two prime fluoros. And, and really those in particular have shown to be very helpful in creating therapeutic RNA molecules. Um, but the question was really, if we're gonna start to introduce chemistry into this guide RNA, where do we do it? It's a large molecule with many possible combinations. It was really challenging to decide where we could actually make the changes and retain function. And so luckily at that time, the crystal structures had just been published by both Jennifer Doudna and, and Feng Zhang. Um, and so using that, we were able to make predictions about the um, regions of the guide RNA that were important for interacting with the Cas9 molecule and the regions of the RNA that we could safely modify, in particular, these loop regions that we recognize could be safely modified and retain function. And so we went on to do this and show that we could substantially increase performance of in vivo genome editing by chemically modifying um, the RNA. Um, and as an example delivery system, we chose to look at PCSK9. So PCSK9 is an important target for cholesterol uh, recycling. And um, there are antibodies that you can take that will reduce your cholesterol over 50%. Uh, the problem is that you need to take these for the rest of your life. And we were wondering, could we actually edit PCSK9 and thereby um, lower cholesterol for patients with hypercholesterolemia permanently? And so we took uh, the messenger RNA encoding um, uh, Cas9, we took our two chemically modified guide RNAs when we inject a rodent and we look at liver editing and blood cholesterol levels. First of all, we see that over 80% of all the hepatocyte, I'm sorry, all of the liver genes have been mutated. So the vast majority of the liver has been, uh, PCSK9 genes have been knocked out. We, we look at serum PCSK9, it becomes undetectable. Um, and this leads to a drop in total cholesterol on the order of 35%. Um, and so there are, in fact, people looking at knocking out PCSK9 in humans, but um, more recently, people have taken the same approach and revisited this TTR gene that I first described as really the first RNA lipid nanoparticle. And so uh, a company called Intellia has discovered that you can create a, a formulation with a lipid nanoparticle with a messenger RNA encoding Cas9 chemically modified guides, um, and when injected in humans, you can actually see substantial editing in humans of the TTR gene. And this was first disclosed last year in June. They've since gone on to describe that this is persistent and looks to be permanent. And so, you know, it's really an exciting uh, description of how these genome editing events um, really can potentially be useful in humans. So in the last few minutes, I just want to describe um, other types of RNA. I think there are many types of RNA. We've already talked about small RNAs and messenger RNA, but I'm also really interested in circles. And I think I'll just provide a teaser on this. Um, so when you think about circular RNAs, actually they are fundamentally different from messenger RNA and how they are translated and how they are made. They're typically made in vivo through exon backsplicing. They're present in many different tissues in the body. Um, but before our work, it had been challenging to make these effectively. And also there was a belief that they were inherently immunogenic. And so we went on to show first that it was possible to make these through a, uh, a cell splicing system efficiently um, and at low cost. Also, we showed that if you purify these appropriately, they can be non-immunostimulatory. And so far that continues to be true. And importantly, they have advantages in terms of the duration of expression. And so this is early published data where we showed that circular RNAs can now extend the amount of protein that you're getting uh, from a single transfection event um, because the lack of ends creates uh, resistance to nuclease. Um, we've since gone on to form a company called Orna, 
And in particular, what Orna has been looking at is the ability of these um, circular RNAs to work in T cells. And so they've described publicly that we've been able to identify circles that can express at much higher levels than what we see with linear RNA. And the goal uh, ultimately will be to perform an in vivo CAR T type therapy. Um, more recently, they described that they uh, have partnered up with Merck um, to work on vaccines, among other things. And I think it's really just an exciting moment in the field where people are recognizing the value of messenger RNA, but also RNA more broadly and, uh, and, and therapeutic use in many areas. So with that, I need to thank a lot of really smart people I've had the pleasure of working with in particular, uh, Bob Langer, who I've worked with for many years, um, uh, friends at Al Nylum and Translate Bio, which is now Santa Fe, my collaborators at Orna, um, and also in particular, a lot of great postdocs at MIT over the years. Um, I should think in particular, Hao Yin, who did a lot of the genome editing work, um, and uh, uh, Dennis Shi, who uh, has developed these new um, hematopoietic stem cell targeting agents. So with that, I'll, I'll end and take any questions. Thank you. Hello there, and welcome back. That was a fantastic presentation. It lived up to everything that I was expecting and gave me a lot more. Um, <clears throat> once again, uh, there's uh, use the pollev.com app to actually ask questions. But uh, Dan, I will ask you the first one, first question. So with ornotherapeutics, obviously it's a circular RNA. There are a lot of a lot of things coming down the pike with the mechanism of doing the circles. Um, do you can you share the next thing that they're doing besides CAR T? Well, you know, I think there were disclosures that, you know, there, there's interest in vaccines, among other things. Um, but, you know, we really do see this as a platform technology and there may be um, substantial, but I mean, so first of all, there are clear benefits on uh, the ease of manufacture and the cost of RNA compared to uh, conventional uh, mod RNA, maybe on the order of 10% uh, the cost, total cost to make these things. Um, they appear to have better function in many tissues. And so we've talked publicly about uh, T cells and vaccines, but I believe there are others where we're, we're also going to be able to uh, show advantages. All right, that sounds great. And my other question was the tissue specificity that you were able to obtain just by changing the composition of your lipid nanoparticles was simply stunning. Uh, it, do you think that you've shown that you could target several distinct tissue types? Do you think that Essentially, when it comes down to it, there'll be chemistry to target just about every single cell type in the human body. No, I don't think that. <laughs> I think I think um, I think uh, uh, you know there are examples. Really, the best characterized system is the liver, where people have shown the importance of ApoE and interacting with the ApoE receptor. Um, people have also retargeted nanoparticles to the liver by adding certain sugar ligands. Um, I think there will be other tissues where just by tinkering with chemistry, um, you can affect those tissues. But ultimately, you know, I think um, uh, specific ligands are going to be important to, to reach the broadest range of tissue targets that we're interested in. Well, I want to thank uh, Dan Anderson for a spectacular talk, and uh, he's a real leader in the field. Uh, Dan, it was great to have you here uh, with us today uh, at our conference here in the Texas Medical Center, and hope to see you again soon. Uh, thanks for your leadership in the field. Uh, we're going to move on now to uh, our next event, what everyone's been waiting for, the Shark Tank. And yes, we are going to have a little fun with this, but it does serve a serious purpose because here at Houston Methodist, we do want to see our fundamental insights get translated into something that's transformative for patient care. And uh, so this, um, uh, this little program we have now, Shark Tank, we're going to have uh, three teams that have been selected uh, for, this, for their, uh, their science and the, the feasibility of their ideas. Uh, they're going to try to convince the, the sharks that uh, they have uh, something that is uh, potentially useful uh, for humanity. And uh, we'll see what the sharks think about that.
Welcome everybody to the Shark Tank session of today's program. Morning. I'm Alessandro Grattoni. I'm the chair and professor of the Department of Nanomedicine at Houston Methodist Research Institute. I would like to introduce to you our fellow shark, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeremy Willows, uh, that is an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Mr. Chris Lincoln, Dr. Chris Lincoln, my apologies, <laughs> who is the, the Director of Translational uh, Production and Quality at Houston Methodist, and um, Belisa Diaz, Dr. Belisa Diaz, my apologies once again, who is the <laughs> Senior Licensing Associate from the Office of Technology Transfer at Houston Methodist. So uh, today we have the presentation of three teams and the first team will be the team of Dr. Biana Godin and Dr. Kuran Nazir, who will present their project of anti-PCSK9 mRNA therapeutics that protect against hypercholesterolemia and cardiovascular disease. Hello, Sharks. I am Biana Godin. And I am Christina Chris. And today we are here to talk to you about our revolutionary product, Nanocol. Everyone knows somebody who suffers from high cholesterol, which increases the risk of heart disease. So our nanocol is a nano-empowered mRNA for therapy of familial hypercholesterolemia and cardiovascular disease. So FH or familial hypercholesterolemia is the most abundant genetic disease in the world. Uh, every one in 200 people are affected by this disease, and the most frequent genetic defects are in low-density lipoprotein receptor and PCSK9 metabolism. As a result, there is an impaired cholesterol metabolism in the liver and the elevated cholesterol uh, levels in the blood, which leads to the cardiovascular diseases early in life. Uh, in fact, if untreated, FH uh, can cause heart attack in 50% of males by the age of 50 and 30% of females by the age of 60. But treating FH can reduce the risk of CVD by 80%. So as I mentioned, our target population is huge because this is really one to 200 in the world are affected by this disease. Uh, which makes about 34 million people. And in the US only, we're talking about more than 1 million people, uh, which potentially can use our innovative therapy. When taking a look at our competitors, our therapy is a combination therapy that uses mRNA to make more LDL receptors and also makes an antibody to target PCSK9. No other therapy on the market uses this approach. Parulent and Rapata are PCSK9 antibodies. These proteins are expensive to make and must be administered biweekly to monthly for maintenance. And Scalarin uses gene silencing to reduce the amount of free PCSK9 in the liver, but it's also been found to have many off-target effects, which can be problematic in normal homeostasis. Our product will be the only available mRNA on the market that can target both PCSK9 as well as increase the amount of LDL receptor abundance in the liver. Nanocoal is easy to manufacture, it's cost efficient, and we anticipate a dose of around 500 micrograms per injection. We estimate injections will only have to be administered every few months and have low side effects, similar to those observed with the COVID-19 vaccine. When comparing the market value of our product, Nanocoal, to our competitors, combined our competitors make around $1 billion in revenue annually. We estimate our product to cost around 100 million to develop. And when we take into account the cost to manufacture, which is around $3 a dose, and the sales price of around $450 a dose, that brings our annual revenue to around 600 million per year or 150 million per quarter. This makes our combination therapy highly competitive when looking at our competition. We have already established strong scientific data that our mRNA therapy works in hepatocytes, which are the target cells that make up the liver. We have previously demonstrated that we can decrease the amount of PCSK9 and increase the amount of LDL receptors following treatment by nanocold. As a result, we can show that our drug effectively increases LDL uptake following treatment. Furthermore, we have previously optimized mRNA encapsulation with lipid nanoparticles in order for uptake 
and expression of the mRNA in the liver. And since LMP is typically sequestered to the liver for processing, we do not anticipate any hurdles within our delivery system. As we have demonstrated in the previous slide, we are already on our roadmap to the clinic. We have successfully completed the first three milestones and are planning to use your funding to begin GMP processing in our GLP preclinical animal studies. We will need these for our IND submission. And of course, uh, no product can be uh, left alone and uh, we have a multidisciplinary team of experts in all the aspects of the technology, including nanomedicine, cardiovascular disease, mRNA design and production that support this product. So I, we hope that uh, you are now convinced that Nanocol will be a game changer in the therapy of FH, improving prognosis and lowering the risk of CVD. With, With Nanocol, you, you will never, never miss a beat. Thank you, Shards. We're ready for your question now. Well, Dr. Godin and Dr. Nasir, uh, thank you for presenting your project. I have a question for you. And you have presented a plan of about 12 months of execution. And uh, the question is, while we all hope that for your project to be successful, what would be your backup plan in the case your uh, mRNA antibody uh, fails in efficacy as compared to the control, the statin alone? So first of all, in our case, we're using a double approach, right? So we are creating a construct that actually has two parts. And this is our innovation and what differentiates us from the other competitors in the field. Uh, we are targeting two mechanisms in the FH, in the familial hypochlorosterolemia. One is PCSK9, and the second one is LDLR receptor. And they are all on the same construct. We have already shown, as you can see from the preliminary studies that uh, were included in one very brief slide, that uh, they, we, we successfully can express this uh, uh, protein. Now, the, because we heard from multiple people today that nanoparticles naturally target the liver, mm -hmm. I don't believe that since we have the expression in hepatocytes and the nanoparticles will be going to the liver, we will have any problem. But the backup plan would be just to separate this and inject them as separate particles. So just inject them in one formulation, but two different particles combining in a different ratios if needed and uh, doing this way. Thank you. Fellow Shark. <laughs> Well, I had a question regarding the lowest statin that you're using. Sure. Have you contemplated other statins? And is the idea potentially to lower the dose once they synergize? So statins are um, commonly used as a synergistic compound in familial hypercholesterolemia. Mm -hmm. And so we have been just testing our drug in a combination therapy approach with statins, um, as well as by itself to see what the synergistic effect would be. And we did see an increase in the LDL uptake when we added the lovastatin okay. just upon our regular drug alone. Yeah, I'm just thinking the market could be larger if you look further. You can so, actually use other statins. Yes. There are more efficient statins on the market okay. right now, and uh, I mean you can use it. It's an independent approach. I think it's it's post marketing would mm -hmm. be you know the idea of clinicians how they will build the clinical trials based on you know our product in combination of, with different statins that are already there on the market. You know, Especially because they have issues, approved, correct. right? Currently, yes. okay. but the problem with L, uh, with the, this disease is most many times statins do not work. So you actually need to act on a genetic level. And that's I why see. I think mRNA therapy for that or any type of genetic therapy is actually much more beneficial than the small molecular drug. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I saw that in the brief, you, you mentioned Lovastat and you talked about synergistic effects. And so have you tested the other statins? That was my first question that came up when she was talking and seeing the same synergistic effects. And if so, why wouldn't that lead you to try to secure some IP around method of use as well as around the constructs themselves to allow you to get a little more portfolio? Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea of three dollars in, three hundred back. I mean, that's 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 <laughs> great, right? But where's the IP at right now? So we currently are working on an IP since there's already 
MR, well, there's about to be a new mRNA um, target targeting PCSK9 to going towards clinical trials. And since the protein backed um, vaccines or antibody therapies are already on the market, the IP is harder to kind of target. But since we're actually com combining these drugs with the LDLR plus the PCSK9, we're mm -hmm. going to be the working on might be there. a novelty mm -hmm. IP for that. There is no LDLR receptor so, mRNA like period on the market right now, right? So and for there is no mRNA, mRNA therapy for, for this specific disease on the market right now. The only one that is currently available is sRNA. Um, which is targeting another mechanism. Mm -hmm. But combining this two, we believe that we're getting much stronger compound and much stronger product um, that can be translated. And uh, IP, I believe it's with you really soon. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I, I have not seen it come through, okay. but um, we, we, we are hoping to get it. Yeah, sure. Because we're it working very on interesting. it. It's currently in yeah. the works. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, I, I was intrigued when you said you could treat like every few months and you think this would work in the long run. So I guess if that's true, that's really powerful. Right. Um, but I guess what, what I was curious why you, you said that as opposed to why wouldn't it have to be more frequently? Well, when the antibodies start to accumulate in the system long term and, and bind that PCSK9, so it allows more LDL receptor recycling on top of the mRNA producing more LDLR. And so we were hoping that we would get a longer term effect in the body from both of those mechanisms being targeted over just the PCSK9 therapy alone. I see. So the, the mRNA, vac uh, mRNA itself that you put in would Correct. go away quickly, but, but it kicks the off. antibodies kicks would, off the mechanism. Yeah, the yes. immune system. Yeah. So is the idea to balance the dosing based on the actual release of that antibody out of that active site? Yes. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Yes. So if you can have a wild guess, what would be the cost to patients of a treatment such as this? <laughs> we, we didn't have a wild guess. We, were, we had a very educated guess, actually. 300 to $600 yeah. with yeah. a $3 We had a very guess. educated I guess. I must have <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we actually did like a really, really good That's market good. research based on what is uh, currently, um, you know, the cost of the vaccine to the patients and based on the dose that we're proposing and uh, based on the patient population and based on the price that our competitors are charging. We're trying to mm -hmm. reduce this price while, you know, maintaining the, the cost efficiency for us, which I think is like we're talking about like 100 times as, uh, as Chris mentioned. So, yes, yeah, so I think. We're in a good range there. Yes. The protein yeah. injections run between five and six thousand dollars annually for patients, whereas the insulin that just hit the market is around thirty five hundred. Mm -hmm. So at our dose range, we're right there around three thousand dollars, but we won't have the off target effects as the siRNA based insulin. Do you foresee any issues with chronic treatment and potential toxicity? Right. So. Currently, most toxicities, and because there is an, a lot of mRNA copying and you know other things that prevent the toxicities of mRNA specifically, the toxicity of the vaccines that were reported were mainly uh, from the PEG. Now, in our case, because we target liver, we can probably reduce, minimize, or even maybe remove the pegylation of the particles. Mm because of that. So this will actually minimize significantly the toxicities that are related to the pegylation. Okay, because the pegylation initially was created to actually circumvent the liver and target to other tissues. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Have you considered comparing to other antibodies in some of the studies that are out there? Yes. That you, that you had listed, the two that are kind of more prominent in H. Once we get into animal studies, we would definitely be using those as a comparison. Okay, good, good. Uh, that'd be good to see so from a this marketing is, this standpoint. This is where we get yeah. when this the is money is coming your money in for us. Right, <laughs> of course, of course, of course. You need it in logical steps. Uh, yes. Okay. How will you uh, get your uh, partner, your uh, commercial partner, how would you attract a commercial partner to work with you? So this is a very cool question because if you've seen Thank a you. table, Thank you for that. yes, <laughs> because the, 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 in the table, the familial hypercholesterolemia is basically the market is there is like tycoons of pharmaceutical industry. Novartis, mm -hmm. Pfizer. There are like Pfizer, Novartis, yeah. you know, Moderna. all the super big names are there. And this is what I think it would be an easy pitch in terms of expanding their line of uh, products mm -hmm. with a completely new idea and innovative product that they don't have. 
-hmm. So I believe this is our kind of targeting market targeting strategy in this and do you have entry into this company is not no, we it's not very easy to enter into the world uh, well we have been we have had yeah. some yeah. communications yeah. with Pfizer yeah. um, just this past week or two so we are hoping to yeah, kind very, of continue mm -hmm. to build yeah. that relationship and what did they say um, they're interested in a few projects from our departments that we're putting out so we're really excited so what would the pivot strategy be would it be early licensing or would it well, be I think that we need first to deal with IP before yes. we go to Okay. You know, it's never too soon to think about it. Yeah. Yes, right. thinking yeah. about that, <laughs> but it's a bit too soon to approach. Let's, yeah. let's yeah, put yeah. it this way. Yeah, let's put the the strong IP in place before we we go there. Well, I tend to agree with that statement, and uh, well, I would like uh, Dr. Godin and Dr. Nasir. I would like to thank you for please. your presentation. <laughs> it's very <laughs> kind. And, uh, so you can please uh, leave the room to the next thank presenter. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. So, and with this, I will be happy to introduce the next team that will present on nano vaccine for our failure, and that will be presented by Dr. Key Yuker and Arvind Bamaraj. So heart failure remains a major cause of morbidity. It is the number one cause of hospitalization in people above the age of 65. And despite the fact that there have been new medicines, it remains a fatal condition in those patients that have progressive symptoms. And we definitely need to come up with new therapies that transform the landscape of heart failure. Hey Keith, this is a molecule that we should focus on, it's HSP60. HSP60? What do you want to do? Make a vaccine? Absolutely. Wait, I know a guy, Haifa Shin. He's created this molecule, which is a nano alum molecule. And what are we going to do with it? Well, we combine these two technologies and we'll create a nano vaccine. Is that going to work? I don't know. Let's find out. We then began a collaboration to develop a nano vaccine for heart failure. This is an idea which had never been heard of before and may offer a new option for heart failure patients. With the generosity of George and Angelina Costas and the Costas Foundation, we began a new line of discovery and innovation to further understand heart failure with a focus on targets for a vaccine. We found HSP60 intimately involved in the continuation of the chronic state of heart failure, which appears to induce a constant state of inflammation. This constant state of inflammation results in increased apoptosis and death of cardiomyocytes, which further causes increasing levels of fibrosis. The fibrosis and loss of cardiomyocytes eventually leads to decompensation of the heart. With our new vaccine in hand, we tested the nano vaccine in a mouse model of heart failure developed right here at Houston Methodist. The vaccine successfully blocked the induction of apoptosis, but more importantly, this led to decreased fibrosis and preservation of the ejection fraction of the heart. Dr. Tori, the vaccine, it works. In mice, that is fantastic. Aren't you forgetting something, guys? Mice are not humans. 
Bringing a new therapy to the clinical world involves several steps, including identification of the correct target population. Our next step is focused on this aspect. We plan to collect blood samples from patients admitted to the hospital with acute heart failure exacerbation and follow them after discharge. They will assess for the presence of free HSP-60 during hospital stay and look for development of natural antibodies against HSP-60 after discharge. Patients who get hospitalized have a poor overall prognosis and many get readmitted. With the hypothesis that patients who develop autoimmunity to HSP-60 do better, we hope to find this association and hence strengthen our paradigm by showing a protective impact of these antibodies for some patients hospitalized for an acute heart failure exacerbation. That's a great idea. Sharks, are you ready to make a deal? Dr. Yuker and Dr. Bimaraj, welcome, welcome here. We have plenty of questions for you today and uh, the, some of them will be tough, will be very tough. Well, in fact, I start with a tough one. Dr. Haifa Shen, that you pointed out, is no longer here with us in this <laughs> institute. What are you gonna do? Well, we're still continuing on with, with this work and the vaccine. Uh, he, he was the one who actually promoted the molecule which he's been using in a lot of cancer vaccines before he left here. We now have the technology here. We, we can apply it with the HSP-60 and we can continue this work. Good. Dr. Yoker, can you please speak towards the intellectual property and what, what the status of that is at the current time? So the intellectual property on, on the, this uh, vaccine, we, we've already submitted it and the, the uh, patent has already been published. So we have the, the published patent on this work with the HSP-60 and, and the nano alum. Mm -hmm. I think that, oh. I'm curious a bit um, about, so the patient population you need to get, obviously it's present right here, but what, what do you really have to get from them? Are they gonna be when they're in the hospital or do you have to follow them up? Will people want to do this? What, what's gonna be involved for them? Well, so I think the, the paradigm of immune modulation and heart failure has had a tricky past because this concept has failed when you target a particular just a molecule. So the vaccination concept is, is very promising because when patients get admitted with an acute exacerbation of heart failure, none of the therapies currently make a difference in their outcome. So hence our focus is to identify them as your first target population but you're right, after we uh, get the samples at admission, they'll have to be followed up at least for a period of a month, maybe even longer, to associate for outcomes. And the intent is that if there is immune activation that happens during that acute exacerbation, in the future we're able to temper that, you will then avoid the bad outcomes that come with it. And are these gonna be, can you take advantage of existing tests they would already be getting as patients in the afterwards, or is this gonna be extra? efforts for them? Mm -hmm. No, pretty much the outcomes and blood collection, they're all within the paradigm of clinical care. Of course, the HSP-60 mediated studies, which are going to be not just the protein, but identifying the antibodies and some of the immune, that'll be a research focus. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to identify patient population, right? Try to find the best people to treat, the best way to treat them. What's the market on this? So. The acute heart failure hospitalization is a subsegment of the chronic heart failure. And I think if you look at the acute heart failure hospitalization, you have about 1 million admissions into the, into the hospital right now uh, in the United States. It's been a big cost for the entire health system. So that'll be our first target population. The, the drug development in that area has been pretty small because people have not been able to devise a conceptual hypothesis to treat in that area. There's a lot of medications for people to be treated when you're outpatient in the clinic. So definitely the, the competition in this space is extremely small. Most of the therapies have been focused on diuresis, machines to take water out, but the immune modulation in that acute setting will be an open market in that regard. And delivery is typically 90% of the battle, mm -hmm. right? So do you have a vehicle for delivery of this vaccine? How is it gonna be delivered? How is it getting to where you need it to go? 
In this particular case, this is a vaccine. So very similar to COVID vaccine and other vaccines, it would be a one-time shot. Uh, now, as we, we've learned from the COVID and everything uh, uh, through these, these trials, that uh, RNA is being used. So we went ahead and went ahead and made the, the RNA version of the same vaccine from the protein. Fantastic. And then your brief says you're ready for commercialization. That gets me excited. I'm sure it gets you excited. What does that mean? Have you manufactured this at large scale? You already have a partner. You're ready to take this out there and bring us money back on this investment? Or what does that mean? Well, that means we already have the, the, the vaccine in hand. We have it and we're ready to go. And at least in animal models, it shows that it works. What we need to do now is we just need to identify the patient population. Now, as, as, as Dr. Bimraj mentioned, you know, going from, from the laboratory science to the clinic to actually uh, uh, vaccinating people is, is a long road. There's a mm -hmm. lot of things we have to take into consideration. You know, a lot of people have looked at this, aren't you creating an autoimmune disease? And in a sense we are because we're vaccinating for a protein that's found inside the body. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of hesitation there because of this autoimmune disease that we're actually causing. However, if you think about it, that this protein is normally found intracellularly, antibodies aren't, don't have access to that space unless the cell has released it, in which case now it's, now it's a problem and that's where the problem lies. So there is commercial interest. In, in this entity with those reservations. So I think focusing on some of the mechanisms and safety will probably open up the collaboration much more at this stage. And those are usually the questions that they come to, the toxicity and then the patient population, back to the beginning. Um, in regard to the patient population that you would treat as a preventative, as a vaccine, how are you gonna identify those people? Because with acute, you identify them. So is it gonna be by, uh, markers? risks that are associated with certain patient Well, that's one of the things we're hoping to do with, with this money when we win this competition, is that we're going to look at the, the blood samples from these patients, and hopefully we will identify some patients that already have existing HSP60 antibodies. Thereby, mm. it serves as its own safety control if those patients, and they might even be the patients that do better than the ones that don't develop an autoantibody mm. to the HSP60. Well, I like your uh, your boldness in your statement of victory, but uh, <laughs> the question that I have for you is, uh, what? how long do you expect this vaccine, a single dose of the vaccine, to be efficacious, and would it require boosters? <laughs> boosters, that's the question everybody's asking now. Right. How many boosters, how often? Uh, I can't answer that question right now. It, it remains to be seen how how long will the effect last? And it may be that we only need the effect to last for a short period of time to stop the progression and the chronicity of the disease. We may not have to have antibodies present forever. It may just be for a short period of time. Yeah. The advantage of this strategy of secondary prevention, at this stage in acute heart failure, we're doing secondary prevention, not right. primary prevention. Right. You, and the most worst outcomes are right after hospitalization in the first 30 to 90 days. And your one-year survival drops down. So even if there's no need for a booster, that's one implication of changing the course at a hospitalization would be enough for a beneficial effect is what mm -hmm. we postulate right now. Uh, also, one second question. You kind of evaded the question that uh, fellow shark here asked you. If you had already <laughs> engaged with pharmaceutical partner, do you have anybody specific that you may want to mention? There are a couple that have already come to us that I'm working with, actually. And, okay. and they're aware of them, both of them. Yeah. We're, we're just yeah. not sure if we have to yeah. kill you after telling you. Oh. I know, I know. That's the limiting factor. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Be careful chumming the waters. So. Yeah. <laughs> They're actually active. Um, so, so I'm curious partners. with the um, the mouse model, I guess it's mouse for the most part that you have. So in terms of long-term toxicity or anything like that, do you have any data on that? The, the idea about how long will it last? Is there, I know it's hard to get, but do you have any sense? I, I really don't have any sense. I haven't tested any long-term outcome. But again, we're, we're just doing a vaccination to create an antibody. Now, very similar to all the, the vaccines we're currently taking, sure. do they have long-term effects? Some can, as, as we've seen. And so there's gonna be a lot of hesitancy 
with, with vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. But uh, again, this isn't a population that does not do well uh, historically, uh, medically. So it is a population, at least the initial population, that is already, you know, uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. Why do you think no one has done this before? In the sense that HSP60 is associated with heart failure, specifically, I believe, acute. You know, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, that's How, a tough one. Why hasn't anyone done this? Right. We did the initial studies on HSP60 20 years ago, where we saw it was upregulated in the heart in both ischemic and non-ischemic heart failure. And there's been a lot of studies on that protein, but no one has ever really looked at a vaccine approach mm -hmm. to a, a problem like this. It's, it's just a new way. Normally vaccines are used for extracellular or, or extra uh, uh, outside the body threats, mm -hmm. such as, as COVID and seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. And that's what we always use vaccines for. Nobody ever thinks of using a vaccine or very few for internal mechanisms that are occurring. Well, thank you very much. And on this note, Dr. Euker and Dr. Bimaraj, uh, thank you again for your presentation. You. And uh, we're looking forward to hear more about this project in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, and uh, now it's time for the third presentation, the third team. Um, the third team, in fact, is from Dr. Uh, Mojiri and Dr. Godin who are presenting on the pre-record or a pre-record pitch <laughs> of the nanomedicine for prevention of radiation-induced injury to dermal vasculature. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. We propose to use a lipid nanoparticle encapsulating telomerase or third mRNA for prevention of radiation-induced injury to dermal vasculature. I present the idea, but we are a team of scientists who are expert in RNA biomedicine, nanomedicine, cutaneous biologists, cell and molecular biologists, and also radio oncologists. And as our product goes to the market, this team will grow definitely. Why it is important? We have target patients, patients who are suffering from uh, thyroid cancer, head and neck cancer, and breast cancer. They receive radiotherapy as a part of their treatment. 90% of patients who are receiving therapy, radiotherapy, they develop radiation uh, dermatitis, as you can see in the picture. And that is because as radiation increased DNA damage in your skin cells and your skin microvasculature. There is no drug available for these patients. There is nothing on the market targeting DNA damage. So basically we don't have any competition and whatever these patients are using is just for easing the pain and uh, increasing the healing process, but nothing targeting DNA damage. And as you can see, uh, there are unmet needs for these patients uh, as their quality of life changes significantly. We are confident with our data. We uh, checked endothelial cells, keratinocyte. They can uh, be protected from uh, radiation injury inducing DNA damage when they are treated with the telomerase. We also have developed a process to check a skin, human skin, be transplanted to the mice, and uh, we have delivered uh, LMP to the skin cells um, who received the LMP to proliferate better, and they are involved in the process of the healing. So we are confident with this data. Our product, our target product is a skin permeable cream for fast and efficient delivery of LMP and RNA. We will check for the safety, uh, what dose of treatment we need to use. We also, the component of the lipid nanoparticle that we need to use. We will check for the efficacy. Uh, we will develop a test to measure accurately reducing DNA damage uh, when cells are exposed to different dosage of the radiation. About the revenue, uh, the average cost of biologic drugs available right now in the market is around $2,000. Uh, the cost of our product is around $200. So we have a good revenue. However, if we show the efficacy and safety of our product, there will be other patients that are willing to use our product. Our product also can be used by soldiers who are exposed to the radiation. About the roadmap, uh, we obtain human skin to work with 
uh, we develop, we will develop accurate uh, tests to uh, measure LMP penetration, RNA expression. Uh, we will move from small animals to the large animals, and we will gather all our uh, analysis to apply for IND. And hopefully, we will have a product to move to the patient and start the trial. So we will use your fun for critical processes we need to optimize to get to the market. This is your chance to actually invest on a drug for the first time, on a drug that for the first time will target DNA damage. Thank you. Well, Dr. Mojiri and Dr. Morales, uh, thank you here. I understand that Dr. Godin abandoned the team or uh, she was <laughs> extra conflicted. She was competing against herself. So I'm, I'm glad to see the both, you, both of you here. And um, so I have a quick question for you uh, just to start. So radiation treatment is given for many form of uh, tumors. And so some of those may be superficial, other may be deeper within the tissue. So the damage, the radiation damage may not only be confined to the skin. Mm. So how good would it be to treat the skin without treating the rest of the tissue that may be the other organs that perhaps may be affected mm. by radiation? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. That's why our target patient, the group of patients that we are trying to uh, uh, provide this uh, medication is are those that are being uh, suffered from uh, thyroid, head and neck, and breast cancers. Those patients receive radiotherapy, and 90% of those percent uh, um, have uh, uh, radiation dermatitis. That is the group that we are trying to treat. But of course, there are all other sort of cancer that receive radiotherapy, but uh, perhaps that's not a good uh, plan for uh, uh, treat their skin if there is any injury. But that is just for the group that uh, we have observed that they have an injury on their skin. Okay, so I, I understand it would be for, for more superficial yes. treatment. Yes, and even for the effects that when we give this therapy that we're we're proposing to do it for the skin, uh, telomerase has an effect, like it was a systemic effect. We have published that, that it also reverse cellular senescence, it gives an uh, overall effect. So even if it will not, it's, even if it gets into another tissue, it will also be beneficial for the therapy. Okay. So I'm not gonna be an astronaut, it's not gonna happen, <laughs> but I have a vested interest of sun exposure protection, mm. apparently. <laughs> so is this something, you know, I understand the therapy right now where you're going with, it. is this something that could be more broadly applied in a sunscreen or an ointment that would benefit me in the future? Mm -hmm. well, and me. And you, <laughs> well, you're there. Well, of course, I would say, um, but there are steps that we have to take. Mm -hmm. We want to show safety. We want to show efficacy of our, medic, of our drug that we are developing. If that happens, we do ourselves uh, being exposed to all sort of uh, yes. pollution. Uh, so, and that uh, induce uh, DNA damage. And our uh, therapy is targeting DNA damage. So if the sun causes DNA damage on the skin for those that are more susceptible than already have a, a, some uh, you know, problem on their, on their skin, yes, it can be used for them as well. But for now, we need to take uh, you know, careful steps showing the safety, showing the efficacy. And, but like the, the thing that you are now bringing up a different opportunity, it just tells you that how broad it could be uh, our product to be used for all different conditions. Yeah, that's something we should be thinking about, right? Yeah, you have to go through the regulated pathway. You've got to get that first market entry. But once you have that market entry and you've shown safety, I mean, I, for a product like this, I think the sky is kind of the limit, right? So no pun intended. Um, what do you think that delivery vehicle, so I see it was mm -hmm. a cream, what do you think the effect of the vehicle you're using, that cream, is going to have on the stability of your skin pe penetrating lipid nanoparticle? That's a wonderful question. This is, uh, these are the development process 
we need to have a cream, the material that could preserve lipid nanoparticle. It could also help with the penetration of lipid nanoparticle, the integrity of lipid nanoparticle, that when it goes into the skin, it could reach the cells, it could release the RNA, it could pr produce the protein. But these are the steps that we have to really study uh, to provide that cream. But basically something that preserve, penetrate, uh, express and translate the mRNA to be able to, uh, you know, show the and how, how do you figure that out? Do you just we, buy a lot of cream well, off the shelf? We've also the wanted to make it that is user friendly. You don't want to be someone that is already receiving radiation therapy that are going through a lot, asking them, like, can you do this injection, subcutaneous injection? Uh, so for us, we also thought it was easy for the market and for our, for our patients because we're the first time we want to do is for patients that they receive therapy, uh, coming like this compassion effect, and then from there move through the other. And you know, these days people prefer topical uh, application. Yeah. You know, the um, pain relief, they're all uh, the topical or spray uh, is much more acceptable, desirable than systemic uh, application, especially if you're targeting old people people who are already taking many different medications. So there would be also the concern, hey, I'm taking all these medications, one more, what's the, you know, uh, the interaction, drug-drug interaction. So we're thinking that the best would be uh, like a spray or ointment or something like that. But as you mentioned, there are steps that we have to take, make sure about the preserving nanoparticle, penetration, and efficacy. But I, I do Can like the, the topical, yeah. the topical approach as opposed to the systemic, I which uh, obviously particles and therapeutic goes it pretty makes, much unchecked. I agree so. with you. It makes me wonder if, I mean, this is a very large question, but will the formulation be dependent on the type of radiation? If it's ionizing, non-ionizing, you know, ionizing like therapeutic, um, use, whereas UV would be non-ionizing. So there may be things to think about there, and it may be a big question to answer at this moment. So, yes, we, that is, again, uh, through the process that we need to make sure our nanoparticle, well, this is a process that we need to uh, identify how protective is our product against what range of the radiation. Right. Uh, like and the dose that we need to use per patient per treatment. Right. So, yes, we, we all considered all those except to follow. And for now, we have shown that is is working as a preventive. We're seeing a better effect when we do preventive mm -hmm. from radiation. So people that may have scheduled radiation for part of the therapy, you can provide this as a prevention for them before they go to radiation. And then uh, that's how you start playing on the radiation. We've known that they usually get. Uh, five grays, and then they do several mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. for I think it was around six weeks. It depends. On, uh, but there's something that you can schedule, you can prepare the patient in advance to go. provide this cream before they are exposed to the radiation. So I'm building off of this point. So TERT will work on chromosome ends, right, for the most yes. part. So I'm curious then, would you imagine perhaps down in the future you would combine this with other things that would help deal with other damage is sort of they were getting to? Or, or how do you think you could? kind of deal with that and how do you expand the market perhaps if in other situations you need other things? Well, if I understood your question, uh, telomerase is well known, as you just said, by extending the telomere, which is the way of reju rejuvenating cells. But uh, we're not, the, the mechanism that we think it works, it doesn't have to do with the telomere. It may extend, the, it will extend the telomere if the cells that were receiving telomerase have a short telomeres, but if they are already long telomeres, it would affect on the genomic that have exposed to the DNA damage. So it's basically, we have identified a non-canonical function for the term. So that is how, uh, if again, any, uh, injury, any toxicity that would affect the DNA damage, that would be useful for. So, um, I, we asked this question to other teams. What would be the cost associated to this cream? Seems like it would be quite of a pricey product. Well, um, with the brief investigation, 
the biologic drugs in general, if I want to go to average, some are very expensive, some not very much, but the average is around two thousand dollars. So we think at least uh, uh, we can provide our material nanoparticle material for one dose per patient per treatment is around two hundred dollars. So it's a nice revenue. Sure. However, we think it will grow more if we show the safety and efficacy. We're, we have a target patient, but if we can show that it's safe, yeah, people who are, let's say soldiers, that we are being exposed to the different toxic uh, pollution, they can use that. Or other people, or other patients, that uh, when they see the healing of the skin happen so fast, they would be willing to use it. Right? We don't need to advertise our products. So it's your chance to invest. And there's always that cosmetic. You know, that's a big area too, that it's uh, interesting. Well, Dr. Mojiri and Dr. Morales, thank you so much for your kind presentation. And uh, so this concludes the Shark Tank session. And I want to thank my fellow sharks for thank their you. great engaging questions. And uh, so stay tuned for the award announcement that will come up thank in a few minutes. Well, welcome back to the new frontier of RNA nanotherapeutics. I'm John Cook, uh, Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences and the Director of our Center for RNA Therapeutics. And I'm joined here in the studio by the Costas sisters, Cynthia Costas and Georgia Costas, are joining me in the uh, studio now uh, to uh, announce the awards. It's been a great conference it today, has. hasn't it? It's been a lot of fun. Fantastic. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, we had some great speakers. Oh, best. Yeah. What Wonderful. what did you what did you like most about the conference? Was it a Shark Tank or was uh, it? I love the Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. I love the forum, the panelists that mm -hmm. uh, spoke about the future mm -hmm. and how they saw the direction of nanomedicine and mm -hmm. RNA therapeutics. Yeah. Gave us a lot of hope for tomorrow and, and today. It's, yeah. Tomorrow is today. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, the future is now. Um, any thoughts uh, about the conference? Excited something? about the research that mm -hmm. I heard is happening. I mean, yeah. that, that's the most, that's very exciting. Yeah. Well, thanks to you both. Uh, thanks for the support of the Costas family. And uh, uh, you've uh, you come to all of our conferences and take notes. And it's been great to, to have you here every step of the way. Well, I'm supposed to make the uh, announcements of the awards. We're going to get to Shark Tank last because I have uh, several awards to give out. Uh, we had blitz presentations today. Uh, from the postdocs, and uh, the Blitz presentations were, were super. Um, we have uh, uh, several awards. We have a third place award uh, for $250. We're giving uh, three of those awards out. Uh, so in third place for $250 each uh, was uh, Yareli Carcamo Bahina with a spectroscopy-based non-enzymatic method to detect cholesterol for early familial hypercholesterolemia screening and uh, Elizabeth Eversoll for comparing the photothermal efficiencies of nanorods with nanoshells, and Rachel Kieser uh, for evaluating the role of cytoplasmic capping in the post-translational uh, regulation of long, long non-coding RNAs. In second place, we have two uh, winners, uh, Alvin Blanco for his work on mitochondrial replenishment, and uh, Madeline Frank uh, for her work on development of a novel lipid nanoparticle drug del delivery system. And in first place, uh, this is an award of $1,000 and uh, also bragging rights for getting first place in the Blitz presentations, uh, is uh, Ramiro Villarreal Leal uh, for biomimetic collagen membranes functionalized with mRNA enhanced lipid nanoparticles for fibroblast transdifferentiation to endothelial cells. So uh, congratulations to our Blitz presenters. You did a great job today and uh, we really enjoyed those presentations. So another um, award uh, that uh, the Costas family would like to make uh, is uh, uh, the Strategic Impact Project. So these are very important projects. This is a significant award of $50,000 for uh, uh, work toward uh, developing preliminary data for um, larger grants and uh, for uh, funding from 
uh, industry and, and such, but you know, these strategic impacts allow uh, the investigators to develop some preliminary, preliminary data uh, for their ideas so that they can uh, begin to translate those ideas toward the clinic. Uh, and um, we have uh, three awards uh, for the strategic impacts. Um, one group is led by Long Ho Fang, and that's uh, targeting strep B2 regulated angiogenesis to combat peripheral arterial disease. Uh, congratulations to Long Ho Fang and his, his colleagues, Dr. Liu and Rahimi. And uh, then um, the uh, other, another award is uh, for um, my team uh, with Maham Rahimi and Bianca Godin. Uh, great uh, colleagues are helping me with uh, nanotherapeutic for radiation-induced vascular injury. And you heard from some of the scientists that are working on that uh, project. Um, the um, final award for the strategic impact projects is goes to uh, Dr. Elvin Blanco's team uh, with uh, Dr. Lin and Shah on an MR visible bioreservable scaffold for coronary artery disease. And uh, finally, for Shark Tank, uh, the winner is Dr. Euchre and Bimaraj for their heart failure vaccine. Congratulations, guys. But uh, all, all of the shark uh, projects were fun, weren't they? They did a great job, very innovative in the way they presented their ideas. Yes. Well, you know, um, in closing, uh, making closing comments for the meeting, I would like to turn to uh, Georgia Costas, who has prepared some remarks for us today. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Well, first of all, I would like to thank all of the presenters and the researchers who made today possible. Your work is fascinating. Your presentations were informative very uplifting and inspiring. And it was wonderful to listen to even the experts here in the audience, experts in nanomedicine, nanotechnology, RNA therapeutics, say that new ideas were sparked for them. And one of the whole motives of my parents in wanting to help establish this program was to bring together experts like yourself and to bring an opportunity for you all to collaborate with your wonderful ideas. So to hear so many of you call out for people listening to participate and contact you and share in the production of new research and expedite the nanotherapeutic solutions through RNA and, and other programs, um, it was just wonderful to hear. So please, all of you listening who are experts, Take this opportunity before you today to contact people you heard doing research where you could be aligned. And here at Methodist, Dr. Cook, Dr. Gratani, Dr. Lumsden, please contact them. Um, they love to collaborate. And also, I want to thank these three giants here at Methodist for what you have done to move forward and advance um, cardiovascular nanomedicine and nanotherapeutics. You've done a great job and been great stewards of uh, my parents' wishes. So thank you. Yeah, it's from our, all our of us. pleasure. Thank you so much, Georgia, for those nice remarks. Thanks to the Costa sisters for supporting us and for being with us every step of the way. And uh, thank you for all for attending today. Thanks to the speakers, thanks to the presenters, uh, thanks to the judges, uh, and thank you all for attending uh, here with us at the frontier of RNA nanotherapeutics.